Hello and good afternoon to the stage four, stage seven of the Tour of Britain from Tewkesbury to Gloucester. That's the situation at the top of the general classification following yesterday's sprint stage in Tahalo, while Bernard's leading with a slender three second advantage over Ethan Vernon and Olav Koy. Olav Koy, of course, taking four stages, the opening four stages of this race. It's a beautiful day here today in Gloucestershire. And let's have a look at the route, which takes us in and around these beautiful country lanes. It's a hilly affair, 2,208 metres of vertical elevation. And a lumpy start, taking us over Winchcombe Hill very early on in the stage. Then the stage continues to roll. Quite a technical route through these beautiful country lanes. The only sprint of the day comes in Dursley, followed shortly afterwards by the climb up Crawley Hill. And then the drop down. One more kicker before the line. And then we finish in Gloucester, hosting the Tour of Britain for the very first time. Of course, last year in the shortened race, Gloucester was uh, supposed to host stage six on Friday the 9th of September. Uh, but that was sadly cancelled, of course, following the death of Her Majesty the Queen. So Gloucester's turn to shine after the disappointment and the sadness of last year. And an absolutely glorious day today, bordering on maybe slightly too hot. It's going to be around 30 degrees out there in the sunshine. On some more roads that will be unsurprised to hear are very familiar to me and Brian Smith. And before we kick things off with our neutral zone, let's just go through the situation at the head of the general classification and at the various jerseys. Just see on the right-hand side, that's Ethan Vernon, the best placed British rider on the general classification, came within a whisker of taking the stage yesterday. And ultimately, after a photo finish, it was awarded, quite rightly, of course, to Danny Van Poppel, half a tyre separating the Dutch sprinter for Bora Hansgrohe and Ethan Vernon. Third on the stage yesterday was Tord Gumstad, best rider so far in this year's Tour of Britain by the man from Norway from the Uno X cycling team. GC, well, that's being led by Jumbo Visma's Wout van Aert. At the points classification, well, a solid lead for Olaf Koy. 108 points in the green jersey ahead of Danny van Poppel with 76. Best young rider, also Olaf Koy. But Kasper van Uden is going to be wearing that. And there we go. This was a look at yesterday's crash. We... Uh, Saw Fernando Gaviria come off with about 10 k's to go there or thereabouts on one of these narrow country lanes. A low speed crash, but as you can see, unfortunately, Fernando Gaviria has abandoned the race. And another non-starter, a significant non-starter. Unfortunately, there'll be no Tom Pitcock in the race today. He's had to withdraw with a saddle sore. So very unfortunate for the Inos Grenadiers, but they've got a team that I'm sure that can fight. And still give a glowing account of themselves, especially on the, the course we have today. A far different affair than we've had previously. And just rounding out our classifications before we kick things off today. There he was, the man in the black jersey, the Pinarillo King of the Mountains. That's James Fouché. He has 37 points ahead of Harry Tanford with 19. Jack Rootkin Gray of St. Pirin in third with 15 seconds. So out on the road today, two classified climbs, both of them second category. 654321 on offer. So a maximum of 12 points out on the road today. So even if Fouché has a bad day, he'll still be in the mountains jersey heading into the final stage of this race with four first category climbs. So tomorrow's stage we have 40 points on offer maximum for the King of the Mountains classification. So another important day today for the man in black. Had a relatively steady day yesterday, didn't get involved in the action quite wisely decided to stay back in the peloton and yesterday's stage was an interesting one we had a breakaway of three riders that went clear very early on that then came back at around half distance and then the, the race split again and we had a brand new breakaway that was far more dangerous and then bad luck befell three riders from the break and also it lost its momentum and then we had a big bunch kick just on the edge of harlow so the rollout begins beautiful sunny day here and we are going to begin, I think it's fair to say, Brian, um, welcome you back on board again, mate, after a very busy double stint yesterday, Tour of Britain yesterday, uh, as well as uh, the Grand Prix Quebec yesterday evening as well. I hope you're rested, mate, because today it should be an interesting and hopefully we'll see a little bit uh, more of a general classification shake-up and maybe some more significant time gaps after today's stage. Definitely. Uh 
you know, the, the grey hair's not a giveaway. I'm fresh as a daisy this morning, <laughs> uh, ready to roll. Uh, ready to roll up and down these climbs around the uh, Cotswolds and really looking forward to this stage. Look, at, at the end of the day, you know, we've had some fairly kind of flattish stages. The same, you know, Jumbo Visma controlling things, but I'd rather see the Tour of Britain on, and I'm pretty sure the people at the side of the road would rather see it here as well. So, as you said, the race was supposed to come here last year. Um, so it's come here for the uh, for the first time, and you know it's great to to see the race in this part of the world. Like you said at the top of the show, we get so many memories from from this part of the world. And in fact, I I lived uh, with Shane Sutton in Blackheath, kind of outskirts of Birmingham. We used to come down um, this way as well in, in training rides. Very very hard roads, and uh, a good uh, five six hour uh, round trip. But yeah, these riders are in for a, a little bit of a different route. Uh, than they have done in the far, first six days. And with Pitcock not there, I think it kind of opens the door up a little bit more. Um, I think we might see in his Grenadiers. We've seen, of course, they won the stage yesterday with Danny Van Poppel. Bora Hansko have been interested and, in, um, you know, very active early on. Of course, Jumbo Visma haven't allowed them to go anywhere. But I think a few, this will change things around. And as Walt Van Aert says, well, it's up to everybody to, to drop them but let's see how the tactics play out because I'm pretty sure that on that finish yesterday that was the first time I saw a little bit of weakness from uh, Jumbo Visma in the end and uh, I'm pretty sure they're getting a little bit tired so a tough day in the, in the saddle for them and, and, and unfortunately for Tom Pidcock you have to think riding a flat route for six days with a saddle sore it's not the best, is it, Matt? You know, OK, with a bit of hillier route, you're in and out the saddle, but, you know, a lot of these riders have been in the saddle pretty much for almost 90% of the, the time. So yeah. it, it's one of these kind of things that's a, a little bit difficult. Have you got a saddle, so you spend so much time in the saddle? Oh, definitely. And uh, if you just did the bunch, which we've had multiple breakaways every single day, but generally speaking, although we've had a high tempo that's been set, a very quick average speed for, this, for every stage so far, and I don't expect that to, to back off today. This is really attacking terrain we're riding on today. Energy sapping terrain. But you're quite right. Um, a saddle saw, you know, at the best of times, very hard to cope with, and often it's just rest. Um, sometimes antibiotics as well, as we look at uh, Tewkesbury Abbey here. Um, but you're right. When you're in the bunch, right, putting out far less power, there's more weight on your on your undercarriage basically um, and it's very easy to just um, make it to exacerbate any, um, any any situation that you have down there on your undercarriage for want, want of a better word so we wish Tom Pickcock all the very best um, but uh, a big shame but as you say Carlos Rodriguez Luke Rowe Connor Swift Sheffield Turner especially Turner Sheffield and Connor Swift and actually all the riders left including Luke Rowe um, can make a difference on this sort of terrain um, classically British Hills um, in and around Gloucestershire. And in fact, the Cotswolds, if anybody from uh, across the pond or anywhere else in the world who's watching today, thank you for joining us. But the Cotswolds is basically a rural area of south central England that runs through parts of five counties. So Gloucestershire, Oxfordshire, Warwickshire, Wiltshire, and Worcestershire, and covers an area of almost 800 square miles, um, which is a forms a significant part of today's route. Another clockwise route we've got today. Um, so both the start and the finish, Tewkesbury and Gloucester, uh, start in the Cotswolds. So the Cotswolds isn't a county, it's an area comprising of several counties, as I've just listed. And uh, the terrain, very different than the terrain, Brian, that we've had over the last couple of days over in Essex, primarily flat, very gently undulating. The climbs we're going to see today, especially near the back end and the first portion of the race, are pretty hard, properly steep, go on for far longer. So... Uh, if teams, riders, want to try and cause splits here, there's definitely the potential, isn't there? But uh, the way the stage is poised, a lot of hills at the start, potential to split things up, but will we see aggressive racing on the first few climbs? Still a long way to go to the end, isn't there? There is 170.9 kilometres in length, but a good day. Yeah, yet again, I think uh, the boys from Unibet will be there. The uh, Tour of Cotswolds used to start in earnest. There used to be a £50 prime at the top of the first climb. I came second in it once. <laughs> there's no, there's no prize for second. Um, but yeah, it's. I think it will be a, a very uh, fast start, and I think it'll be a, a, a different, different stage altogether than what we've seen over the last six days. Um, we still have 92 riders in the field after that nasty crash yesterday. I know Gaviria crashed and never finished, but 
luckily, you know, the carnage in the in the final yesterday, everybody got up from that and, and finished. Okay, we, we don't have Tom Pidcock here, so we still have 92 riders. We saw a few bandages and legs and things like that, but that was a scary crash yesterday at high speeds. Luckily, everybody's still in the race. Yeah, thank goodness for that. And when you, oh, I don't really want to look at the pictures again. We don't need to. But any of you who uh, witnessed it um, would share our our extreme concern. 50, 60 k an hour crash. Multiple riders. I think maybe eight to ten riders came down. Uh, but as you said, Brian, everybody up and running again. And we've got uh, uh, the full compliment save, of course, for Tom Pickcock. Teammate, the Pickcocks on the front there. Luke Rowe, ever smiling on social media to uh, say thanks to the uh, the many fans who've been out the side of the road S signed with his name on again this is a proper home match for the Ineos Grenadiers and of course for the the British teams here St Piran you just see Alexander Richardson who in turn on the uh, just to the to right of our race leader was having a just an interesting conversation yesterday St Piran have been really uh, well, big disruptors in this race and I mean that in a good way as of TDT Univet cycling team they've been up the road every single day just see how warm it is. Jersey fully unzipped here for Ryan Mullen. Again, another popular, very likeable figure. But this climb of Winchcombe Hill comes very, very early on indeed. Approaching the end of the neutral zone. Even <laughs> even the DS has got his uh, sleeves rolled up here, Brian. Looks like he's turned his T-shirt into a vest. But when we did have Tour of the Cotswolds, it was, wasn't quite this point in the calendar. It was early August, wasn't it? It was in between the Tour de France and the Vuelta traditionally. And I rode it on multiple occasions, but it was always very, very hot, and it made the roads even stickier than they actually are. It's, it's going to be a hard day today, without a shadow, without. However, they ride it, it's going to be a grippy one, isn't it? And will really sap the strength. And I, if we do get a group at the finish today, I do think it will be enormously reduced. I think so as well, um, and I think it, it has to be. They have to race today and tomorrow if they're thinking about the general classification. Okay, some teams might just be happy with the stage win um, and Danny Van Poppel got that stage win for Bora Hansgrohe and kind of breaking the uh, the run of uh, Jumbo Visma but yeah this was used to be kind of start of August back um, you know after the national championships I used to take a couple of weeks break and this used to be one of the kind of big ones in the way back so it kind of hurt a little bit more my first tour of Cotswolds was way back in 1986 uh, managed to finish top 10 there um, and I, I kind of fell in love with the race but with that, that kind of break in between that, you know, you have tr uh, troughs and peaks in a, in a season. Um, um, I was always on the way back in this race, and um, it was a difficult one to, to ride. Um, and then, of course, with the, the World Championships, used to be at the end of August, uh, I used this as a, a bit of a kind of training race as well. Used to ride 120 mile tour of Cotswolds and ride back to Birmingham 50 miles, um, just to try and get the distance up. So, but it's, it's hard, and like you say, in these conditions, sweaty, warm, uncomfortable roads and quite heavy roads. So, you know, I think we're in for a very different stage. We are, and uh, there will be action straight away. We get first, after 12 Ks, we go up an uncategorised climb. So we're straight up and it's a steep one. Any other day, this would have been awarded to King of the Mountains. In fact, we have another climb right near the back end after the final categorised climb of Crawley Hill. Um, it's harder than anything we've had previously in the race so far, but we only have two categorised climbs. But there is a lot more climbing than that. 2,208 metres in total, with a slightly flatter middle section to the race. Oh, uh, the, somebody's lost his, lost his hat. I think Mick Bennett has lost his hat. Oh, that's awful to see. And the baseball cap ridden over uh, and uh, consigned to the history books. I'm wondering if uh, somebody at the back, maybe the broom wagon, Brian, will sweep that up and give it back to Mick at the end of the day but uh, sorry I Mick he, <laughs> I think he's due a fine as well from the UCI for littering littering oh blimey he'll have to um, have a word with the jury to see if they'll uh, be merciful with him but uh, you can just see a little bit of a headwind here at the moment yeah that um, Manx flag there and uh, yeah. just outside uh, the, the start um, so a Manx flag so a proud Manx one flying his flag uh, but it did indicate a, a bit of a headwind start this is probably the easy start that we've seen yeah and this possibly could go, come down to the fact that it's so hilly today yeah we've got a cl there we go alexander richardson straight up the road with james fouché on his wheel Ineos grenadier is also in the mix as well that's uh, magnus sheffield you can see 
Because we've lost Tom Pickcock here, I, I think Ineos Grenadier is going to go straight on the offensive, using um, as much, using uh, just have fun, express themselves. They really want to win this bike race, but what they have is riders that can excel over this sort of terrain. In particular, Rodriguez, um, Sheffield, Turner, and Swift. Luke Rowe playing more of a combative role, I think. Stockman. Um, and Stockman again. How many? I'm losing <laughs> losing count of how many breaks that man's been. And Olaf Coy getting it. See that Coy straight across to Connor Swift and the road will start to pick up very shortly we've got this climb that comes after 12 k's we drop back down and then we hit Winchcombe Hill which tops out with 150 k's to go so we've got 19 k's to the top of the first category the first categorized climb of the day as Stockman goes yet again as you can see the road just starting to ride there we go Ryan Christensen also a non-starter as well today the Black Spoke team and also Alexander Solby and uh, that's a big shame for the team of Bingol WB as uh, one of the most aggressive riders. Aggressive and popular, I think it's fair to say. Is, uh, Definitely, he deserved, up the road again. deserved to win it yesterday as well. Um, I think it was a no-brainer for, for most most combative and, of course, uh, most popular. And I, What does he have for breakfast? That's what I want to know, uh, Matt. Three Weetabix for sure. Um, definitely some special granola. Oh, watch Jumbo. Watch Jumbo. They're not yeah. allowing any to go anywhere. Yeah. They'll keep doing this. That looked like it's Sheffield again. Straight on the wheel this time is Olaf Coy. So, um, and this will draw the sting from the other teams as well. It's actually Luke Rowe who's going clear. They're going to want to get on the offensive straight away and make this hard. They don't want this rhythm, um, this... Yeah, this, as you say, it's very, very difficult, this one. It's going to be interesting. I think they're going to come under fire a lot in this long, straight road. Boiling conditions. Luke Road just latched onto the wheel of Stockman there. What I was trying to say, uh, they don't want to make this one easy. They don't want a little break to go um, and just let Jumbo Visma ride this one. They want to try and make it as chaotic as possible. Get numbers up the road, and other teams are getting in on the action as well. Bora Hansgrohe also moving across the gap. Also getting in the mix there as well, making sure they're represented. Equipo Kern Farmer. It might take a while for the split to go today as we get ever nearer uh, the first climb of the day. As Stockman just goes again straight over the top in that stealth kind of style. And it's a good technique to try and go clear though, isn't it? Rather than that big explosive attack, just keep on riding over the top when it eases, Brian. Yep, yeah, um, just keep it nice and steady. It's these accelerations that always hurt, but NAS look as if they're going again. Is this uh, Swift now? So... I think they have been probably one of the most active teams in the, the first few kilometres, so definitely the loss of Pitcock. But saying that, um, and you already mentioned it, Carlos Rodriguez, um, yeah. you've got Sheffield, Turner maybe 18 seconds, but both Sheffield and uh, Carlos Rodriguez are at three seconds. So yeah. they, they can't just you know, kind of throw that side of things away. There's still capability of um, you know winning the race overall, but it, I think what they're looking to do is, is make it as difficult a day as possible, whittle this down and give them options and and hopefully don't have the, the kind of Kreuzweg and Jus van Emden uh, train at the front, uh, give them a kind of hard time and you know kind of maybe kind of isolate them. It's going to be very difficult but it does look as if that the plan is to try and uh, mix things up and make it a very difficult stage today. It certainly does. Well, that man, Abram Stockman, has gone again. It's clearly very, very strong. He's continuing to go. St Pyrrhon represented once more the ever-present Alexander Richardson rolling through He's pulling Stockman along just behind there Frederick Dersnes of the Uno X Pro Cycling Team Norwegian Road Race Champion just behind him another former Road Race Champion that's Connor Swift just sat in the wheels in those Grenadiers as we were describing um, very vigilant at the front of the peloton as it continues to head ever so slightly upwards you can just see the uh, the elevation it's a slight drag at the moment before we hit the first climb of the day. But the detailing of Winchcombe Hill, it's um, second category climb, 2.05 kilometres long at 9.3% average gradient. So that's a severe climb. Um, a short yeah, I think one. we can call that's King of the Hills today. Yeah. yeah, that's a definite proper climb. It's one of the hardest climbs. It's the hardest climb of the day, but it does come very early on. But before that, we'll drop down into it. And we'll be going over a climb earlier on. So I'm expecting fireworks, even on this fourth, this first uncategorized climb. And just making sure he's paying attention to Wout Bernard. He's going to need to follow some of these moves too. 
in that blue jersey with the red sleeves. And we've got another attack right from the centre of the peloton. Stockman again with that uh, different coloured dossard, different coloured number on the back. Moving clear. Determined to get into the move today, this man, isn't he? He really is. Spread across the road. And clearly riders here, the teams here know what's coming up in the next 10 or 15 k's, Brian. What they don't want to do is put themselves into the red too much before we hit the climbs, because most of the action and any break that does go clear will probably go on, the, on this first climb that we've got, this first uncategorised climb. And teams are really wary of not being caught on the hop. It's so easy to go early, isn't it? Um, and then get, the last thing you want to do is get caught at the bottom of the climb after being, um, after having done quite a severe effort. Yeah, you can see Fushi going across to him, the, the King of the Mountains in the black jersey. And for the moment, no other, no other reaction. But just looking at what Stockman has done in this race, do you know what it reminds me of, Matt? In the history of the Tour of Britain, there's one rider that used to kind of stick out for me that was always riding like this and getting in the Pete breakaway. Williams. And unfortunately, pardon? Not Pete Williams. No. Um, it was Thomas de Ghent. Yes, of course, yeah. Thomas de Ghent came here for the Sport Flandern team, now Flanders team, and every day he was just going on the breakaway. You mentioned um, Pete Williams as well and, you know, Jacob Scott is, a, is yeah. another one and things like that. But the one that really kind of sticks out for me, he won both King of the Mountains and Sprint's competition was Thomas de Ghent. He's just continually going solo, going in the breakaway. And, you know, when you've got good legs, I said, you recover quicker as well. Um, they had a hard ride yesterday and still again, he just wants to be in front. Maybe he's battling out with Harry Tanfield to, to get more um, Mr. Popular competition uh, awards uh, than anybody else. And maybe as well, he's he's got 10 points to the King of the Mountains classification. He's got Fouché with him. Um, so amassing points towards the KOMs, but I think Fouché, even if they're, they're together here, and they've opened up a pretty decent gap, good 15 or 20 seconds already. And the gap falls short, and there we go, 21 seconds it's given at the moment. Was but Matt, yesterday, just... he was in the first breakaway, and then in the second breakaway. It's yeah. norm Normally that never happens. Normally it's another teammate... Okay, he, okay. He had another teammate with him. It's another rider. So you've done your bit. You've got in that breakaway. Then you know, allow the other, your other teammates to to jump in the you know the next formation of it. No, he was there straight away and oh, ready. He's just continually riding. I don't think he's made many friends in the bunch, and he just wants to just like get up the road and and have you know very few friends with him. Well, the more they do this, I mean, there's visits to the podium, but um, I know it sounds. Well, that sounds shallow, but um, we are constantly talking about TDT Unibet. I mean, that's we're just every single day we're talking about this team. We've talked about their social media presence. They're unafraid to get stuck in. And they've also had a hatful of top tens in the sprint. So they're enjoying their day in the breakaway and uh, animating. Um, and they, somebody else coming across. But when it all comes back together, Bomboy has got a hat. He's actually sipped in fifth place overall because he's been so consistent in the finishes. So um, and they're covering all bases, getting involved in the action, meaning they don't have to do any of the riding. And in the end, uh, they're placing their sprinter every single day. Martin Budding, no longer in the race, unfortunately. They're reduced to five, but uh, Tanfield has been very active too. Bloem less so, and Hadis de Vries was in the move yesterday. Uh, unfortunately, we had three punches in the space of just under 10 kilometres. Yes, it was quite incredible. Me and Brian were scratching our heads. Uh, we thought that somebody might have actually thrown some tacks out onto the road, but there's no information saying that was the case. It was just pure bad luck. And ultimately, after looking like the break at least had a little bit of hope of staying clear, and ultimately it wasn't to be. And that was the undoing of the breakaway. Those three successive punctures for Jack Rootkin Gray as well. He was in there for St Piran. But right now, 162 kilometres still to go. 40 seconds is the lead. But this appears to me to be the calm before the storm here. There's, there's the teams that want to make a difference in this race and try and isolate Van Aert. Uh, and, the, and, and put a lot of pressure on Jumbo Visma, have to use as many climbs as possible. They don't want to, um, they don't want to wait till the back end of this race because we've seen quite a lot of the time in the Tour of Britain, although the climbs are quite hard, because the gaps aren't very big over the top, we still see a reasonable group coming to the finish quite often, Brian, don't we? So to, the climbs aren't long enough to get really significant gaps. Uh, and right now, well, Jumbo Visma aren't going to help any group that goes over the top. So. They need to start earlier and anticipate and make this race harder for longer. That's the only way to potentially um, upseat um, and cause problems for Jumbo Visma. 
And that's the difficulty, Mark, Matt. Uh, you've got, you know, small field, small teams, and, you know, do you have the firepower to be able to do that? Because not only have you make this hard, you make it hard for your own team as well. And like you say, to, to make the, the gaps in the end, it's got to be, have to be a, a reduced group. So if you've got 20 or 30 riders towards the end, less riders um, to help kind of chase, that's when it kind of race opens up. So I know that the way they've started racing already, that they're anticipating a very difficult stage today. Um, that's why they, they want a, kind of an easier start, they want an easy breakaway to go away. Um, but I'm pretty sure when we get onto these climbs, we're going to see some, some more action. Um, the stronger riders, uh, the climbs will suit them to try and get in the breakaway. On the flat, it's always... A bit of a lottery, but saying that, you know, Stockman's here, so I'll just eat my words. So, um, <laughs> you know, he seems to get in everything he wants to get in. Um, but more so, you try to get in these moves uh, early on. And it's a little bit easier when it's on the flat, and it is a little bit of a lottery. But I think some of the maybe other stronger riders, they're waiting for the climb starts, and then they will try and infiltrate the breakaway. Yeah, that is uh, definitely right. How is the Vries? of the Netherlands trying to get across this gap 20 seconds behind not too sure Stockman um, you'd imagine Stockman is aware they are radioed up maybe just ease a little bit the peloton just under a minute as it just ticks to one minute exactly but a Fouché really en route here to securing this King of the Mountains there we go oh I think he. Do, I don't think uh, Fouché is aware that he's got a teammate coming across the gap. He said, "We'll wait after the hill." Um, I don't think Fouché is interested in going out in front all day, Brian. Is he? He'll uh, go over this first climb, drop down, take the points of the second climb. That's if they're allowed the leeway. And um, we've still got 10 k's to go to the top of the first categorised climb of the day. But right now, Stockman is waiting for his teammate Harris de Vries to come. But I have a feeling uh, that yeah, he's just waiting for him, isn't he? Don't think he was fully aware there. Oh, nearly a bit of a slight bit of overlapping there, but uh, yeah, Stockman clearly waiting for the freeze here, Brian. Yeah, I think um, Fushi just saying to him, just just roll through, just you know. But they they, they have to do it very quickly, um, and you get in this situation. I think uh, Stockman's doing the right thing, and I think what Fushi's doing, just knock it off a little bit. It's one minute and ten, uh, eleven seconds now, so the sooner that the freeze can get there, the, the better. So if I was Fushi, I would completely. Wait up, off. Yep. right? Completely wait up, because there's no there's no point in just rolling and, and pushing on a little bit. And Stockman's in the wheel. It's not helping. It's not helping anybody at the moment. So Stockman are not right, and it, it needs the De Vries to come up quicker. And I just don't understand why Fushi is not uh, uh, acute to that. So just sit up straight away, yep. sit side by side, get him on there, and then 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 push it out. Yep. The reason I think he's not doing that um, is because he's worried that these hills will provide attacking terrain for the bunch. They might oh, well, lose yes. that gap. Uh, that's that's. But I, I'm, I agree with you. But I'm just even trying to get into his mind. Yeah. You know, even he's excited about it. He certainly is. Right. I, I tell you what, can you imagine being inside that dinosaur right now in the heat, flipping heck, but up an absolute cauldron, a T-Rex cauldron. A plastic T-Rex cauldron. There we go. 18 seconds it is to the Vries. Yeah, the right thing to do is to wait for him. And he's going to get a little bit of assistance as well on this climb. Another wheel to sit in to make sure he is fresh if they do need to push on up Winchcombe Hill. But Fouché is minded to keep the pace high. It's continuing to go out as uh, the Vries slowly is chipping away at the lead. But it is ever so slow. Uh, but uh, Fouché uh, continuing to press on in front. And still we have 9Ks to the top of Winchcombe Hill. Got the best part of 5Ks. Yeah, it's still a bit of... Just dropping the neutral service team car in behind at the Vries. But on this long drag, he's making slow progress. And this sort of climb is going to be the, the, the one of the big characteristics of today, isn't it, Brian? It's up and down all day long. OK, the, the mid part of the race, not quite here, as many climbs. Go. But uh, there we go, big accelerations because uh, it's the tacking terrain. And it is exactly as I thought, Ineos Grenadiers, as soon as the road tilts upwards, it's an opportunity to attack. Yeah, they, they, they were waiting for the hills. They want to make it difficult. They want to split the race up. Um, you know, they, want, they don't want to have the whole team of Jumbo Visma still in the, in the peloton over these hills. Um, if they can get a group about 
20 riders with two or three of them, then you know that's that's kind of a little bit more manageable for them. So, yeah, straight in the bottom of the climb, you saw Anius lift the tempo up, and yeah, they've been possibly one of the most active teams um, so far. Well, in this Grenadiers here, this um, I think it was an attack initially, but this is just to make the pace hard. This is clearly right, we're going to make this hard all day long. That's what they're yep. doing now. Um, and Stockman has been dropped, Fouché is continuing on. Fouché, again, that's why I think I think he knew that if he's got any chance of getting the King of the Mountains points over the top, and he still has, he needs to keep riding and doing his own race and almost focusing on Winchcombe Hill as it, like from now on to Winchcombe Hill. He's got to go over this climb down and back up the whole of Winchcombe Hill as a, as a TT effort. And that's finish line one for him and then just see how the race evolves because I don't think he'll necessarily be up there um, at the finish. And that's not taking I think him he's waiting. Uh, anything. But um, there you go, Stockman's waiting. Uh, Fouché, I don't yeah. think is. Yeah, Fouché was setting a hard tempo and De Vries was finding it a little bit difficult. So yeah. it looks like Stockman said, right, if you're not going to wait, I'm going to wait. I'll wait, yeah. You can do your own thing, um, but we'll stick together. But already, though, since that acceleration on the front, since Ineos Grenadiers have taken it up and they're continuing to ride, a few riders look getting dropped already out of the back. One of the DSM riders, one of the Unibet riders as well. And it is Connor Swift. This is a man that can do this all day long. And he's making Afini hurt here. This is a good tempo. Also uh, out of the saddle there. One of the riders from Q36.5. It looks like that's uh, Damien Housen. They've got two riders that are going to like this sort of terrain. Sam Bennett struggling at the Not back good. as well. No. So early on. This is going to continue. And over the top of Winchcombe Hill, there's another climb as well. And then it's just un relentlessly undulating for the first 60 Ks. As Fouché continues up in front, coming towards the top of this first uncategorized climb, and they've taken the best part of 30 seconds out of him in only two Ks. Yep, they have. Um, let's see what happens over the top of this climb because these boys are coming up. This is trying to say, why Why would Fouché want to ride like that? I, I just don't get it. And, you know, he's a strong enough rider, but Stockman waited got De Vries on the wheel I know the gap's coming down but you know that just kind of upsets things a little bit you never waited for him I'm waiting. why should we help you um, so De Vries is on the wheel they'll continue to ride but the three of them have got a better chance if they can swap turns and, and kind of staying away for this uh, this next climb but with 33 seconds Martin this climb not completely over yet you know that 30 seconds in the in the king of the mountains climb could be snaffled up quite quickly yeah, definitely. Well, they've knocked it off a little bit here after that initial acceleration. Just a testing, probing little move there on the front just to make riders uh, feel that little bit of pain. Uh, and again, flat situation at the front of the peloton. Q36.5 on the inside, just in the centre there, Team Flanders, Balois. Ever present, ever vigilant. Uh, also, Jumbo Visma. So, Trinity riders uh, on the offensive here, swiftly followed by the Ineos Grenadiers. So uh, Grenadiers are keen to get people in the move. Swift latches on to the wheel of the man from Trinity. Yeah, he does. Flanders, DSM. Um, so they're all getting involved there. Moment's hesitation. There are five riders here, three in front. Some riders potentially, um, hard to see the kind of numbers from here, um, maybe up here, up there in the, the general classification. Looks like Roscoff at the back there. So... They can afford to maybe let Swift go because he's a few minutes down, but, you know, if there's, there's someone here, is this... Paddy Bevan. Yeah, Bevan here. Um, and I don't... I think he's trying to get some form. Uno X now trying to go away. The, this is numbers now. Yeah. This is a, a situation that they won't know because it's very difficult to know that all the riders at 50 seconds. So they'll have to... They'll, Jumbo Visma will have to kind of wait and see um, once they get that information. But this could be a, quite dangerous for them. Yeah, that was Martin Urienstad, who's just going across the gap for Uno X as well. Uh, oh, it's no. indeed, it is indeed Joey Roscoff. So 27 seconds is the lead. Remember, that's to our three riders out in front who went uh, away very early on. Uh, Abram Stockman, Harris De Vries, and also they lead it in the King of the Mountains classification from the Bolton Equities Black Spoke team. So here we go, dropping down the other side. And this would take us into the opening categorised climb of the day. The Vries, Stockman and Fouché. A brief bit of respite. What goes up must come down, of course. Um, 
the reward for climbing these spiteful little hills is, of course, you get a little bit of free wheel action down the other side. A moment's respite before the unrelenting climb of Winchman, uh, Winchcombe Hill comes. It's a flatter top, but it's the midsection. And the first opening few hundred metres relatively flat, but it's the midsection that's uh, very steep indeed, averaging 9.3%. So the sections, most of the climb is going to be average, averaging around 10%. But interesting here that Jumbo Visma haven't put anybody in the move. They haven't reacted, Brian. Maybe they're happy just to uh, let this go out and then start riding over the top. But um, it's Movistar now who are assisting in the pacemaking at the front. They've missed out one of the big teams that aren't present in that counter-attack. Yeah, this is an interesting one now um, to see who does take it up. And, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, take these chances and, and see who wants to ride. The onus is definitely on Jumbo Visma to be able to do that. But because so many riders are here, I can have a moment of hesitation there for Pat Bevan there because it, I saw the D DSM jumper uh, on him and I thought, that looks like Paddy Bevan and, you know, he, he's kind of switched over teams and he's a rider, that, a strong, strong rider and, you know, he's just trying to kind of come back to form. But Ennis have so far so good have got their rider in the breakaway and that's um, Connor Swift and he's sitting at um, 2 minutes and 39 seconds but Bono um, of uh, Flanders, he's sitting at 3 seconds. We've got another couple of chases as well from uh, Bingo and Kern Farmer. So... It's a lot of numbers, uh, a yeah. lot of teams going down the road, Mark. Yep, yeah, this is, um, my feeling is, is that Yumba Visma are, aren't reacting to these, so they can actually ride it. But with the, such a big group out in front, Martin Urienstad, who's in there as well, is he's only at three seconds. Uh, Max Walker in the mix too, good climber, he's only at three seconds too. Joey Roscoff also at three seconds as this group continues to swell. Yumbo Visma now at the front, just bringing back that solo rider who's moving, who's just clipped off the front. Paddy Bevin is at 4 minutes and 19 as we head to the sharp end of the race. The gap slowly being bridged by our chasing group, and it does look as if very shortly, in the next three or four kilometres, they are going to join the leaders. It's a fascinating situation here, but it looks like there's a Yumbo Visma rider coming across the gap here, Brian. No, that was Bingo. Um, oh, Bingo, sorry. Yeah, this. There we go. It's a lot of riders here. Um, there is. And that's the Arrieta. rider that was on the, on the attack yesterday, uh, Paiskins, uh, in the run-in. So, eight riders, three riders in front. That's a sizable, it's the biggest um, group of, we've seen so far. Yeah, it certainly is. Well, we're heading into the bottom of Winchcombe Hill now. 24 seconds, 31 seconds. So the peloton actually closing in on at this group, containing Connor Swift and Paddy Bevin and the rest. Eight riders comprised of this little satellite group, but they are being brought back slowly but surely by the peloton that will be being led, one would imagine, by Jumbo Visma at the moment. Mobistar, also one of the big teams, one of the big World Tour outfits that didn't or haven't managed to put a rider in this front group as we get a reminder of the composition of this chase group. Peskins, Bevin, Arrieta and Swift are there. Roscoff, Walker, Bonnier and Martin Urienstad Buga is also in the mix there in the red and yellow of the Uno X Pro cycling team. And there's a furious chase behind to sew this back together before we get on to the slopes of Winchcombe Hill here, Brian. Great yeah, crowds, look at, look at crowds. this. Yeah. Oh, brilliant stuff. Crowds. Picturesque, postcard type, you know, pictures here. But we've never seen it, Matt, but the peloton are pretty much on that group. Uh, we saw the time gaps. We never saw who was doing the riding. Um, but, you know, these three riders still together. And unfortunately oh. for Jus van Emden, a it's little a bit real pitch together. point. Yeah. Yep. He's uh, come off with Carlos Verona there. So uh, the way that van Emden looked at Verona, not very happy there. As soon as we saw that pinch point, I did think, well, I just thought, that's going to be a little bit dicey. Here's this little right-hander, the real funneling down. I've quite seen exactly what happened. But van Emden's already down his bike. He's gone straight over the bars there by the looks of things. Um, so not too sure uh, who was at fault there, but here we go. The start of the first categorised climb of the day of Wilch Winchcombe him. 2Ks at 9.3% average, and this lower slopes here, as you can see, only very gradual, but soon this will start to kick up. I know this climb reasonably well. Been up it a few times. It's uh, a bit of a stinger, that is for sure. That's the hill they've got to climb just ahead of them. 
but 46 seconds it is to the peloton behind. So it looks like our leaders, sorry, that little satellite group that went clear has been brought back. So all calm again, relatively calm, should I say. And the Jumbo Visma present just at the front there on the right hand side with one singular rider, that's Nathan Van Hooydonk. As things settle again, but I'm expecting a few more fireworks as we get onto the steep part of this climb. There has to be some attacks here. I can't see them letting Jumbo Visma just ride this one over the top. No, not at all. It's quite unfortunate for Jus van Emden there. Pretty sure he'll get back up. Not the ideal start for, for him anyway. Um, but yeah, different feel to this race so far with the fact that so many teams are, are trying to get in, in the breakaway. We saw you know a group of eight riders and it was shut down, but... There's only so much shutting down you can do, and um, I'm pretty sure we'll get even more as Ben Turner goes off yep. the front. Pat Bevan again in that, from that kind of style that he's got, now riding for DSM. So clear that Ines Grenadiers are interested in making this difficult. Yeah, they certainly are. As soon as we said there was going to be some attacks, uh, there was one. Another big launch. Ben Turner's been on the offensive on several occasions already today, and he's opened up a gap immediately. And clearly Paddy Bevin, it's good to see Paddy Bevin back, has, had, has hardly raced this year. I think on the run into the Tour of Britain, without having it on the screen in front of me, I think he's only had about six or seven days of racing. And it's been quiet in the opening few stages, but now is uh, certainly finding his feet. And what better way to build that condition than get back to the sharp end of a bike race. We're now on to the steep slopes of this climb. And look at the power here of Turner as he uh, thrashed his way across to the three leaders here. And I think it's just going to sweep past them as Bevin, riding well, can't quite get onto the wheel of the British rider in front. So good move here by Ben Turner. As we are on the, this is a beautiful, beautiful climb. Winchcombe means valley with a bend. An ancient Anglo-Saxon town situated in the beautiful Cotswold Valley. I, can't, I cannot recommend uh, this part of the world enough. It really is beautiful. Many of you listening will, of course, be familiar with it. But if you're not get down there go for a drive go for a bike ride it is absolutely gorgeous and here we go we're on these uh, 10 11 percent slopes now this canopy over the top giving it a really particular feel as paddy bedim just uh, fights his own rhythm here a low saddle focused 17 seconds for the peloton behind but no panic yet from number Bisbal. not for the moment there's for them there's not enough riders there ben turner is the, the kind of danger man here he started today at uh, 18 seconds, but he's only got a few riders for company. Um, Bevan tried, you know, the, the thought was there to go, but he just didn't have the legs to go. Like you say, Matt, this is a very difficult climb. So Ben Turner alone, or even with uh, one or two riders, it's not it's not a danger for the moment. It needs to be a sizable group. You're probably more than the six riders of Jumbo Visma to, to make a, a big, um, a dent in you know the chase behind but for the moment no one else trying to uh, go across to him yep Nathan Van Hooydonk in the centre just off the front there and also there as well we can just see it looks like that was the figure of Mark Donovan so uh, Donovan I think and Damien Housen from the Q36.5 cycling team will certainly like this sort of terrain good ride yesterday by Nicola Palazzini to finish inside the top 10 but uh, turning out going. Yeah, Turner, we're off the front on his own now. And one of the Q36.5 riders has actually launched across to that little group that uh, Turner has left behind. Yeah, it looks like Donovan is, is coming up now um, on his own. He's coming up pretty quickly there. So this is what it needs. It needs more stronger riders to, to go with Turner here. Turner on his own, I don't think Yomo Visma will be too worried about it. Uh, what they will be worried about if there's about six or eight riders and, and some strong riders in there. When we get into this part of the, the stage on this kind of climb, you know that if riders are going in the breakaway, going on the attack here, this is this is where the, the danger is um, because they're strong riders. Yeah, they certainly are, but they're bringing this. Fouché is still fighting his own personal battle there with the two riders from Unibet, De Vries and Stockman. And the man coming across the move and looking strong slowly but surely bringing himself back into contention is indeed Mark Donovan 24 years of age again a rider that is uh, sat dangerously on the general classification as well one of a clutch of riders it's only three seconds behind our race leader Wout Van Aert and eight seconds now is the gap so 
It is Nathan Van Hoydonk who's just setting that steady tempo, just making sure this doesn't get too much of a gap. And at the same time, Brian, uh, offering up a tempo that is putting riders off from uh, putting in a counter-attack over the top of this climb as well. Yep, Junction, mate. Donovan and uh, Turner, two British riders at the front, still first year. His goal was to try and get as many points as, as possible. Nice and steady in the front. Of, well, I say nice and steady as the riders going out the rear, um, but steadier, just leave them kind of dangling out there. They, Jumbo Visma know that two riders in front, they've got enough firepower to to leave them kind of hanging out there. Um, and at the same time, you know, the, the attacks will stop from both of these teams. So they, if they were brought back, then the attacks would go again and again. But you know, two strong riders here, um, but no one else coming out to play for the moment. Just goes to show you how hard this climb is. Yep. Still the bunch being led. It's thin, thinned out significantly. Great crowds over the top of the climb now. They'll be passing the King of the Mountains points in just a couple of seconds. Some Donovan continuing to force the pace here. 15 seconds is the gap for the duo out in front. The silver of Mark Donovan and Q36.5. He takes the maximum points over the top of the climb. Turn on his wheel. A flick of the elbow. Turner looks round, sees there's daylight, and then rolls through as they continue to force the pace over the top. James Fouché takes a very well-deserved and exceptionally hard fought for four points over the top there to take his tally now in the King of the Mountains classification to 41. So not the maximum points that he wanted, Brian, as we've got a very slimmed-down bunch. Riders all over the mountain, all over the climb, should I say, including this man, Olaf Coy, not liking the steep slopes of Winchcombe Hill. No, it would be interesting to see where Jus van Emden and Stephen Kreuzwick is as well. So if Olaf Koy is there as well, it means that, you know, Walt Van Aert just could have, you know, a, a, a Feeney and, um, of course, uh, Nathan Van Hoydonk with them. So two riders to kind of help out, two riders in front. Yeah, the, that's a, that's always going to be the danger. Um, I would like to see where Stephen Kreuzwick is, though, because we know he can climb, but what he's done over the last few days... Uh, we know Jus van Emden, not the best climber, and he crashed at the bottom, so I doubt he would be there. So already Jumbo Visma losing two riders. Exactly. And that means it's a long workload, a long day out in front for anybody that's left. Nathan van Hoydonk is the man that was chasing behind, or more setting a tempo. He certainly wasn't offering up a furious, furious chase. But uh, dropping down the other side now, this climb or the descent has a couple of little pickups. And then we go up another climb. And then we'll get to 30, that'll be the 30 kilometers to go point. That's when the bar opens today and riders can start dropping back or taking drinks from the side of the road. Plenty of things, beautiful things to look at today. This is uh, Sudley Castle. Just over the top of Winchcombe Hill. It's a uh, very well manicured gardens, as you can see. And you can see this beautiful uh, particular color most of the houses in this area, especially the older ones, are made of limestone. Even the new ones are made of limestone. They've got a lovely, beautiful glow. Very distinct, but it is a lovely part of the world. Very sparsely populated as well. And as you can see by Ben Turner dousing himself in water, this is a hot, hot day. A sticky, sticky day on uh, these roads that are best described as grippy. But this is a good duo out in front. Two exceptionally versatile riders, both of whom can climb really well, Brian. Definitely. They, I think they just needed uh, another, you know, two, three, four riders, but there wasn't to be. Yeah. We just saw Suddenly Castle there in Gardens. Uh, magnificent. That's actually where uh, Catherine uh, Parr was buried, one of uh, Henry VIII's uh, wives. He had six. One of them was buried there. Always a... Uh Always on the front foot with the history lessons. Ah, uh, Brian. Beautiful winding lanes here, as you can see. Hedges either side. Out of sight, out of mind for our duo in front. But I do agree with you, Brian. It would have been nice if we'd had, had another rider in the mix. But uh, the way that Ben Turner attacked that climb and the way that uh, Donovan went across, I think had anybody from Mobistar or Bora or Bingo, for example, felt good, they would have gone. But they just could not match. So uh, a good situation out in front, but one would imagine a manageable one. Um, but I would think the best thing to do for Jumbo Bisma is here, just to wait up, just to ease a bit, as they're doing now, and just let the reinforcements get back on. Let Olaf Koy get back in contact, because after we've gone over this next climb, the terrain does 
ease a little bit. There's nothing quite as hard as this, as the climb we've gone over. Um, although it does up, go up and down all day long, Jumbo Visma need to get numbers up in front here, don't they? They would be happy that it's only two riders. Um, okay, two strong riders, two good climbers, but you know they'll be happy with that situation. They still have definitely they've they've got Van Hoydong, Afini, I would think, and, and and Walt Van Aert. It's just unfortunate that more riders couldn't have uh, gone. It looks as if this is a group of um, coming back now. I think Coy is in here. Um, so yeah, a lot of riders coming back. Um, don't know where Kreuzweg and Jus van Emden is at the moment. Um, that's the thing, but Jumbo Visma will know. And it's a case of they can wait 30, 40 seconds, allow Turner and Donovan to, to gain another 30, 40 seconds. But what it does do is um, you know, bring more numbers, as you've already said. So that, that's the smart thing to do. And I think that's what Jumbo Visma are doing. One's just uh, clipped off the front there ever so slightly. That's it, Wardell Feeney. And Kreuzweig yeah, is Kreuzweig indeed is there. there. Yeah. yeah, the unmistakable shoulders of Stephen Kreuzweig. You can spot him an absolute mile off. But that group, that, that's a large group containing some of the sprinters. We also noticed uh, Josh Giddings and Noah Hobbs in there as well. They've now got back in contact. There'll be no panic at all. Jumbo Visma um, knew they were going to be attacked today. This is not unexpected. They knew that they were probably going to come under attack, in particular by the Ineos Grenadiers. Um, but they've got a lot of riders that know how to cope, know how to manage on this sort of terrain. And they're looking around, and it is uh, Eduardo Affini just on the front, just to his right and just behind him. Nathan van Hoydonk and also Stephen Kreisweig's there as well. They might actually be waiting up for Jos van Emden. So van Emden is still chasing. They'll certainly wait for him as we get another account attack, and it's Alexander Richardson again. This is what, they, this is what the riders up in front need, but... It's a hard gap to cross, even for a rider as classy as Alexander Richardson, to get across a minute gap. It's a big, it's a tall order, Brian. It is, and he's hoping riders will uh, join him. That's why he's looking around. But it's an opportunist move now because he knows that um, Jumbo Visma are, are waiting up. Uh, they they were allow, and if they were given this opportunity, Matt, they would take it all day long. Um, yep. The fact that they've got two riders up the roads then, you know, they're fine because they would have been mostly worried about a sizable group going over the first kind of couple of climbs of the day. Jus van Emden, they've waited for him. It looks as if he's at the back of the peloton now. So I think their goal is to go over this part of the race, um, have all the riders um, present, and Stephen Kreuzweg and Jus van Emden will start to ride. These riders are taking their opportunity. They were... Um, they were dropped, they've come back and now trying to go on the attack, which is proven a, you know, a little bit more activity behind. It does look as if Inish Grenadiers have got another rider trying to trying to go away. I think they know that they need a little bit more, they need more numbers in front um, if they're going to put huge pressure on Jumbo Visma here. Yep, I wonder what I haven't seen too much of, which is a slight surprise, unless he's got a tactic towards the back end of the race, is Stevie Williams, who would uh, suit this sort of terrain the recent winner of the Arctic race in Norway in, um, well, uh, shall we say, completely different weather conditions. It was almost like winter up in the Arctic race of Norway. He took the stage win there and with it uh, the, the overall classification and has been rewarded with another couple of years contract with the Israel Premier League team. So Stevie Williams will certainly like this sort of terrain. Arguably a purer climber than the two riders out in front, but I haven't seen him too much just yet. Um, there's a couple of GB riders there in the mix in their very distinctive white jersey. 52 seconds now. Just under 144 kilometres still to go. And that little counter-attack, started off by Alexander Richardson, has been brought back. And it's the ever-present Abram Stockman who went across to Richardson as well. This man is absolutely flying at the moment. Yeah, to go over that climb, he was, he was in his hands and knees going over the top of that climb and then going on the attack here. But... I think for Williams, there's, there's a few riders in here that will maybe kind of gamble a little bit. Um, they won't get involved with racing. They'll just kind of follow. They'll stay around um, because the, the finish here is a couple of good climbs towards the end. And if you've got good legs towards the end, that's where you can make a bit of a difference as well. So I think there'll be a few riders just following for the moment, Matt, um, because... Ennis Grenadiers have got other options. You know, they can put a rider like Ben Turner in the, in the breakaway and they've still got another two options with, um, you know, Carlos Rodriguez and Sheffield. Yep. Ben Turner on the front. He's had a good win this year. Won the World Ciclista 
at La Legion de Muthia, Costa Galida, um, in again really a grim attritional conditions. Is um, one of the riders at Ineos Grenadiers who's got a particularly long contract uh, to the end of 2026. Mark Donovan, again a very talented rider, uh, to only 24 years of age from Penrith on the other side of the country, up into the northwest. And he himself has had a win as well, won the uh, Cebu Cycling Tour overall. Another good ride from him came earlier in the year in the Giro di Sicilia. And I was on site watching that one, and he was fifth overall in the general classification. So two very versatile riders. Um, although they're not pure climbers, they, they, can, they can ride over this hillier terrain. <clears throat> but if it was to pick a climber, a more pure climber out of the two, I'd go for Donovan. But Turner, um, a real, real talent. And I think, is this Walker coming across the gap? Not too sure. Yeah, I was so, thinking uh, that Walker again. He was on the attack already. Um, but I think, you know, mentioning Stevie Williams, oh, Johnson. Liam Johnson. Um, but I think you're looking at Stevie Williams. He's writing for Great Britain. If they had other options in the general classification, Matt, one of them might take that opportunity of going to race in early on. But I think looking at that team, I think Williams, he'll just ride around Walt Van Aert. And then when we come on to the last part of this race, the last kind of 20, 30 kilometres, that's where we'll see him try to, to win the bike race. Definitely. Maybe a slightly different tactic. But uh, good riding here by this little group. We've got 20 seconds over the peloton. You could just see now that, well, the bunch now have just uh, let this go. They're pretty happy with this situation here. Um, now, 52 seconds to the chasers, 118 to the peloton. Um, out in front, Turner and his compatriot wait. Donovan, then no, I was going to say that was what I was getting to. They're not going to wait. Um, but and then this is also ideal for Jumbo Viz. We have two groups almost racing against each other. Um, I mean, if they were to combine, there'd be a lot more worrying. But right now, the situation on the road is going to suit Jumbo Visma as they recoup, and then they'll pick things up on this slightly less hilly midsection. We're just looking at the confirmation of the uh, climb that came earlier on, the climb of Winchcombe Hill. And maximum points over the top for the man from Q36.5, Mark Donovan. Second place, Ben Turner. And this is the chasers now. Stockman, Alexander Richardson, uh, and also there, that's uh, Liam Johnson. So a good counter-attacking group. Three exceptionally good riders. Um, can they get across? A, it's a, although they've got more numbers, it's a hard. I mean, the, the, the two out in front. Far more experience, arguably just that little bit stronger. It's going to be a hard gap to cross, isn't it? And do you think the conversation will be had between, I think the DSs will be saying, look, depending on how these riders do, if they get to within 20 seconds, it might be an idea just to then rest up. And But right now, um, they've, they've, they've got to try and earn the right to be at the front of the race, haven't they? If the gap goes up to almost three minutes and they're still about 40 seconds behind, then you think about it, of course you do, because, you know, five is better than than uh, two in front, but you, you said it yourself, Matt, the two riders in front are stronger than the three riders that, you know, have just gone on yep. their counter-attack. You, you're not going to wait, and just look at the way they're riding at the moment, so the only way this is going to happen is if the, the gap goes up to about three minutes, and, you know, the gap back to these these guys here, Richardson, uh, Stockman and uh, Johnson, is about you know, 40 seconds, that's where you think, well, we've got enough in the bunch. Um, we can use with a little bit more help because, OK, they're not as strong as us, but they can still give us a little bit of help. You know, it's definitely yeah. kind of flatter parts. So, um, but I said the gap to the peloton is just not enough for these two to, to ease off at, at all. No. So they're going to have to uh, earn the right to get across this gap. Um, they're not going to get any gifts at all, but this situation from... Yumbo, so from the Ineos Grenadiers and the uh, Q36.5 situation, it's actually ever so slightly frustrating. It's like, ah, okay, we've got three riders. If they'd have come across earlier, this would have been ideal. But we first need to establish that gap and see what happens. Um, so 142 to the peloton behind. But the gap between our two groups on the road is uh, stabilizing. Um, let's see how much this gap goes out to before Yumbo Visma actually start riding. And once well, we get over this, just stopping for a natural break now. So this could this could go up to maybe about three minutes, Matt. Um, and if it does, and these three can hold on and maybe bring it back a little bit, then the decision has to be made from the sports directors uh, whether they want 
you know, a little bit more help in front because they're just swapping turns. They'll do maybe a kilometre each at the front and it's going to be a hard day, hard roads round here. So, but then again, the, the, the three chasers have to get a little bit closer. Yep. They certainly do. It's actually going out. Uh, this isn't good. One minute and two seconds. So there we go. Just the illustrator of what we were saying. Um, when we're saying they're stronger, that is, that's just a, a, an observation of fact, basically. We've got uh, Alexander Richardson. is a classy, classy rider. And as is the youngster on his wheel, Liam Johnson. Um, Liam Johnson, haven't seen too much in this race, is the Aussie from Launceston. Uh, 21 uh, years of age. Um, uh, no wins this year, but as a second on the stage at Tour of Japan. Uh, but uh, again, Trinity Racing um, have managed over the last few seasons to really uh, to become one of the most important, I think, talent identifiers uh, in the world um, across multiple disciplines, across mountain biking and, of course, the road primarily. But uh, 58 seconds, so essentially now the group behind are just matching the pace of our two leaders out in front. Uh, but these are two strong riders. These are the sort of riders, though, Turner and Donovan that, that could ride all day like this. So they, they know how to measure their effort. And they're both you know, monument riders, a grand, uh, a grand tour riders in the case of, of the man just sat behind. Um, massively capable. And this is where they're going to need, I think, the cool head of Richardson. Is they need to really commit and actually try and shut this gap. Almost go as hard as they can for those 5 or 10 k's to shut it and then ease off uh, rather than just ride at the same speed. Because the longer that goes on, the harder it's going to be, is to, it, the harder it's going to be, Brian, to, to finally shut that gap down. Yeah, if, if I was the manager of any of the three there, I would uh, be telling them, look, just for the next five, ten kilometres, just give it absolutely everything. Just think of, you know, that that's the finishing line. Bring it down to 30 seconds, and then the the two in front have got a choice. But it's we know how good, um, you know, the riders behind are, um, but it's a stark contrast between the difference between riding World Tour races and yeah. riding, what does Richardson ride? He rides some of the some small races in Europe, yeah. the domestic scene. If you haven't got the, the race, and it's very difficult to do it in training. Oh, totally. um, so it gives you that condition. And we say it all along that World Tour races are are faster than, than any other races. And if you're, if you're riding these races, then it's very difficult to compete with the, um, you know, the World Tour teams. And, and that's the start distance a difference between these riders it's still it's an interesting one though isn't it um although the two out in front are ever so slightly moving that little bit quicker just the knowledge that there's a group of three behind of very capable riders it is it's a, it, it's almost a fly in the ointment but if i was the ds at yumbo visma i'd be rubbing my hands saying okay this is perfect two groups not combining spending more energy as two separate groups than one together is ideal for Jumbo Visma, but um, but still the two in front shouldn't wait because if they wait, basically that means they've just lost a minute to the peloton behind. So it's a really it's a fascinating one when you get two groups with the same ideas, but with a, still 138 k's over very challenging terrain. Certainly not mountainous, but up and down all day long. Given the choice, warm. Mark. It's given the choice, one, right? Given the choice <clears throat> for Innes Grenadiers and Q36.5. They would rather have these three riders here. Of course they would, yeah. Right? But, like you say, it has to be over three minutes, I said, and that is over three minutes, but these riders have to be a lot closer. Yeah. And they're out of sight at the moment on this long, straight section of road. Um, for a bit, we actually ride on a road called, called the Foss Way. Um, and that's one of the longest straight roads in the, in the UK, actually. It's a Roman road. Um, linking some of these uh, Roman towns together. I think they might be on part of the Foss Way at the moment. It's a, a, just a straight line, although it does rise and fall because the terrain run, as you can see, the peloton going ever so slightly uphill. And our leaders, led by Ben Turner, going downhill at pace. So that's the average, uh, well, the average watt for Ben Turner to go up come Hill. Now the reason, they both went up at pretty much the same speed because Donovan obviously caught Turner over the top, but Ben Turner is probably the best part of five or six kilograms heavier, so he'd have to generate more power to move at the same speed as a lighter rider. Now I had a chat with Ben Turner um, after last year's national championships won by Mark Cavendish, um, Brian, and his, his normalised power for that entire race in Scotland was about 350 watts for the entire day. 
<laughs> he's a rider, or even I think it's 370 or something. It's absolutely ridiculous. But he is a slightly larger rider, um, but it can generate a lot of power for for the slightly bigger riders to get over those climbs. That's the sorts of numbers that they're putting out, and it's it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, the training methods, everything that, the, that they're using nowadays. You know, the the racing, but. Um, yeah, they have got they have got a question. It's just if these riders had had got thirty, maximum forty seconds away, they could have uh, could have afforded to to wait a little bit. Um, but it's not the case, and unfortunately, these three riders have got a, a long hard day in, in front of them. Um, but so have Turner and and Donovan. But the way that uh, Jumbo Visma uh, rode that, they were just. They were. They, they had no choice who was going on the attack. They had no choice of who was getting in the move. Uh, they would have been hoping at the start of the day this would be the scenario. They know they're going to have to work anyway, but having two kind of danger riders in front is better than having five or six. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Remember Alexander Richardson also just at three seconds on the general classification. Stockman at 22. And the only rider who's a little bit further back is Liam Johnson, the Aussie for Trinity Racing. He sits at four minutes and 48 seconds. So uh, Donovan Richardson um, are the riders that pose the most threat. Of course, Richardson hasn't gone across the gap yet, and it's just holding steady. They're essentially just matching the pace of the riders out in front. 321 is the gap, so 221 roughly to this group, or just under. And you can constantly see Richardson just giving the, uh, these other two lads that little bit of encouragement. Very experienced rider. Uh, it's really at the cutting edge um, of, of sport. He's really interested in, 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 in how basically to go quicker on a bike using every all the knowledge that we have, aerodynamics, pacing strategies, uh, nutrition as well. But um, he'll be the, the de facto leader of this little group behind, trying to uh, cajole them, trying to make sure that they're doing the right thing. Um, but there's only so much they can actually do because a minute's gap even if you go flat out, you can't go totally flat steep because on this sort of trend, you're going to blow. So they're just going to have to go a bit quicker than the group in front. But, but Brian, that's easier said than done when you've got two engines like Turner and Donovan out in front, isn't it? They have to get it to 30 seconds. Again, it's, it is about pushing hard and you have to. Yeah. What, what are you going to do? You're going to hang out there all stage or, you know, for yeah. the next 100 kilometres and just hang out there in the middle of nowhere? Or... You try and, and force it, get yourself in that breakaway. And the, the only, only chance they've got is ride it down to 30 seconds, and then it gives these riders an opportunity. Now this is interesting. I wonder they if they're waiting. waiting now. Yeah, he just said that. I think we're going to let him get across. So uh, there we go. It's got to three and a half minutes. These three. Oof. A nice bit of corner. Yeah, it had to be over three league. minutes, Mark. It had yeah. to be well over three minutes because that. Okay, they can what? ease back a little bit, save their energy, but these guys had to keep on riding hard and harder than they probably would to, to for the whole stage, because they had to ride seriously hard to, to keep this gap. Of course, they don't want to wait a minute, but that's a big choice that you have to make. Um, I think it's the right the right choice. The gap is enough. Three and a half minutes. Having three more riders here that are prepared to ride a little bit. Um, I just thought it needed to be 30, 40 seconds, but th I think they've decided themselves because it's a long, hard stage. Yep. Couldn't quite He's just told them. The, yeah, I think they are waiting. waiting. I, don't, I don't think that gap there, 57 seconds, is, is actually correct. I think it's dropping a little bit more than that. 324 to the back. Still can't quite see them, but just the way that uh, they'd eased off. Here we go, another future champion. Is that, uh, it looks like That's it could Remco. be, well, by now, Remco has come across from the Vuelta to have a punt out the Tour of Britain. Great to see Remco on the roads of the Cotswolds. Mini Remco on the right-hand side. Give him a wave, lads. Ah, oh, look at that. Brilliant to see. <laughs> that was Ben Turner, I think, telling him to come on. Ah, brilliant stuff. And uh, they're definitely eased up here, Brian. Yeah, that, it, it must have been a bit closer. That's why they talked. That that 58, 57 seconds is just stuck there, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that that's com completely the the gap now. But they had to ride hard there for that moment for the, those few kilometres. Yeah, They're just around the corner. So yeah, it's only a matter of about 
15, 20 seconds. So they've done a good ride. They did what we thought. Dana saw it at start and has come out to, to see them, you know, on the course. But I think it was the right thing to do. Get the gap down to about 30, 40 seconds and, and make these two riders have that have that conversation, have that uh, choice. I, I think as well, Brian, they would have looked at who these riders are. Uh, I think they'd look, okay, who's... Of course that makes in a this difference. Grenadier is, I mean, it's not just three riders. It's like, well, who, who have we got? Well, we've got Stockman, who's been an absolute engine all week. Great. He's clearly going well. Good pair of legs. Uh, Richardson, we know how good Richardson is. We know how smart he is. We know that he'll do his utmost. And then we've got this young lad, Liam Johnson. I don't think people know quite as much about him, but they also, but what we do know is that Trinity houses a lot of future quality. That's without a shadow of a doubt. So I think the right move has been made. Um, three minutes and 23 seconds. And also, what the, what that's given Ben Turner and, and Mark Donovan as well, is five minutes of really nice rest. Bang some food down, bit of drink, loosen the legs off, and now they can really get to work. So uh, really interesting tactical play there. Um, so we've got a good fighting force of five riders up in front. Um, one from the World Tour, um, two, well, one rider from the Pro Tour level, and then three Conti riders, but uh, three Come Conti on, riders, have, they've gone straight past <laughs> like a, a locomotive here. So right, five riders out in front. This has changed the situation at the head of affairs here on stage seven of the Tour of Britain. 170.94 k's. Tewkesbury to Gloucester through the beautiful Cotswolds in glorious sunshine as well, depending on your point of view, of course. I think they would have liked it. Perhaps just a little bit cooler, but Richardson on the front and just getting the drag from the motorbike and giving it a big, big acceleration. This is a team time trial now. Ben Turner, the man that started things off, he sat at the back there for the Ineos Grandia, sat at 18 seconds on the general classification. Alexander Richardson of St Piran just swinging off in the black kit with the purple helmet there from St Piran, who have yet again had another great edition of the Tour of Britain. Mark Donovan is there for the Q36.5. Um, he sits at only three seconds on the GC. Abram Stockman, one of the most aggressive riders in the race and the most aggressive rider of yesterday's stage, making it two for him. He's there for TDT Univet and rounding out a quintet out in front today. Liam Johnson, 21 years of age of Australia from Trinity Racing. Brian, this is a solid group. Definitely. You know, we knew that uh, Turner and, Aust um, and uh, Donovan, they weren't waiting. And... You know, that opportunist move came from Richardson. It was a, it was almost a hiding to nothing. You know, what made the difference was, you know, the peloton kind of waiting up for, for the, all of the uh, Yumbo Visma team. And, you know, if the gap did go over at three minutes, which it did, then that gave the opportunity. It, it begged a question, um, and it happened. So it just goes to show you that you never give up. And I think when you're in that three-man group, it's not a case of measuring your effort for the whole stage. You have to measure your effort for the next kind of five, ten kilometres. So you actually ride a little bit harder. The closer they get to that, that group in front, and, and, and it works. The, the, the tactic to be able to do that worked. The, the two strongest guys, they were always going to have a choice to make, but it wouldn't have been a choice if it was over a minute, a minute and 30 or two minutes. That wouldn't have been the choice. They, they would have been still leading, but... They forced the question, and um, thankfully for you know the three riders of Stockman, uh, Johnston, and uh, of course Richardson, they're now in the, the break of the day. Just looking back through the uh, St. Piran team, every single rider is only at three seconds. So yeah, Richardson, Birchall, Crockett, Kiffin, Rook, and Gray, Tidball all sit at only three seconds. So very consistent riding and aggressive riding from the Cornish team, as we've become used to. But yeah, three minutes and one seconds. Now, interestingly, Brian, just looking back at the peloton being led by Jumbo Bisma, no real surprise to see Eduardo Affini at the front now. On the previous stages, his heft, his engine was used towards the back end, uh, not to ride consistently, but to lift the pace and to get involved in the early stage of the lead out. But today, uh, they're saving Stephen Kreisweig, probably for two reasons. He's had a hard few days already being spending time on the front, but they'll need him on the climbs towards the end, won't they? So Stephen Kreisbach being rested, and for the first time they're perming their team in a slightly different way, which is also something that interests me, that different riders will be used at different stages, depending on the terrain as well. So Feeney being used early on, 
because it's quite likely that Athene may be distanced if the race gets very hard um, on the later stages because this mid phase of the race that we're entering into now is just gently undulating. There's a couple of steep kickers, but as we head into the final 40 Ks, that's when we get a lot more steep climbs, which are going to suit Stephen Kreisweik that little bit more. They appear to be resting Kreisweik. He's actually sat behind Olaf Koy at the moment. So the key riders at the back end of today's stage for Jumbo Bisma are going to be Van Hoydonk and Stephen Kreisweik. Matt, I was just um, writing down. Um, Mark Donovan and Alec Richardson are virtually the race leaders on the road. Yeah. Um, and because there's riders up there in the general classification, big pressure on this team. But you just mentioned something as well that's uh, using Afini. Um, what the teams will do as well is if Kreuzweg and Yusuf van Emden are, are kind of used now, it's, you've got to remember they were dropped at the start. Um, so you want to have numbers. You want to keep, uh, and like you say, use your use your team to your advantage. I think, given the choice, maybe keep a Finney back because he's so strong towards the end. But if you'd have used um, Kreuzweg and used Van Emden now during this stage, they would have been completely gone. So I think it's given them a big rest during the kind of mid-start of stage, and they've still got six riders at the front of the peloton. That that shows when you're riding in a peloton and you look up and you see the six riders all in yellow, or, of course, you know, one in green and one in the leader's jersey, you think, that was a hard start. And all six of them are at the front, so you don't want to lose anybody uh, too early. So, it's a, again, it's a show strength of numbers. And, you know, it might have been different a few years ago, um, but I really do think over the last, you know, four or five years, um, Yomo Visma across the board, um, tactically, they get it uh, more right than wrong these days. Yep, they seem to. And they're certainly bossing things over at the Vuelta as well, aren't they? Um, what a final grand tour of the season they're having. Still nine stages to go, remember? But um, an absolutely incredible race. And I'm sure any of you watching this will know the situation there. But yeah, they are fighting on all fronts at the very, very highest level. They are an incredible team, that's for sure. And they're doing a good job at the moment. They're keeping this gap down. It's not growing anymore. It maxed out and around three and a half minutes as we press on I see one of the local clubs there out in force at the side of the road but uh, yeah, the, these Swindon. climbs was at the Swindon team that's a fair well not too far a ride probably about 50 50 60 k's away um, for the Swindon riders but that gorgeous gorgeous day for a cafe run today uh, but a hard one as well they'll be welcome I'll be welcoming, should I say, the shade that they're riding through at the moment. But I've been impressed by this uh, by Stockman. He was climbing really well, wasn't he, as well, on the on the opening climb of the day. Uh, before Fouché came by him, he actually dropped Fouché on the steepest part. So, again, he's quite a thick-set lad as well. Looks very powerful, but he's effective over the climbs and clearly still full of fight. Uh, bearing in mind, I think, out of, I think it's three of the five days or three of the six days he's been in the breakaway. So enormously impressive riding by the man from the TDT Unibet cycling team. But this is the first break uh, of, of note that we've seen Alexander Richardson in. But of course, they've already had Zeb Kiffin and Rootkin Gray and Tidball up the road uh, on different occasions. And they're putting Jumbo Visma under a little bit of pressure as the gap goes out a little bit more to three minutes and nine seconds. And as Brian said, the, the leaders on the road at the moment, Alexander Richardson uh, and also Mark Donovan, Ben Turner just sits a little bit further back. He's at 18 seconds. They won't be too worried about that at the moment. Uh, but I'm sure they'd like to come away from this as well, as well as trying to win the race and trying to take a stage as well. But uh, although Ben Turner's got riders that are slightly in front of him on the general classification, that won't really factor in. They've got to look at trying to build, firstly, um, a real hope of this break succeeding before they worry about things like that. So right now, as we've been saying day after day, everybody in this group... Uh, are running as a collective. Yeah, they are. Um, just taking it nice and steady on the on the climb. You can see, staying together. This is an, another uncategorised climb. Um, the locals have come out in numbers, so they know what a climb is. This is uncategorised, and you can see in most races that um, you know these climbs draw out. It's because the riders are riding that little bit slower, um, so the climbs draw out the. the spectators at the side of the road yep there's always big crowds out for the uh, 
the Tour de Cotswolds back in the day, the race that we were talking about. As uh, it is Eduardo Athene. Taking back a little bit of time on the climb, but no panic at all from Athene. Just uh, riding that rhythm. Two minutes and 50 seconds. Uh, drop over the top of this climb. And there is a slight little bit of flat, but the best part of 8 or 9K, they drop down again. But it just undulates all day long. Some climbs steeper than others. And then between 100Ks and 120Ks, we've got a particularly fast section where we generally lose elevation from being on this high ridge. And then we start the final 40Ks where we have uh, more back-to-back -back climbs of a far steeper gradient. So the final 40Ks of today's stage are particularly challenging, including the only other categorised climb of Crawley Hill. And that's a Cat 2, 1,700 metres long. Not as steep as the earlier climb we had today, but still 6.6% average gradient. And then, Brian, with... 10 k's to go there's another very steep climb as well isn't there before the drop down and a little kicker just before the line so it's a complex and challenging running and regardless of what happens with this breakaway there are still opportunities for riders to drive try and go clear in the final 20 30 k's of this race as well definitely um there's some good racing roads towards the end and if you're a rider we've already mentioned on with uh, recent form Stephen Williams then you're going to wait for these opportunities you're going to hope that Jumbo Visma don't have strength in numbers towards the end unfortunately there's not a lot you can do about it you know they have got the whole team there so they'll be hoping that you know others start to get um, you know start to go on the attack and you know you can join in and you know have that kind of um, kind of killer punch towards the end um, so yeah, what, what you'd be hoping for is there'll be less Jumbo Visma riders towards the end and you go on the attack. Um, but I'm pretty sure it's, you know, with Wilt Van Aert there, it's going to be very difficult. Yep, I do think so. Van Aert has looked uh, so, so strong. That uh, beautiful stage win a couple of days ago. Um, on the fit to the finish in a Felix though, that deft little uh, dropping off the wheel by Olaf Coy, allowing Van Aert that little bit of space and then just that brute force into the headwind, stealing that uh, three-second lead, which ultimately has seen him move into the jersey. But the, this number here, I mean, I'd say the optimum number for a breakaway in terms of what they've got ahead of them, Brian, would be maybe six or maybe seven riders, but five is still a good fighting force. 30 seconds on the front. Uh, and also they can, like you were saying, especially with the experience they've got in this group, um, in particular from Richardson, uh, Turner, and Donovan, they'll know how to pace this one as well. They'll know exactly what the gap is going to be. They'll know how Jumbo Fisma are riding. And they will be holding something back. And having five riders does allow you that little bit of, a, of, of recuperation. So they'll know that they don't want to push too hard. They know how hard the final phase of racing is. So they'll be really balanced and sort of measuring their effort here, aren't they? And responding a little bit to that time gap. So right now, um, I think... Well, actually, I've I posed a question to you, Brian. You've done this for long enough. You've been in the car on, on, on many occasions and ridden yourself. Who do you think right now is dictating terms? Is it, are the brake measuring it because of what Jumbo Visma are doing, or is it the other way around? Who do you think's actually um, got the position of control right now in terms of pace dictation? It's always an interesting one. Sometimes it's very easy to tell, and other times it's a little bit harder. Yeah, the, the bunch are in control at the moment. Um, completely uh, and it's often the case so you know they've been given three minutes um, they can always you know pull this back a little bit when they want they've already showed us what they can do in this race okay this is a completely different stage to the flat stages we've already had um, but there's a there's a case here this is a kind of middle part uh, of the of the stage you want to be doing your turn at the front but you want to be saving so something for the kind of run to the finish because Jumbo Visma, and they'll they know this in front, the whole team, that's why it's important, they'll know the whole team, six riders from Jumbo Visma are at the front of the peloton, that's a show of strength, so three minutes or three and a half minutes is the maximum they're going to get, so if you start pushing that out, then you'll get a reaction from the, the front of the peloton, they don't want that, so it's a case of more times out of none that uh, the peloton are always in control of the pace, Matt. Yep, and this group reacting. A bit of a chat there from either, not too sure whether that was Mouldy, John Mould or Pete Kenyak in the team car there. Uh, having a chat with their young liege, Liam Johnson. And 
not the youngest rider in the team. And the youngest award goes to Paul Magnier, the Frenchman, who's uh, 19 years of age. But uh, Johnson drops back onto the uh, rear end of this group, which right now are looking pretty effective. And for a moment, or for several miles, it was uh, an interesting and intriguing proposition. Will the two leaders, Ben Turner and Mark Donovan, drop back? And ultimately they did, and I think they've done the right thing because they've actually not lost any of that lead. In fact, it's gone out now to 3 minutes and 21 seconds. I still think Jumbo Vision will be happy with this. I think they'd have preferred it to be full of riders who didn't pose any threat on the general classification, but they know how to deploy their resource. We've seen that day after day. And what's equally remarkable, or equally as uh, impressive, is the fact that on five of the occasions where they've controlled the racing, they've actually finished off and taken the stage win as well. The only day they didn't manage to pull that off is because of a certain Danny Van Poppel, who emerged victorious yesterday by the narrowest of margins. A superb sprint, an important win for Danny Van Poppel. Uh, Bora Hansgrohe taking a win away from this race. But uh, they'll be quite interested in this situation as well. But uh, actually looking, Brian, so let's let's play with a couple of scenarios let's say this group um, you know they pick things up near the end that they've got two and a half minutes heading into the last 20 k's it's looking like it could go clear do you think some of the big teams that have missed it there's two big teams that have missed it uh, Movistar and Bora don't have representation they've got the defending champion uh, Gonzalo Sodano they've got uh, Rod Rodriguez Mulberger um, Verona who can function exceptionally well over this sort of terrain and then you've got the likes of Ada Schelling and maybe Niels Pollitt. I mean, again, he's a heavier rider, but Ada Schelling's done a lot of work already. What do you think? They, they're going to keep a watchful eye. They're not going to help at all at the moment. But do you think those... We've seen Movistar get involved. What do you think Movistar would do later on if this gap doesn't come down? That's a big if, by the way. Yeah, um, I'm going to rule out Bora Hansgrohe. Um, I think if they had the legs, then they would have been with... Um, Donovan and Turner, that's my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Um, because they were quite sprightly in other stages and I think they they were if they had their legs they, they would have wanted to be here. Um so I'm gonna kinda of roll them out in the in the final. I think um Movistar are the most interesting ones, last year's winner and you know he can go over climbs and sprint very well. So I think um if I was Movistar I would I would really watch this. We saw them put a rider up there for Cantor the other day, and there's no reason why they put they wouldn't put another rider up here if it got out of hand uh, to kind of help out the chase. So they've showed that they're they're willing to ride. Um, so again, Movistar, I think rightly you've picked out the team that is most likely to get involved towards the end as well. Um, but I find it hard that they have got some strong riders in the, in in this race. You've just mentioned them. Why? Why did they not put a kind of Verona in this in this breakaway? I know he's lost a little bit of time, but Verona Yeah, Verona came down. Yeah, Mulberg is yeah. one for me. I mean, he's, he's a, yeah, one of the finest climbers in this race, Brian. Let's be let's yeah. be honest. Let's make no bones about it. He's, he's already had a win, but that unless he just wasn't. I mean, um, it might not. Be Maybe they're just waiting for the final. Yeah. Maybe it's a case of that's their tactic, waiting. Yeah. It's clear that Ennis are not waiting for the final. He wants to instigate the race. Um, but there's teams that will just sit back and go, right, we're going to wait for the final. And, and they do have options, Rodriguez, Milberger, and, of course, um, Serrano. So they have got big options. Face there of uh, Ben Turner. Really lovely lad. Really likeable fellow. In fact, all these lads are, are good. <laughs> it's not many cyclists that uh, aren't particularly pleasant, but he's uh, a very likeable fellow. Just uh, dropped back to the team cart exchanged a few words with his direct support team on that occasion it was uh, ollie cookson and the same now for the superior rider alexander richardson drops back to have a little word and one man that knows the cocktails particularly well i remember um, um julian Wynn, who's in the team car i'm not sure if that's Lam uh, steve lampio or julian Wynn, but i remember winnie jumping away at the beginning of the tour de cotswolds um, and taking taking the opening climb he treated it as if it was just a hill climb if he's listening i remember that really well i can't remember what year it was but uh, just went from the gun to take the preen that you were talking about i think on that particular occasion i think it might have been something like 250 quid brian 500 quid it was a really big preem at the top of the opening climb but um i think he paid for it a little bit later 
but yeah, uh, a brutal opening, uh, a brutal opening salvo to a race that sadly uh, is no longer with us. A very, very um, prestigious race back in the day. But uh, it's good to see that we're revisiting the lanes and it's nice to see the Tour of Britain here for the very first time. Because we've never had a start or a finish in Tewkesbury or Gloucester. So virgin territory for the Tour of Britain. As we look further back, that's a Max Cantor. I wonder if he's one of the, I think he was one of the riders that came down in that crash yesterday, Brian. His knee heavily bandaged. Just in front of him is the aforementioned Austrian, Gregor Mulberger. And there is Carlos Verona. Uh, he crashed along with Jos van Emden on that little pinch point at the bottom of Winchcombe Hill uh, about 45 minutes ago now. But we've got this holding pattern now, three minutes and nine seconds. But of all the breakaways, looking back over the discount in the terrain, Brian, but of all the breakaways we've had in the Tour of Britain so far, this is the most potent for two reasons. Um, the gap they've managed to build and also the quality that's in this group as well. This, I think, poses potentially the biggest threat, although no panic at all from Jumbo Visma, but this one looks to me to be hmm, very, very interesting. Yeah, it is, and you know, it's always going to be the case because when the breakaway goes over um, you know, a difficult um, route, then you know, it's always going to be that little bit stronger. So, you know, Ben Turner and Donovan were two of the strongest riders um, over the categorised climb. Uh, they were joined after that by, you know, three riders that just about kind of hung on um, to the, the front of the group and took their opportunity. Um, and they're in the front of the race. So it's a case of just do your turn, just team time trial, do your turn. We've been saying this every day, just kind of hold that little bit back. They know it's going to be active towards the end. They know that there's a few riders and teams that just kind of sat back and they will will get active towards it, the end and, and, and they'll have to kind of wait and see. Do I think... These riders are go to, going to go to the end. I think it's highly unlikely. Um, but what it does do is, if if you if if it really does, Ben Turner is a, one of the key men for me because if he goes all in for this, he's got a couple of riders that are up there in the general classification that that can possibly benefit from all his hard work today. Yeah, definitely. Those Grandiers can sit back. They've still got, remember, Carlos Rodriguez uh, who sits at three seconds and also Magnus Sheffield also at three seconds. They've also got Connor Swift in terms of just a stage win and Connor Swift exceptionally strong. Just uh, having a bit of food, sat on the wheel of our race leader, Wout Van Aert. So they've still got options behind. Yeah, definitely Swift, Rodriguez. But in terms of the possible general classification options, Magnus Sheffield, I think, and Connor Swift, sorry, and Carlos Rodriguez are there better options because they're only just three seconds behind ben turner sits at 18 seconds looks around and sees the figure of abram stockman in the, the light blue of tdt unibet rolling through and they're moving nice and quickly here uh, an effective fighting force they are pretty well drilled here moving nicely and right now jos van emden is uh, matching the pace of this group in front and they make it look easy but brian regardless of the class of van emden um, this is hard this is probably the hardest stage in terms of maintaining the lead. If they ease off ever so slightly, this group's going to start building even more time. And as you said, although, like you, I think there's, I'm only giving this, this group a small chance of surviving to the finish, or at least a couple of members. It would certainly fragment if one member were to, to go to the finish alone, or a couple of them. Um, but this is, we've, this is going to put Jumbo Visma under the most pressure they've been under today, uh, for sure. Uh, they're going to really have to think about how they use their resources but they have got a wealth of riches in terms of the riders they have at their disposal. Affini, Kreuzweig, Van Emden. I mean, they'll use Olaf Koy as well, remember. Um, although he was dropped earlier on, he's gonna, um, they will use him today. He's not interested in the general classification. He's already got four stage wins. It's all about this man for the GC. And I think Olaf Koy will be, will be dropped in the final. But before that, that he will be of a very important use. We won't have seen him on the front. No, they, I think Olaf Koy has already been used. Um, this is a, a stage it's it's a little bit too difficult for him. You know, hold back Nathan Van Hooydonk and Stephen Kreuzwick. That's the, the two kind of key riders. So, you know, he's been held by three. Just Van Emden, Afini and Koy will be used. Uh, it's important to keep the whole team towards the front. But I say this every day. Look at the um, the, the peloton as uh, Just Van Emden just tries to kind of track that TV motorbike. It's in one line. The pace is on. Um, not going to be easy. Still a long, long way to go. 100, 
15 kilometres. Um, but I'm looking forward to the uh, final 20, 30 kilometres because this race will definitely open up. And the fact that um, Ben Turner's here is, and, and also Donovan as well, uh, they have to treat this uh, seriously, and they are. Yep, they're uh, giving this breakaway a lot of respect. Well, they can't afford to let it go out. If it goes out to four minutes, for example, that's going to make it very hard. Still with 114 Ks to go. And even factoring in the resource that they have this is a break to be respected and uh, these riders although this is going to be a very hard day right now um a break of five uh, very effective and it's 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 on the slightly small side but just i'd say just on the cusp of being optimum that a couple of minutes recovery in between turns on the front means you can hit the front keep that pace just a little bit higher because you know then you've got an opportunity to really rest up properly, especially if you tuck right on the wheel. And on this slightly flattered midsection as well, this is where that's, there's that increased opportunity to recover when you're sat second, third, fourth, or fifth wheel, really tuck in on the wheel behind. And they're the sorts of things that the DS will be telling the younger riders in this group, especially the likes of Liam Johnson is, get tight to that wheel in front, make sure you're not wasting any energy at all. This is gonna be a long, hard day in the saddle. And this is where, economy of effort um, if the brake is going to survive super super crucial here it's the, all about the detail now if this brake's going to stay away it's all in the detail now brian isn't it it is it is indeed um but jumbo visma have got it well under control here you know they're going to have a hard day and that's why they're, they're using kind of utilizing different riders and that's what you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis but you know they're the team that have been forced to to ride at the front of the peloton since day one, since they won the first stage and won the next few stages. They were beaten yesterday by uh, Van Poppel and just a, you know, a bit of weakness towards the end um, when we're expecting Mo, uh, Van Aert and uh, Olaf Kau to kind of dominate things, proceedings, but they're under a bit of pressure today, but although they're using kind of two or three riders at the front of the peloton to control this breakaway five, they still have some firepower left for the final. Yep, definitely. Yeah, the team essentially split into uh, two halves. Uh, so we hear the unfortunate abandon of one of the riders from Global Six Cycling Team, Tomoya Koyama. And we had a, a close um, view of him yesterday. Not like he was enjoying his Tour of Britain so far, but unfortunately has abandoned the race. Now look at uh, the team car of uh, the Univet team, or TDT Univet. And show the conversation giving their rider a little bit of encouragement. I don't think he needs too much encouragement, this man. He's had an absolutely superb Tour of Britain so far. He's wearing a yellow number, a yellow dossard, as a reward for the fact that he was given, for the second time in this race, the most aggressive rider. We're looking now at the rather gorgeous town of Sirencester. It is absolutely gorgeous. And back in Roman times, it was the second largest town in Britain. Um, an absolutely gorgeous location. Spent a lot of time here over the years. Riding through, stopping for brews. But yeah, it's expanded quite a lot over the, over the last sort of decade or so. It's got a lot bigger, as you can see. It's a big new industrial estate, shopping estate, just uh, to the north of your screen there. But uh, its market square is dominated by the cathedral-like parish church of St. John the Baptist, which is one of the largest in England. Um, and that was built around 1490. And again, its uh, market town was mentioned first, post-Roman, of course, in the Dimsey Book of 1086. And uh, they set up their stalls in the town. And there's a farmer's market in there as well, unsurprisingly. But it is an absolutely gorgeous place to visit, as is pretty much every single town and village which the race passes through today. 1-1-1, one, 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 just under 110.9 k's to go now. Three minutes and uh, nine seconds. So three minutes and five, should I say. And Jos van Emden has done an extraordinarily large pull on the front here as we head to the outskirts of Sirencester. Lots of cowbells on the go. I don't know if we go straight through the centre of the town. I think we're skirting around the edge here, around the bypass. Uh, but uh, there's some pretty... This is this flatter middle section here. And, uh, and this is where, if they ride a tuck in, this is where they can get that little bit of rest. It's harder, isn't it, on those little drags on the climb. So an important part.
part of the race to keep that lead, but also to make sure that you are recovering when you're sat in the wheel, Brian? You have to. That's the, the, the whole part of it. You know, you have to kind of combine together and do your turn at the front and then recover. Remember eating and drinking and, you know, make sure you're doing plenty of that because the effort you're going to have to make today is going to be uh, enormous if you get any chance of kind of staying away. But, you know, it's good for Donovan and then Turner to have... Um, you know, the other three with them now and sometimes we get these we you know we can we can talk about this and I know sometimes when I would get myself in a breakaway um, sometimes you get a little bit of choice who you actually follow because some some riders will kind of bring through some riders are bigger than others and some some riders in a breakaway you feel as if you're you're a little bit more happy to sit on and sometimes it happens naturally it seems to have happened a bit more kind of naturally here um, but I would miss a turn or two and then get the rider that I want because you're always thinking of these things and if I was in these, this breakaway I'd probably want to sit, sit behind Ben Turner uh, I that's what I would want that's, that's, I, you know we, I think we should mention that you know, I, would, I think Alex Richardson is in the best best place there I would want to sit behind a smooth tall rider and get maximum shelter I think that's I don't actually I know the way this group has coalesced and, and ultimately formed um, nobody's missed a turn but uh, again we don't have the camera on them all the time but just that dropping back to the team car or just missing a wheel uh, missing a turn every now and again just to to slot yourself onto your the favored wheel. i think that's i don't think that's a mistake i think richardson because he's so smart i think that's exactly what he's done pick the biggest rider he's going to get the most shelter even if it's just saving every just three or four watts um, than somebody than sitting behind somebody smaller and as you can see, Alexander Richardson is the, um, although he's, a, he's, he's not a small figure, he's quite a muscular figure, is Alexander Richardson. He's uh, one of the shortest, I think, so he's uh, chosen to sat behind the biggest. So a smart thing to do. And as the gap comes down under three minutes now, Jos van Emden doing an exceptionally effective job on the front, keeping that lead at uh, a minimum. Uh, but the breakaway... By the pace that they're riding at, making it hard for them behind. But a good job, good holding pattern now, settled over the race as a headway. As we head well into deep in now into the second third of proceedings, and a fantastic crowd, of course. Run the weekend now, it's Saturday, and the crowds have come out in force to see the, the Tour of Britain pass through. But uh, yeah, it was just a neck of the woods. You did much riding in a part to all the Cotswolds. I used to come out here in, in the winter when I was back in the late 80s, but I used to have a, a Hemel Hempstead hostel trip that uh, every uh, every winter in October used to come out here and do some a uh, couple of 150 mile, 130 mile ride and stay in a local hostel. But uh, fond memories of the Cotswolds for me. Yes, uh, I've been here a couple of times away from, from cycling. Uh, a lot of the time I would do my long ride um, from just outside Birmingham and come down into the Cotswolds a little bit. Um, but talking about youth hostel, um, do you remember doing your um, your duty before you had to leave in the morning? Oh, did yes. Oh, yeah, do that yeah we did. Because we stayed at uh, Stow on the Wold, which is not too far away. Do not too sure if we go through Stow on the Wold today, um, but that is another beautiful old old market town, the little river that, that passes through. Really picturesque, proper picture postcard uh, place. Lots of Cotswold stone, little pubs, tea rooms. I mean, it really is. It's like being in Lord of the Rings. It's like it's like hobbits should live there. Uh, but yeah, Stow on the Wold. Um, yeah, we have to do the washing up. We had a big cooked breakfast which was cooked for us, but we had to do the washing up before we left the youth hostel in the morning. Uh, and I, I must say, we were most of us were quite hungover, so it was quite... <laughs> it, it was, was quite, quite hard work. <laughs> the, yeah, the group, I, the group I had when we used to go up to kind of Inverary or uh, down to One Lock Head, um, you know, especially for Halloween, One Lock Head is the, the highest town in, in Britain. And, you know, we do these, do these rides and stop at the hostel but we also used to use the youth hostel when we used to come down to ride the Peter Buckley's myself and uh, Drew Wilson who's you know a club mate of mine uh, st still a good friend um, so we used to come down in the car squashed in the car bike some top come down stay do a ride about an hour an hour and a half on the Saturday evening stay in the hostel um, cook our own food oh my mum cooked their food and then um, we'd uh, get up in the morning and uh, 
do a wee either sweeping up or washing up or, or doing something. Do your duty, and then off to the race we went. Yep. Um, I can't remember how much it cost us to say, but it was nominal. That's something like a ten, yeah, five or ten pounds. Yep. But what you used to do, as Brian was saying, you'd help tidy up, or you'd make the beds, or at least uh, turn your beds down and, and, and give them all the washing, all, all the sheets, or something like that. Um, but uh, I'm not too sure if there's still a youth hostel store in the world. I think there is, but we are talking like 1986, 80, no, 87, 88, 89. Um, a very. I always thought it was time. character building that sort oh, of stuff. Oh, it's brilliant. And, Honestly, and mate, I, I can. Yeah, the brilliant. And I don't think youngsters do do any of that stuff. And, you know, I can remember we, we didn't have um, too many cafes in those days that can entertain cyclists. Because as soon as a bunch of 20 cyclists go into a cafe, all the windows steam up and, you know, we, we <laughs> kind of frighten off, frighten off the, yeah. all the locals. But um, certain cafes didn't like. Um, even when I went to live in Isle of Man, they were... You have to be out here for half twelve. We are paying customers, you know that. You're telling us we have to be out by half past twelve because all the other um, better dressed customers are coming. I says we won't be back. Um, so we it certainly character well. So we didn't have the cafes, and um, so we used to call them uh, drum ups. Um, and what we used to do is, you know, some of the the, the older guys uh, used to go in certain spots. They would build a fire, and uh, so you just turn up. You'd maybe stop at a local shop. Get, uh, tin of soup um, and so you'd have your sandwich in your back pocket and things like that, just go up there and you have your can, you fill some water up, boil your can throw a tea bag in you know, boil your soup, you had one of these wee small uh, tin openers um, but even you would turn up and somebody would make you a cup of tea even if you had, other, I, even as a pro um, I turned up at one of the spots outside of Paisley called the B spot, I had nothing in my pocket and I thought I'm just going to pop in and see who's there so it was right next to a, a wee loch and I turned up and somebody put a can, of, a can of water on and threw a tea bag on and had a cup of tea and just uh, chatted to the to the old guys about cycling and you know that that was it. no fancy cafes um, so that was all for me character building and uh, going down to Harrogate cycle show staying in a tent and things like that doing a little bit of racing so but everybody nowadays gets lifted and laid and turn up in their nice sparkly uh, team buses and things like that now <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I think there's yeah there's certainly more opportunity. There's certainly more things around, and there's uh, definitely a little bit more support. But I still think you know a lot of the youngsters uh, still like to see as, as kids still get out of the bikes as you know go uh, gravel adventures and stuff. It's just slightly different, isn't it, Brian? But I I do remember uh, my days uh, in my in my teens and my early twenties with great fondness. Uh, but like you say, there there weren't really cycling cafes a lot of the places now are geared around because it's so popular now uh, they are basically geared around cycling and then other other normal people in inverted commas go in and go there as well but, but back in the day in the 80s it was the other way around you'd go to a tea room and uh, and, and quite often i mean there were some that were, were were friendly some that weren't as we look at alexander richardson again just uh, traveling light um, one of the only runs with one bottle cage on we know why that is just to save that little bit of weight uh, I'm not too sure if it's aerodynamically superior because what, quite often filling the hole in the centre of the frame is a good thing to do, but I'm sure he's thought that through. But no, there's, there, was, there weren't as many cafes, but the ones you went into, uh, sometimes you were eyed with a little bit of suspicion and were made to feel, not all the time, but sometimes a little bit unwelcome. And we had a couple of lads, actually, who didn't like spending money. You'd actually bring their own tea bags uh, and just um, <laughs> they wouldn't have cakes because they said it was too expensive. One lad used to bring his own tea bags and, and then use our hot water and make his own cup of tea. Um, <laughs> but what was the price time. of a tea bag in those days? Come on, oh, I, I can understand I, I, cake I, or biscuit or something like that. Oh, no, he used to bring, he'd bring his own tea bag. Did yeah. he used to hang up his tea bags at home and, and use them? I don't know. I, I'm not them? too sure. I do know that that was a thing that used to happen. But anyway, from tea bags <laughs> back to Yumbo Bismuth, uh, the extreme... Polar seamless, opposite, seamless. Uh, <laughs> seamless. There we go. And I'm sure, maybe I'm sure, uh, Yumbo is a is a supermarket. Maybe they, I'm sure they sell tea bags there. So that, that's not too bad. A segue. But uh, our all our cafe chat. Um, a few kilometres have passed by. It won't be too long before we get into double digits. 103 k's to go, just over. There's a few riders just uh, wheel over to the other side of the road. Ryan Mullen, one of them as well. Another team that um, I thought may have been a little bit more active. They were certainly covering some of the moves that 
maybe kicking themselves that they weren't in the break, although it might have been shut down quicker. The Uno Expo cycling team, they've been really active over the last week or so, figuring in the bunch sprints. And they've got several riders who are in with the shout of the GC. Tobias Johannesson, Rasmus Tiller and Martin Urlianstad. Um, they're the three riders who sit only three seconds behind Wout van Aert. But I'm surprised that they didn't try and infiltrate this move as well. Although saying that, Brian, if there'd been an Uno X in here as well and or a Movistar, I think Jumbo Visa might have shut it down a little bit quicker or at least tried to. Yeah, I think when it went, um, possibly the the only the only teams or I would say riders that could have reacted to it possibly would have been kind of Walt Van Aert, and, and he's not going to do it. He's, he's he knows that he has to just kind of watch, try and shut down, and you know do his little bit of job. Um, you know, in the first kind of skirmishes on on those climbs, and he knew that. You know he's going to wait. If, if push came to shove, I think Walt Van Aert would have just. If Movi or maybe some other teams had infiltrated the breakaway and it started getting out of hand, he would have just gone with it and just sat on it and been, uh, you know, weighed it down and hopefully it would be out to regrouped. So, you know, that that would have been a, a plan in the back of his mind. But the fact that it was only Ben Turner and Mark Donovan, there was no reason to react to it. The fact that others didn't try and get involved possibly saying that they couldn't they didn't have the legs when when it went but then again they should have been okay to maybe go with the the other three riders that went in stockman uh, johnston and richardson um but they possibly thought you know the break's gone nothing we're not going to get anywhere near it and you know that was a hard start i'm just going to save something so there's a, quite a lot of permutations right from the start if movistar had of reacted and Serrano had a went, I'm pretty sure we would have seen Walt Van Aert just go with it and then just sit on it, Matt. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think you're, you're quite right. St. Piran again, moving up. Just making sure that Alexander Richardson, especially given the fact he's only carrying one bottle, will be doing that a lot. But with a gap at two and a half minutes, or just over, sorry, two and three quarter minutes, and no issues at all with the team cars being there. So as and when he can drop back, get himself a beat on. Back on the hoods. And just uh, latching it back on to the wheel of Ben Turner. His uh, chosen wheel of choice. And that's another little cut-off pair of tights with some ice in the back that will uh, slip between the shoulder blades to keep him nice and cool. 30 degrees plus out on the road here as we head towards Gloucester. In two minutes and 40 seconds. So uh, Jumbo Visma doing a very good job here, Brian. Of her keeping this at bay as we see uh, Trinity Racing's Liam Johnson on the back. Now, if you uh, do quite like the look of the Trinity Racing kit, um, you can buy it. Uh, it's a special edition. And the reason I'm giving this a shout out is because um, any profits go towards cyclists fighting cancer. So um, their normal kit, well, they always have quite a disruptive cycling kit to Trinity Racing. Uh, they're one that normal one this year looks like tv interference to be honest with you but i really do like it but this one is blue and yeah um, any profits if you fancy buying it head to their website um, and uh, proceeds go towards cyclists fighting cancer so a big shout out to trinity for doing something a little bit different and towards an exceptionally worthy cause as well so eduardo affini doing what eduardo affini does um, very effectively such a beast, isn't he? Remember him a couple of years ago, Brian. Cast my back maybe three years at the Giro d'Italia. Nearly, nearly won a bunch sprint, didn't he? Uh, I think uh, actually it was Giacomo Nizzolo who just came round him in the dying meters, and I think he finished second on on the day. Doesn't win a lot of bike races. That's not his job, though, is it, Brian? It's it's doing this sort of thing, getting involved in the in the early leadouts too. But is so so good at doing this particular sort of job, and so an exceptionally valued member of the team. I think he first kind of burst onto the scene as a, a bit more of a kind of time trial specialist. He did, yeah. Big horsepower, right. and I remember that stage. That was Nizzolo's first stage in the, in the Giro d'Italia. It was, and yeah. He just kind of chinned off in the last kind of kilometre, and everybody thought, right, he's won this one, and all of a, all of a sudden, like a bolt of lightning, Nizzolo fired off the front of the peloton, used his slipstream and just came past. But he is a big powerhouse. We've, we've seen him in the sprint finishes, the way he moves up, 
uh, at, the, at the right time, having that power to be able to deliver the rest of them, it's, it's just been a masterclass. But I don't think there's a, a stronger team in this race. But then again, um, they have been dominant for five days. Even even yesterday, they were quite dominant. They never finished it off, of course, but it's such a strong, strong team. And, and they're utilising everybody. They have to, six-man team, they have to. Um, I'm just looking forward to the final because the final has to be very active. Um, they cannot. Every every team can't wait just for tomorrow. Tomorrow is another day, and it will be difficult. But I think Walt Van Aert hasn't really been tested at all. Yep. Well, this man is no stranger to winning stage of the Tour of Britain. In fact, he didn't win very much. He, he won at the uh, individual time trial um, that started with in Pershaw back in 2019. Uh, Eduardo Finney went when riding for Mitchelton Scott. Beat Sebastian Langfeld and Dylan van Baal. Both of them then riding for different teams. Van Baal, of course, now with Jumbo Visma. But the Fina now 27 years of age. And another rider that uh, Jumbo Visma, and because of what we just talked about, Brian, because he's so consistent, so, so reliable, if he's in the team, he's always there. It's never, it's so, so reliable at doing this very particular sort of job. Um, and up this little drag putting out a lot of power there and eye-watering power and he's making it look like he's riding down the shops but yeah locked in till 2026 and again just a, a, a real illustration of how important Afini is to the to the deeper workings uh, of uh, Jumbo Visma. Yep definitely and we just saw there another uh, indication of you know when to do things and we talked about it the other day just Olaf Kai pulls over for a natural break, so does the, the race leader, Walt Van Aert, and a few other riders do it at the same time. See, when you see the the jerseys of the, the main kind of contenders stop for a natural, that's the time to do it. Don't do it on your own sometimes, um, because they won't wait for you, So, and it's a little bit harder. So it was an um, unofficial stop if you wanted to stop and do a natural. Yeah, definitely. Just looking back, talking about the, the differences in in the riders' preparation for this race. Uh, the Tour of Britain allows, you know, we've got national teams in Great Britain, continental teams, of course. That's a nice shot. It's just, it's a beautiful shot, isn't it? Look at that. So light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, that really is pretty beautiful, isn't it? This long, long drag. Again, a bit of welcome shelter from the brilliant sunshine beating down on the backs of the riders here today uh, on their way to Gloucester. But it's just a race programme. I know St. Perrin do have a pretty solid race program, but if you compare, for example, Alexander Richardson um, with Ben Turner, or actually a better example is Mark Donovan. Um, five, six one-day road races, uh, and then he's done four stage of the Tour of Norway. Um, they didn't start stage three, so three stages of the Tour of Norway, and Rockland Melton, Arno Waller Memorial, Timmy James uh, Memorial Grand Prix, has won two, won the Portsmouth North End Road Race, won the Rafa a Lincoln Grand Prix, and then the rest of it would, would, would have been smaller British races that aren't quite at national level and just preparing himself. So um, that's the difference, isn't it? He's clearly a rider that can prepare himself and get himself in very, very good shape, but he's had a fraction of the race days of the likes of uh, the World Tour opposition that he's up against today. Yeah, um, and a lot of the races he rides are probably one or two kilometres an hour slower than World Tour uh, races as well. As well yeah. So that, yeah. Yeah, that makes a big difference. Don't know if you just noticed there that um, Connor Swift, he was getting a musette there, but before he got the musette, he threw away both of his bottles in the bike. And some people might think, well, I'll, I'll keep one bottle, throw it away and put another bottle and, and, and maybe put the other bottle on my back. It's a lot, it's better to have two cold drinks than to have, because um, there's obviously something left in both bottles there. Yeah. Because um, when you finish a bottle, you'll throw it away. So they weren't, two of them weren't finished, but it's better to have cold water than, than warm water. No, definitely. And a lot of these, uh, the, well, all the teams here, will, even the Conti teams will have good access and uh, have plenty of bidons on board and fully aware uh, that they're going to go through a lot. And I'd imagine this edition of the Tour, Tour of Britain um, collectively, we're going to have seen the most bidons ever gone through. Quite often, races give us the stats on how many bidons were used, but they're going to be going through a lot today. And you're quite right, um, throwing them away, um, single use a lot of these. Okay, although you can wash them, you might think it's quite wasteful. 
Um, but most are given back to the team car or, as you can see, thrown up to the ground at the feet of spectators, fans of the sport or dropped in green zones where they collected afterwards. But in these sorts of conditions, the last thing you want to do is um, is drink a mouthful of water that's sort of 30 degrees. <laughs> Just, you know, it's horrible, isn't it? You put it, it's... So if you've got a fresh one, that's why they're being deposited. Uh, and just as well as uh, the function of keeping you hydrated, and they also assist briefly before the body cools them down in, 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 in decreasing that core body temperature as well. Um, but, um, yeah, and the body incredibly spends more calories, you know, in the hot conditions than in the cold. Um, when we were doing some work for GCN back in the day, we were making a video looking at the science of... Um, of keeping warm or keeping cool. I've, I always thought, Brian, that keeping the body warm when it's cold, the body would spend more calories, but it actually spends more calories cooling the body down when it's hot, which is something that is exceptionally counterintuitive, isn't it? Or they don't feel hungry. You are your body um, is really fighting hard to cool the body down, and, and quite us, uh, and that's why you need to keep yourself hydrated and fueled. Well, it's, it's very hard to eat when it's hot like this, though, Brian, isn't it? Look, I've, I've known about this for many, many years because I always used to suffer more in the heat than anywhere else. So I, I've known about this and I contacted the uh, the marketing department at CORE um, to get one of the CORE monitors um, and, and put it on and, and, and see for myself. And I'm still learning. But just some of the information they were talking about that, have, it's just it just fits onto the strap of your heart rate monitor. Um, and it gives you some some information on you know how your body reacts and things like that to the heat the core temperature and things like that your body and trying to keep that cool and some of the stuff i learned that i don't know if you've noticed and a lot of the kind of hot races that a lot of the the riders are dousing themselves a lot wet clothing and um, when you sweat that's that's your body trying to kind of cool you down so putting the sweat on uh, putting uh, water onto your onto your body or clothes and things like that, it's, it's helping cool your body down. Because I always used to think that having having sweat wicked away from your your um, cycling clothing um, to get it away from nearer your skin, and it's quite the opposite. If your skin's wet um, and you're going, going through the wind and things like that, that kind of helps keep your, your body temperature a little bit cooler. Yeah, massively important. And so there's so much more understanding around that sort of thing with the various devices including the one that including the core one you're talking about and, and this has given us a, a completely new and it's relatively i mean these devices have only actually been around for a, a couple a couple of years as we pass through crackstone or craxton uh, but no massively important giving us a new layer of understanding um the amount of metrics now that are available to understand performance um in various sorts of conditions um is is helping us adapt to those fuel recover um the effort effort management as well it's just yeah there's so many things to draw down to almost a bemusing amount of information but that's where uh, the coaches come down the nutritionist coaches will come and look at that and uh, and tweak any training accordingly or effort management during hot conditions cold conditions as well is something that's taken into consideration as we just look back to earlier today at uh, the foot of winchcombe hill and the unfortunate upending of the man from Jumbo Visma, Jos van Emden. Thankfully, he was OK. Jumbo Visma, uh, Mobistar's Carlos Verona also got involved. But by the looks of things, Brian, he looks absolutely fine. Uh, just uh, riding on the front here, Van Emden. Looking good. Gap's gone back out now to three minutes and eight seconds. And he's doing a very good job just behind him. The figure of Eduardo Affini. Uh, good average speed as well, considering the elevation on board today. Not much wind um, to uh, to keep the speed down. Still a uh, pretty fast average pace. It's around uh, 43 k's an hour approximately. Not quite at half distance just yet, but we'll uh, soon be there. No more King Mountains or sprints until deep into the stage. In fact, the first intermediate sprint of the day. Now that doesn't come to a 31 k's to go and the final categorized climb of the day comes at 24.9 k's to go but that categorized climb doesn't tell the picture fully in relation to 
the obstacles the riders have to overcome before they plummet down into Gloucester today. And there's another significant climb that comes at about 162 k's in, which is only eight or nine kilometers to go. And there's another short kick up before we finally drop down to Gloucester for the finish. But uh, 3.05, this group here, Brian, doing a cracking job at maintaining their lead. They are. Um, it's as you were, just holding around kind of three minutes, just doing your turn at the front, all about recovery for Richardson now as he just gets to the back. He's going to swap to right. He was following Ben Turner. Um, he's now following Stockman, both very kind of strong, um, big riders, so he's picking the right wheels. Just having a little bit of fun in this uh, small descent here. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're riding very well and they have to. They have to just keep it at a, a tempo that they're all comfortable with. If you feel a little bit better, then you do a little bit longer instead of a little bit faster. Exactly. And uh, riders will be, I think at the moment what we're seeing is a relatively even distribution, but it's still relatively early days in terms of uh, the stage. It's still 91 k's to go. Still the best part of uh, a couple of, two and a half hours of racing approximately. Still in front of the riders today. I think they're now heading through the town of uh, Evening, which is uh, a village uh, just located in a little wooden valley, a wooded valley, should I say. No, I think that's a, a little bit later, Mark. I think, oh, right. yeah, we've, done eight, we've done eight bang on 80 k's now. But uh, I thought I saw the sign of Evening. Could be wrong. It did flash by very quickly. Yeah, for me, Evening's after kind of six o'clock. Oh. Ah, very good, mate. Sorry. Very good. Everything spelt with an A, this one. But uh, yeah, it's uh, dated back uh, to the Saxon period. That looked like that was a uh, Cornish flag on the right-hand side of the road. A Kerno flag. Fans of St. Pyrrhon out in force today. And it is Alexander Richardson on the front. The gap just drops again. Under, under three minutes. And a lot of local riders out today from the various local bike clubs. But uh, yeah, this uh, the village grew up and around the church. Most of its character today comes from the 17th century. Uh, the town was uh, the small industry around the town centered around the making of cloth. So, Jos van Imden, despite that little crash earlier on, absolutely fine, completely unscathed, and uh, certainly looking good. And um, do you think that the team car, the um, Van Dongen and Wijnands in the team car for Jumbo Visma, I think they'll be reasonably happy with this. They, they knew they were going to come under attack today on, on the early opening sections, but now things have settled down. Five riders in front. They are managing to keep this gap at a reasonable sort of distance. Do you think so far they're going to be happy with the situation on the road, Brian? If they'd have talked about it last night, I'm not saying this is the perfect scenario, but this is a scenario they, they would have taken. Um, they would have been a bit worried if there was maybe five riders that went in that climb because if the five riders went in that climb I would say that this break would be significantly faster and stronger uh, taking nothing away against the riders that kind of joined the two leaders at the time, Turner and Donovan but I also think that you know, if there was eight or ten riders in front that would have been very difficult but then again, I think at that stage, Walt Van Aert would have just went with it himself. Um, so they all they all already had things kind of covered. Um, they would have taken this all day long. Um, I always think when when you look at when you look at this race now, you get five riders. If you're joining us, just you get five riders in the breakaway, and then Jumbo Visma. But it doesn't tell you the story earlier on. You know, I, I rode a race where. I think it was a Tour de or to to the EC. Oh, and it was in the, the Ardennes in Belgium, and it kicked off big style. You know, there was riders everywhere, and I was just kind of hanging on, and, you know, they were the big teams there, because that was when Laurent Fignon and System U were, were riding and against the, the Russians and the East Germans, and they were knocking ten bells out of each other. And I was just kind of hanging in there. I think Joey McLaughlin was there, and he, we just kind of looked at each other. This was just so difficult, so hard. And then all of a sudden, halfway through the stage, my, my, there was a truce. Everybody sat up. There was a group with a lot of my teammates in it when I was riding for Great Britain. 
Uh, I think Mark Walsh and Keith Reynolds and that one, they're about over 10 minutes down. Do you know that the truce lasted that long that they get back on? And Mark Walsh finished the top 10 in the stage. <laughs> so it, when you, you get all that racing right from the start, um, you think it's the, the race is everywhere, there's riders everywhere. And all of a sudden, the break goes away, it sits up and everybody comes back together. And it was a case where Tyler Farrar in the, in the Tour de France, the first climb, I think it was a quad de fer or something like that, he went out the back straight away, but he never gave up. Because what happens in races is, as soon as the race settles down, even if you're a few minutes down, you can still come back to the peloton. Yep, you certainly can. And it's, uh, and it's the knowledge that that will happen. Um, we saw several riders get dropped on the opening climb of the day up at Pinchcombe Hill, including Olaf Coy. Say he's only about 20 or 30 seconds out the back, but they just rode over the top, waited up. Um, I don't think there's anybody out at the back at the moment that I'm aware of. Well, we saw uh, Sam Bennett, didn't we? Really struggling yeah, at the back. Yeah, yeah. So you just have to grit your teeth a little bit and come back to the peloton. Although there have been occasions where they just keep pressing on as well. There are days, of course, many days, uh, where there's, they, just keep, they just keep going and then it's, you just wave goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on some occasions, as you say, it can be quite strange. Um, it can be incredibly frustrating if you are there or thereabouts making the front split every time and then ultimately comes back together. It used to happen a lot in the milk race. Really aggressive riding on the climbs. You'd be in the front group on every single occasion and then you'd end up with a 50-man group come to the finish and you'd, and you'd get beaten by riders you'd regularly drop. But that was, again, as a, young, as a young youngster. And then you think, well, why did I make so much effort getting in the front group every time? And the day you miss the front group is the yeah. way the front group stays, stays clear. <laughs> so there you go. T so typical. The case. <laughs> that's the way racing goes sometimes. Um, but, uh, and that's one of the most fascinating things about racing. We can never fully predict. We might have an idea. Increasingly, we're, uh, with some of the races that we're seeing these days, all our pre determined ideas of how races unfurl and take shape has uh, massively changed but today potentially a little bit more predictable we've got a good breakout in front it's a race it's a, a break should i say of real potential ben turner is there for the Innes grenadiers he sits at 18 seconds we're just looking at alexander richardson of st Piran in the black jersey looks like he was actually taking a feed from the Ineos grenadiers i think he's uh, asked to put water in his own bottle there we go. So I think they're just trying to fill up. Yeah, just giving it give back. Give back his it. own bottle. Yeah, nice little bit of teamwork there. There we go. So it's quite hard to get that bottle out Roger Hammond's hand there, wasn't it? Or is it Roger? I'm not. Is it, I think uh, Ollie Cookson's on the other side. Ollie's I'm not too there. sure who that is. Yeah, I think Ian Stanhope's there as well. But uh, yeah, back on the back. Just slotted into the wall. The other uh, riders in the breakaway, Liam Johnson of the Trinity Racing Team, sat there in position number three. The man in the silver of Q36.5, Mark Donovan. He's highly placed on the general classification as well. Well, I say highly placed. He's only three seconds behind our race leader. And uh, as a gentle reminder, uh, there are no time bonuses in the Tour of Britain this year at all. Normally we see 10, 6 and 4 on the finish line for the winner, second place and third place. And then there's some smaller bonuses out on the road, but are not on this particular occasion. So we'll see if that's reviewed after this edition of the race next year. Um, but for this edition, no time bonuses at all. So it's uh, forcing riders to think a little bit differently. And it certainly forced Jumbo Visma to think differently the other way, the other day. Um, I still look back on that on that Wout Bernard win. It's just absolutely brilliant. It was an it was it was a masterpiece, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. It really, really was. Yeah, you can watch that. Again and again and again, it's you know to put that plan in place the night before and to to do it to perfection. You know, it wasn't even close. It was they did it to perfection. Um, it's just something to behold. But also the fact every village we go through incredible crowds here. I think every village that we go through here, I think have got the best crowds we've seen so far in this year's Tour of Britain. Yep, super super crowds. Just been through Tetbury uh, Upton. And not too far from the Chavanagh estate. That's the Lowsley Williams family. Um, so that's the estate. That's the Lowsley Williams family. James Lowsley Williams, you know, is a presenter uh, on Global Cycling Network. So we just passed his family estate. 
Um, they've owned the, the estate since 1891. So, and the Stevens family before them, not my family, I'm, I might add. Um, uh, we're not wealthy landowners. But uh, yeah, James Lowesley uh, Williams uh, lives nearby. Very likeable fellow indeed. A very good bike racer as well back in the day. Actually, it's, uh, yeah, and uh, I didn't realise that. I just, I knew that off the top of my head. And my notes are saying, yes, he had previously over the Whip Sungod team and is now a presenter at GCN. So uh, there we go. So 2.52, 83 k's to go. Just a little bit over 50 miles still to go for the field here today. Eduardo Afini. Another long pull on the front here. Jumbo Visma only using two riders at the moment. In previous days, we've seen Stephen Kreisweig swapping turns with Joffs van Emden. Today, it's Affini and van Emden. And Nathan van Hoydonk and Stephen Kreisweig will be left until the latter stages of today's stage, one would imagine. As we just see uh, our race leader just moving up the outside and slotting in the last man in the line out. Then we've got Ineos Grenadiers just behind them. Bora Hansgrohe and then Mobistar, the four World Tour teams in this race. Well, there's five, in, in fact, Team DSM are also there as well. Good to see Paddy Bevin on the offensive earlier on, Brian. He's had a really problematic season to do with injuries. Uh, good to see him on the offensive. Couldn't quite make that early break. Yeah, but it does tell you a lot about his character and his spirit that um, when the opportunity ar arose, he tried to get up the road. And uh, it's just little moments like that on your road to recovery that are enormously, enormously important. He can get a lot from that just in terms of what he can and he can't do right now. We've not seen him for six days and yeah. just possibly waiting for this, this territory. But I think in his head, he knew what he was trying to do, get himself in that kind of breakaway. But he's just not physically there yet. But, you know, you could have just sat in the peloton and, and just rode round. But the fact that he's trying, he's such a classy bike rider. And I think he will get back to his best. I hope he does. Um, but I don't think it'll be here at the Tour of Britain. No. I'm sure he'll be back in form soon. As we see, yeah, the St. Perrin car is back up again. It might have actually gone back to the... Uh, not too sure why. Well, it's, with the gap being what it is, it's relatively easy for the uh, the cars to knit back and two. It's only a gap of three minutes. As we pass through uh, Beaverton. Another one of these beautiful little villages. Only a small, almost a hamlet, in fact, rather than a village. Just uh, several buildings. You can just see that's a pretty old one on the right-hand side. Yeah, and that is it. There's got two team cars in the race, um, St. Perrin and... You know, just like the riders, the, the car may stop just for a natural natural yeah. break. Uh, that happens from time to time. You just let the other team car know. You just go up alongside and say, we're stopping for a natural. We look after my rider. Um, because the, the main team car will have all the bikes on top. So they'll have a, a spare bike for everyone. The car here in front, um, no spare bikes on it. Just, uh, you know, spare wheels. Indeed. Passing through, but you'll notice, uh, and will have noticed, the vast majority of the stage, a lot of dry stone walls. Now, um, there's been some sort of calculation made. There's more dry stone walls in the Cotswolds uh, in total length, uh, all added together, uh, longer than the Great Wall of China. So there you go. That's a lot of dry stone walls in the Cotswolds. Dry stone walls, of course, very common throughout England and Scotland. One of the most famous, famous dry stone walls. Uh, Hadrian's Wall, of course, separating England from Scotland back in the day. Built by a Roman emperor. I think they got that far up north that they thought, these Scots are mad. Just going to build a wall and just keep them out. <laughs> I think that's basically what it was, Brian, at the time. Yeah. Um, Bodicea, wasn't it? Or Boudicca, depending on how you pronounce it. It was to keep, uh, keep them away from what they perceived as the savages back then, wasn't it? I used the yeah. word, obviously, loosely. But... Um, but uh, yeah, dry stone walls, a real uh, important part of, uh, of the heritage of this country. And uh, again, in the absence of bushes and trees, they were built uh, to separate the various fields. Uh, but are uh, very simple, they're not, they're just stones placed on top of each other, nothing else at all. Uh, many have been, one of the ancient ones are actually preserved as well and are rebuilt. To 251, so no need. Well, the riders in front are just trying to keep that. Took the dry stone walls. They needed to try and keep that lead building because this man on the front, in tandem with Jos van Emden, are doing a very good job of keeping a lid on this one. 
two minutes and 50 seconds. With 80 kilometers to go. And still 50 kilometers or so till we get, with about 45 kilometers to go until we get into the final phase of the race where things get very hilly. Shorter, steeper climbs, not a lot of recovery in between. At the moment, we've just got these gently rolling hills, but uh, the finale looks a little bit more different. And I think that's when they will come under attack. There might even be riders that are willing to try and attack from behind, and that weirdly might help Jumbo Visma in terms of roading the lead of the of the, uh, the, the breakout in front. Uh, but there are a couple of teams that don't need to do that now. Ineos Grenadiers don't need to fire anybody, any, anybody up. Of course, Q36.5, but Uno X, I think, might be interested. Movistar as well. So, Brian, we talked about Movistar briefly earlier on, about their options today um, and maybe contributing into the pacemaking. Do you think they'd prefer to assist Jumbo Visma or attack them instead? Oh. 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 Panic, panic. That's what happens when you, you want a certain model. <laughs> it's always very difficult. Um, that's why in a lot of teams, it's water. Yeah. Uh, that's the easiest water. He'd obviously made a, a sign, an X or whatever it is, and um, you know, staff member just kind of panicking a little bit. So instead of the riders dropping bottles, the staff member dropped two bottles in order to give that specific bottle out. Um, I think they'll wait and, and attack them. They have to. I don't think they'll wait them. I think they have to attack them. Yep. Especially with the sort of terrain that we've got in the final. And several small climbs leading into the last categorised climb of the day of Crowley Hill. Crawley Hill, should I say. Bit of a plateau over the top of that one, then a long descent down, and then a small climb before the last significant ramp of the day, which is uh, which lasts the best part of a kilometre and a half. And then they drop down, one more short kicker, and then we head in towards the finish. Will the brakes survive? Will we get another bunch sprint? Will it be a reduced group? Will it be a solo rider? Uh, it's certainly more difficult to predict this one today, Brian, isn't it? Um, what we've seen so far, far easier given the terrain and given the strength of Yombo Bismuth to predict. But this one, it's definitely not a done deal, is it? Certainly not a done deal for the breakaway. There's certainly opportunities for riders behind. And there will be teams, given we've only got one more stage to come with particularly tough terrain at the back end in Kefili. And there you go, see Luke Rowe just having a word with the motorbike. It is pretty close at the moment, isn't it? It is, and the riders will use it all day long. Um, but these guys are experienced, these are media motors. Um, oh, they've been good. at the Tour of, yeah. Tour of Britain, Jason Jenkins. They, they do a really, really good job. So, but from time to time, you can't stop the riders. Um, it's not like many other races. Um, they, they'll know what the scenario is. Um, but yeah, I think really do think that this will be a very much reduced group coming to the finish. I think Walt Van Aert will be there in the, in the front group. That's that's a problem. I think it's going to be very difficult yeah. to drop him. Yeah. Um, but let's see. Um, I think the likes of Kina Serrano and these guys from Movistar will be, will be interested. Milberger as well, if he's still got the form that he's had recently. So it'll be a very much reduced group. Um, I think Van Hoydonk may be there with Walt Van Aert. It's going to be a big help because... You know, as we all know, if you get the old kind of one-two with um, Serrano and Milberg, it's it's difficult to go with everything. Um, but I'm sure that any Grenadiers will be interested in trying to animate things as well. So, so let's see. We're I, we're definitely going to have a, an entertaining final, 25 kilometres. And as we see, we talked about this other day about um, bags, and sometimes they're just not kind of strong enough and. You know, the uh, the uh, bag's kind of, or one of the handles just kind of coming away from the, the bag there. And luckily, he, he still had half the musette still in the bag. Indeed. It was uh, Olaf Coit just taking a musette. Just looking at the uh, the profile, the run into the line today, uh, the last few Ks. Uh, me and you are both familiar with the Gloucester, but there's, it's a big place. Gloucester, uh, there's various ways you can go in. We approach it from the south and head due north right into the center of the town uh, not a lot of turns save for one there's a little chicane with about 600 meters to go uh, and there are several roundabouts and junctions and stuff to negotiate but essentially from kilometer four to three it's relatively straight 
three to two, gently meandering right, and it straightens out. Kilometre two to one, straight and gently left. But then with about 600 metres to go, there's a left and then a right. Um, it isn't what we call a chicane. And then straight, and then they won't actually pick up the finish line until about 250, 300 metres to go in terms of getting it in their line of sight. But it's, it's relatively flat. That was quite a nasty kick to the line yesterday. Um, certainly not steep, but around 2 or 3%. But um, between kilometres 4, 3 and 2, it's ever so slightly downhill, so it's pretty fast. And then the final kilometre and a half, relatively flat. As we look again at Olaf Koy. Uh, that one snapped. That could have been, well, could have been disastrous, actually. But thankfully, the integrity of one side of the uh, of the cotton bag um, remained intact. So, yeah, a lot of riders, as, you, as we were talking about before, do grab the corner of the bag or they'll double up the knots. But um, um, that could have been dodgy. You saw one of the gels flying out. So there's a rogue gel in the middle of the road now. But uh, thankfully, um, no issues at all there. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's that take that you have and, and you keep your arm to the side because the last thing you want, and I've seen this happen, Matt, someone grabs the bag and because of the weight of it, it's pulled into the, the front wheel. Yeah. And, you know, disaster. If you get a bag in your front wheel, you're over. Uh, as simple as that. But I think what we saw from Luke Rowe there is, is quite relevant. And, you know, over many, many years of TV coverage, and it's getting more and more now, especially line to line, because what normally used to happen, and even Tour de France stages, way back in the uh, kind of 1780s, we'd cover the last kind of 80 kilometres and then the TV bikes would appear and the helicopter and things like that. It didn't used to be all day long, but quite often, and I've seen it myself, um, I've seen a, a rider attack um, into the slipstream of, a, of one of the TV motorbikes and that kind of drags you away and that made the difference uh, in a stage win at the Tour de France. But I know that I've talked a lot of this uh, around kind of Mark Cavendish and even in Treno where the TV bikes were at the front of the peloton. He was getting distance, and the, the commissars wanted to barrage him. You know, while he's, you know, with am in the team car behind and saying, "Look, we'll take the, the motorbikes away from the front of the race because, you know, they're dragging riders along." The TV bikes well, are there for a reason. We want to get the, the best pictures, but they do influence a lot of the outcomes of of the races. And we've seen it. We've seen it over the last few days. That, uh, and I'm not blaming the TV bikes because they are there to get the best it, shots, yeah. but. If you're getting any slipstream from the front, even sitting out here, if the riders move over and get behind you, the speed of the peloton over the first kind of five, six days was quite exceptional. And, and we, we mentioned that, and that discourages any attacks that we get in races. You know, you know, if the race eases up, we get attacks. If it's full on in one line, it discourages a lot of attacks. So it's a, it's a difficult one, and finding a solution for this um, is very very difficult because some people are will discuss it some people will talk to you know organizations about it and some races it, it does and i'll say this now motorbikes in races change the outcome of some races i'm not saying all of them but they do it and we saw the situation in the uh, the tour de france this year with Pogaccia trying to go on the attack before that bonus sprint and things like that so you know what are the solutions um, I know that if it's a big bonus, they should have had barriers up a, a lot earlier than than they than they did. But but how do we get the the, the TV pictures and how do we stop the, the the riders riding behind bikes and, and especially when you've got big races, but not just the not just the, the TV bikes, but also the photographer bikes, and you've got cars in front. Everything you do get in, you do get a lot of benefit from um, disruptive air in, in front of you or getting slipstream around. It doesn't matter if it's 20, 30 metres away. So until we find a solution to get good TV um, cameras, here is from behind, so there's not a problem, not a problem. OK, so maybe people think that sitting behind riders kind of pushes them along, you get that kind of bell wave thing. It's got, yeah, but, it's got to be a balance though, isn't it? Blimey, yeah, yeah. yeah. We have to we have to look at a solution in, in bike racing because it does have a big bearing and an influence in, in something and, and, and this is why riders shout 
and you know wave at, at riders. We've not seen a lot in this race, but in a lot of other races I've seen, you know, in, in my commentary, that they're, they're just too close a lot of the time, and you know it helps, right? Even if it's just a a few seconds behind, it just that little bit of help. Oh yeah, definitely. I did some uh, tests a few years ago myself and Dan Lloyd. Again, another GCN video where we tested. Um, what it was like to ride at a certain speed and how much power you had to put out to ride at a certain speed. I think it was 45, 50 k's an hour or something. We sat behind a motorbike and we're putting it out, not even 300 watts. And then um, then we dropped behind um, 5 meters, 10 meters, 20. I mean, even at 30 meters, we were getting an advantage um, from the motorbike um, because you've got this dirty air. It's basically, there's a vortex essentially created by something that passes through the air. And the, the air that's moving is... Uh, easier to pass through some of that so, so aerodynamics but it is amazing how long how much of uh, how much aerodynamic advantage you get obviously it tapers off the further away you get from a vehicle whatever that vehicle is whether it's a motorbike whether it's a, a car obviously you get far more from a car and the cars are obviously kept at bay but it's an interesting one and it's ever evolving i think it's been pretty well monitored here sometimes the riders just give the motor the motorcyclist that's a gentle reminder as luke Rowe was doing there um, but I think we get an extraordinarily good quality pictures at this year's Tour of Britain, um, professionally given to us. But it's, a, it's always an important conversation to have, Brian, isn't it? Because it is a shame uh, when it can be perceived uh, or proven to, to uh, not so much proven, but um, you just know how much benefit you do get from behind. So uh, they're being careful with the pictures we're getting here. Um, and we are getting stunning pictures. Um, and also it's good to see the riders from, just from the, from the back and the way they rotate as well, getting these low shots. Just breaking things up and as we look at alexander alexander richardson just at the back of this group still holding steady at uh, just under three minutes so as well as a solid job being done by jumbo bismuth just using two of their resources the five out in front um i'm making them work here back up to three minutes again here 71 or 72 k's still to go but a good job being done but i tell you what's going to start to hurt is on this sort of terrain brian this group is ideal terrain for a group to stay together once it starts getting particularly hilly it's actually far harder then you start to see the differences between the riders and actually keeping these riders together over the final 35 40 k's of the race is going to be quite hard because the climbs are a lot steeper and the terrain very different than what we're riding on now uh, right now is great but 30 35 40 k's to go things start to get differently and the likes of let's pick out uh, mark donovan and ben turner might not necessarily be want to be slowed down by the runs that are with them that's in the assumption that johnson for example as uh, stockman uh, or richardson start to weaken there's no sign of that right now but it isn't an easy run into the line and there's uh, to quote mr sean kelly they're going to have to start to make some calculations depending on where their lead is uh, whether this group breaks up early and whether breaking the group up gives anybody feeling strong more of a chance of survival uh, than actually staying together as a unit. So that's something to factor in at the back end as well. Well, if I was Turner, um, I've done the right thing al already. I've waited for the, the three riders. Um, now they're helping me. Um, and then I'm going to help myself when it comes to the last categorised climb. It's as yep. simple as that. If they ho hold on to three minutes, which I don't think they will go on to that last categorised climb, because I think Jumbo Visma will want to kind of close that down, because they know when they hit that climb, both um, Turner and Donovan will, will go. Um, it's how much they've kind of saved a little bit. But it's not all all about Ben Turner today. He, he has been lent on a little bit by his team um, because they have got other options. So they ha they can go on the counter attack knowing that Ben Turner is there. So you have that 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 option to use. But I think Ben Turner and uh, Mark Donovan will push on that that climb and try and go, um, and then we'll. I think we may get some attacks from behind, including some of the the Innes Grenadiers, because they might want to try and kind of try and kind of go um, ahead and try and join uh, Turner in front and try and kind of isolate uh, Walt Van Aert. It's going to be a really interesting one, but for the moment, in my mind, I'm just using everybody else in this group, uh, thinking for myself, uh, trying to recover as much as possible hoping that they have a healthy advantage going on to this final climb while my Jumbo Visma head-on is bring it down to maybe about a minute before we hit that uh, uh, final climb but you'll have to use your, your own personnel so it's weighing up saving 
or kind of pushing out, trying to gain that time. And I think it's going to be a case of they might have to accept if you save a little bit, they might have to accept the gap is going to come down to that final climb. Ben goes and then see what happens behind if Moby start to light it up. Um, Ennis will get involved because what they have to do is they have to put um, you know, Wilt Van Aert on, on, really on the back foot. They want to get rid of as many Jumbo Visma as possible and try and exploit the fact that you know, Jumbo Visma have had six days of, or now seven days, hard riding. Yeah, definitely. Still just under three minutes. A solid lead for the group out in front. And given what you just said, given the, the fact that um, we think, uh, depending on how strong the break is, if, if Richardson, Stockman and, and Johnson are, are feeling good and they manage to stay with, with Turner and, and Donovan, then, uh, then fine. But um, given that we think the racing is going to probably kick off on the, the final categorised climb of the day, the top of that comes with just under 25 k's to go. Given the chaos that uh, we could see there, given the fact that there are other riders with interest that are going to want to try and put Jumbo Visma, in particular Wout Van Aert, on the back foot, how much of the gap do you think that Jumbo Visma need to bring down before then? So this is completely different than the other days we've seen. Two minutes and 15 hour with 68 k's to go on a flat stage, they're just gradually going to bring it back until it gets caught. Here, given we've got a particular key point in the race, do you think they'll want to bring it back to around about a minute by then? or? They, they, I don't think they're going to be happy with these riders having three minutes of 25 k's to go, Brian, are they? No, of course not. Um, ideally, they would want to bring them back as we hit the, that final climb. But if they bring it, if they if they bring it back to a bridgeable gap, maybe about minutes, maybe just less than a minute, it means that other teams may want to try, try and kind of join them in front. It will it will pull out some other teams like Movistar and and they will start to go on the attack and they know that that kind of momentum from some of the other teams will, will help them a little bit. They can kind of follow a, a little bit. OK, it's a little bit more easier to follow on, on these sort of roads than it is on a, on, a, on a climb towards the end. But this climb at the end is, is hard enough and then there's another climb straight after it. So I really do think that Jumbo Visma will want to bring it down to, I think, about a minute um, or less uh, if they can do that. Um, but definitely not two or three minutes because I think um, Turner and Donovan are a little bit too strong. Yeah, we've got about, I reckon, about an hour and 40 minutes of racing. Um, that final climb comes at 24.9 k's to go. So that gives us about 35, 40 k's in which it gives us under an hour to shut a gap of, of three minutes. So I'm, I'm wondering whether they'll start to use maybe in the next 10 k's somebody else. Um, or, or they'll just ask Van Emden and Afini just to lift it a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, will this, will the group behind react? We've said that it's the bunch that are forcing these riders to ride at the speed they are, uh, not the other way around. Uh, so it is a fascinating one. It really, really is. Uh, that really hard opening 20 or 30 Ks, multiple climbs, saw this group go clear. Several riders dropped, including the former race leader, Olaf Coy, Sam Bennett as well. They're all back in contact. But the final stages of this race are very hard and we are fast approaching that particular section 67 k's to go just gone through dunkirk just inside the south gloucestershire border in hawkesbury and they're now riding along the well they're not too far away from the cotswolds way which links chipping camden with bath 102 miles um, of walking um, of paths um, all the way from bath to hawkesbury just also passing through this pity France now, um, where one of uh, a manor owned by William Wordsworth's place uh, is, uh, is still is situated. Now, pity France and Dunkirk, the origins of those of those names is a little bit uncertain, but people think it's uh, possibly because of the Huguenots settling in the area after the Edict of Nantes was revoked by King Louis the Fourteenth. Sure this for you. So two unmistakably French names, Petit France and uh, Dunkirk. And we head back into the lanes off the main road, into these beautiful little country lanes. At the front of the race, great roads to be out in front at, picking your line as well. Not a lot of room to move up on these little country lanes here, but uh, these are really what characterise uh, the Cotswolds. Um, pretty remote as well sparsely populated neck of the woods as we are 
with Moto1 at the moment. And I've got a little bit of lunch that's just been delivered to set me up for what should be an exciting finale, Brian. Yeah, I'm trying to work out what's happening here. We kind of missed the breakaway, but we've got the front of the peloton still led by Jumbo Visma. I think we've been saying that for seven days. You see Sam Bennett just getting out the saddle. He kind of struggled early on, so it's going to be a very difficult final to to this stage. I don't think, you know, we can we can speculate. It is going to be a difficult final. It'll be interesting to see how the the other teams play. I know there's a lot of teams that might not have the, the firepower, but definitely. Movistar Uno X. Movistar have got a great opportunity here, and it's what these boys are going to do to control things for the moment. They'll control things for seven days, and it's not been easy. Many of these riders were kind of dropped earlier on, and it all came back together. I think um, Ennis Grenadiers are definitely, right from the start of today's stage, were really interested in getting the rider in the breakaway. They've managed to do that, but what do they do next? whether they use Ben Turner. I think this gap will come down to, to close to a minute before we hit this uh, final climb. And I think they do have to get involved with the, the racing as well, because, you know, they have got two really good riders up there as well, Rodriguez and uh, Sheffield up there in the general classification at, at three seconds. So let's hope it, it kind of opens up and I think it will. One of the things we can't rule out as well, just knowing we know uh, Wout Van Aert very well in terms of the style of the rider that he is. He's, um, he's a winner, he's a thoroughbred. He is one of the most talented and versatile riders on the planet. Um, and there's a lot of arguments or discussion and very valid, intriguing discussion about uh, some of the top riders in the world. Um, the Wout Van Aert, the Matthew Van Der Poel, um, Tadej Pogacar, um, etc. And I think it's fair that when you look at the spread of his ability, and this isn't taking it away from Matthew van der Poel, it's, I think the extraordinary ability of Wout van Aert in high mountains, I think does set him apart from a lot of riders. His ability, he can win mountain stages, time trials, bunch of sprints. We saw that in the extraordinary Tour de France last year. Um, but we can't rule out as well um, Wout van Aert trying something spectacular. Uh, and attacking himself. I, I, I think sometimes the best form of defence is attack. He's certainly not going to do it yet, but he is one of the riders, Brian. If he if he decides to take off on one of those climbs towards the finish, it could be very hard to bring back. And um, if, if he, and, and, all, and we saw that the other day. He's been used as a lead-out rider, took the stage the other day, but we haven't seen him properly on the attack because the, the terrain hasn't lent itself towards him. So I think he's going to want to take this race by the scruff of the neck. And I think he's going to want to go into the final stage with even, an even bigger buffer. So uh, at the moment, um, they're not on the back foot. They've got a little bit of work to do to bring this gap down. But don't rule out Wout Van Aert, I think. Maybe, uh, depending on how the racing goes, is attacking the riders rather than waiting for him to be attacked. Because I think he's simply that strong. Well, let's see, Matt. Um, he said the other day, the others have to drop him. Um, but like you say, he, he's, he's the type of rider that if he feels good and he sees that opportunity, then he'll try and do something about it. So let's see what they, they, they decide to do. Uh, for the moment, I think they'll, they'll want to, to follow. Um, Olaf Coy is at three seconds, but we know that you know he's not going to survive this final. And the next best place rider is uh, Nathan Van Hooydonk at 127. So it's all about one rider now. Uh, and that's Walt Van Aert, whether he decides to, to do it on his own, and it's not for the first time. If you remember that that stage up near Dunkirk, you know, you're talking about Pity France at the moment, and been through a, a town town called uh, Dunkirk just a moment ago. Remember the stage he went alone um, in that part of the world where Into he Calais. just Into Calais. yeah, it was just it was just up in the north of France and. He just went on the attack and this climb dropped everybody um, and went solo uh, with the yellow jersey and won the stage. And I think Phillips and sprinted for second, thinking they'd won. Um, 
So, in that sort of form, he can do anything, as you say. So, I think he'll, he'll bide his time and see what the situation is. But if he, if he thinks he can go alone, then that's what he'll do. Yep. I think anything's on the table, Brian, is what we're trying to say. Um, we've got the uh, luxury having flags line commentary of uh, discussing things pretty fully today. But I don't think it would have been right for us not to look at the, um, the possibility of Van Aert taking things into his own hands. But um, certainly not the case right now. Still a lot of riding still to go. A bunch there on a short little climb. And our breakaway over the top of that. A uh, big Nils Pollitt fan on the right-hand side with the German flag. Nils Pollitt, I think, will like this terrain again. Um, I think this final climb a little bit shorter. Well, the final two climbs a bit shorter than the opening brute of Winchcombe Hill. But I think Pollock will want to get in the mix as well. Uh, and also watch out for Ada Schelling, although Schelling has shipped a fair bit of time. Three minutes, 37. That might help in relation. Well, that's two things. He, I don't know whether he was caught behind a crash yesterday or hasn't finished in the bunch. But um, if he's got good legs, uh, that means that he's, he's not going to pose a threat on the GC. So watch out for Schelling. But Nils Pollock sits at only three seconds. Uh, and then Danny Van Poppel sits at three. But this might be a little bit hard for Van Poppel too. Although, saying that, Van Poppel is one of those pure fast men, Brian, that can get over the climbs reasonably well, isn't he, can't he? That's one thing that he does has, have, and, and he said it in his post-race interview. Ordinarily, when he goes to a race with Sam Bennett, or some, although Sam Bennett isn't quite on it at the moment, um, if Sam can't get over the climbs, they've got an option with Van Poppel because he is one of those heavier sprinters that can climb reasonably well. So uh, they have a couple of options there, but right now... It's all up to Jumbo Visma to do the hard work, to do the chasing. 60 k's to go now, just over. Still two minutes and 50 seconds. So the status quo has remained for the best part of 70 k's now. Uh, since this break went, went clear, uh, the lead has been roughly the same. Brilliant crowds here. This is that. Look, Look at, at the crowds here, Brian. This is it's absolutely sword, wonderful. Buddy. Yep. There's a bit of a market and uh, or something's going on in the left-hand side, bringing the crowd out. Stopped here loads of times. It's great. Lovely pubs, lovely tea rooms. As you can see, one of the particular characteristics of towns in the Cotswolds is how wide they are, giving plenty of space for, for promenading uh, back in the day. For people to walk up and down, uh, raised pavements as well, but to Chipping Sodbury, a, a really classical example of a, a high street in this part of the world and it's actually oh, one of the car. widest streets in England there we go yeah that's not great I just think that the race director car is just too far in front it's not for the first time that's happened now the police have come uh, come by we saw it happen a few days ago when a blue car came out there um, I know we talk about it keeping distance but we all know Mark through towns that you have to keep close. There's too, there's too many dangers. That the, the motorbikes have already been through here and, and stopped everything. But you know, if you're out and you come up at the the right time, there's so many entrances, you know, left and right yep. that anybody can come on. So sometimes in towns, the the car has to come come right back, and um, you know, to protect the riders a little bit better. Well, it's what we call. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a live road environment isn't it as, as we've talked about at length on the opening couple of stages um, the, the road is closed it's a rolling road closure so in front of the race and behind it uh, the road is basically locked down as it were so the race can pass safely through but there are a lot of junctions as you can as you can see especially in a particularly built up area where you're going through a significantly large town there are lots of there's just not the resource to block off every single junction and some cars despite the fact there's clearly something going on will make the ridiculous decision of driving into to the race. And that's something that is constantly monitored and managed. And as you say, the, the lead car um, has that job. Generally, you'll stay about two, 300 metres in front of the bunch, keeping them in sight in your, in your, in your rear view mirror and actually to stop vehicles getting in between uh, the front of the peloton uh, or the breakaway in this particular case and then the lead car in front. But on that occasion, unfortunately, it happened. But uh, that car did ultimately pull over to the side of the road. But it's, uh, yeah, it's an enormously important job, um, especially when you're operating a rolling road closure where you don't have the luxury of multiple marshals locking off every single town and village, which we see in the Tour de France, for example. It's always I, either you get every town to, like you say, get volunteers to do that. But when you go into a town like this with so many junctions, 
even to to shopping parades or, or various you know supermarkets and things like that there's too many junctions is a the, the the lead car direction car has to has to drop back has to be a lot closer to the front of the bunch just to make sure that nobody pops out so i think for the second time that's happened um but as, as i said, said you and i know that it's, it's important to do these things uh, and protect both the peloton because there'll be a car in front of the peloton a car in front of the the uh, the breakaway exactly there we go through chipping sobri and they've clearly made a day of it absolutely wonderful crowds here as well as the, there'll be a few maybe slightly bemused locals but a lot of the people have flocked there uh, to see the race pass through that was brilliant a couple of hundred meters long high street absolutely thronging with people today on this beautiful saturday afternoon yeah thought to be one of the wider streets in england built in part to accommodate the substantial market held in the middle ages as well as the promenading i was just discussing and there was a uh, human activity occupation of the Sodbury Parish uh, before the Norman Conquest and the Chipping Sodbury benefited from the growth of coaching in the Elizabethan age and its main street still boasts many inns and that's one of the reasons as well for the elevated curbs and the slightly oh, wider curbs so, oh, so that's that is unfortunate Bouncy. yeah he's on the radio so Alexander Richardson a uh, well a crucial component part of this breakaway and any chance of success so he needs a this is where the mechanic needs to be absolutely on it he's riding you can hear it banging on the road here so he's riding on a flat until the assistance comes up just hear that tapping can't you yeah um, he needs a good change here and uh, uh, hopefully um he's got his, he should have his team car there uh, should be a lot quicker to come up to him um where is his team car? They've been there or thereabouts. They should have the team car behind them going round this roundabout. It's not the easiest thing to do with a flat back and losing time here. This isn't helping. This is not helping the fact that he's had to to stop before the, the was, car even got there. Yeah, that did take, I mean, just that three or four seconds. Look how far it's stopped. It's this far off. Um, well, hopefully, if the camera bikes leave it alone, um, he'll get some help to come back because definitely lost it yesterday yes stockman got huge help from neutral service okay he's dutch in the neutral service cars the the dutch people that you know help out but you know hopefully he'll get back to this uh, group of um, four to become five again indeed well uh, it's the second punch in as many days other punches are of course a routine part of bike racing it's just unfortunate that it's happened when their key riders, Jack Rook and Gray, suffered one yesterday in the breakaway. It's happened while they're in the break here. So, uh, Ben Turner's on the radio there. They might be minded just for a minute or so, maybe just to knock it off ever so slightly as well, you know, because um, five, certainly better than four, and especially a rider with such strength, the strength of Alec John and Richardson, and they might just knock it off a little bit. That, of course, will mean that uh, the break will lose a little bit of time potentially on the bunch behind but uh, this situation here won't change at all the speed of the bunch as we go back to chipping Sobri and the chance thing just to soak up this absolutely fantastic atmosphere here the bunch enjoying the same thing as well brilliant brilliant scenes here on stage seven of the Tour of Britain absolutely wonderful stuff look at that I'd imagine that both uh, the town and the race organisers, this is something that's going to, well, it's just going to make you smile, isn't it? Massively important. And as well as the sight of the TLB coming through, you know, the local economies will also benefit as well here, Brian, don't they, for the amount of people that are coming through, even if it's just for a day, uh, showcasing uh, the towns, the villages, the cities, and also is of real tangible benefit to the local economy. Now, they are, I think here, Brian, they've actually knocked it off a little bit. I think also that I think they will be hoping he was he was calling his team car up as they do um, to get you know fresh bottles, but I don't think you're really going to want to too much. Um, I think they'll be hoping that he gets support from his team and gets on the back of the convoy. Um, if there's any consistency, he'll make his way back to the the front of the race again without any major mishap. So Ben Turner. Having a conversation um, with the DSs in the team, well, there. 
appears to be that it's uh, Ollie Cookson in the team car there. The gap still, that's the, the point that Alexander Richardson punched at and actually pulled over just on the side of the road there. As we look at Olaf Koy, four stage wins for the 21-year-old Dutchman. Now ensconced pretty safely in the green jersey. Leads that by a rather enormous margin, 25 points for the win on each stage. A few more points coming up up the road. I don't think he'll be overly concerned about those, although we have seen in the past his teammate Wout Van Aert just roll across the line and quietly trouser a few points towards the, the green jersey classification. Well, let's just count. He's got two on his bike, obviously, two in his pockets. He's got at least three. Is that four? That's four, five, six, seven, eight. Can he go for nine? Come on, Olaf. Let's get double digits. Nope. He's gone for a very modest eight, I think. Oh, I'm out of gel. I thought he going to get another bottle. If he does any more, his jersey might burst here, Brian. But it's uh, a pretty good load he's got on board there. Yeah, pockets aren't as big as they, they used to be, aren't they? Um, and these kind of speed suits that they've got. So fully load, loaded up. And he'll make his way to the front of the peloton and dish out the, uh, the nutrition. So, 2.48 is the gap. Eduardo Affini on the front here. 53 kilometres to go now. Shortly, we'll be heading into the final hour of racing here at the Tour of Britain on this uh, swelteringly hot day heading towards Gloucester. Another rider wanting some assistance at the back. That's David Persico, the stagiaire, riding for the Bingo WB team. He's had multiple top tens in this race so far. Very solid sprinter indeed. And I'm sure with the sorts of riding that he's been done, he will be offered a contract next year, one would imagine. Um, every single day he's beaten all of his teammates. Save for Alexander Solby. Unfortunately, he's out of the race. So the two stagiaires from that particular squad are impressing. The gap's not coming down now. Two, two, it is ever slightly two minutes and 45 seconds. And uh, Alexander Richardson has managed to get back in contact. So that's important for for the chance of this group. Um, they, they're going to need to stay together as long as they can for the reasons we've outlined and um, a massively important part. So they've knocked it off ever so slightly. That might be the reason why they've lost a little bit of time. But as soon as he's back in, there's picking at this important that they pick the rhythm up, isn't it? And try to keep this lead as much as they can, as deep into the race as possible, because um, they might start to lose resources behind us. We get a thumbs up from John Mould. So, good day so far for Trinity, with young Liam Johnson in the breakaway, and again, ooh, hope that didn't hit a car on the right-hand side, it was nearly uh, nearly 10 points for Johnson there. Well, it's the first time they've had a rider in the breakaway, isn't it? Um, we had the uh, Walker try earlier on today in the, in the first climb, but first time that uh, Trinity Racing have got a man in the breakaway of the day. Yeah, what, can, what can Johnson do? Not a rider, I know great deal about it's, um, rode the Arctic race of Norway and actually did a superb ride there and he's 11th overall the general classification oh, David Bomboy has abandoned yeah that is a big shame several top tens for the Belgian yeah, yeah that's a shame a couple of riders dropping out today that's the second rider on the road after uh, Koyama from the Global Six cycling team Speaking of Global Six, there they are, mass ranks just towards the back of the peloton as riders continue to relay back up after dropping back to the team cars to get uh, fluids for their team leaders. And we saw Olaf Koy doing that. He's back safely uh, in the wheels now. And still only two rods out in front. It's dropped down a little bit, but you can see now, I think, Brian, I think it's fair to say um, it's quite normal. That Eduardo Affini is going to start to start to feel it now. It just is, there's more of a grimace on his face now, isn't there? Of course they're going to feel it because there's, there's five strongest riders up at the the front here, all doing bit and bit, as they say, and you know they'll continue to do that on these kind of rolling roads, and you know they'll have to start to to use a little bit more firepower because, like we're saying, it's about what. 20 odd kilometers uh, to we start thinking about this categorized climb and I think they want to bring this back down so they've got 
a good minute and three quarters to bring back in the next um, you know 25 30 kilometers yeah that's what i was going to ask I must be thinking well i've answered it, you so. before you asked yeah it, exactly well there, there we go <laughs> mind reading mate mind reading now 241 discussed that very point around about an hour ago what sort of lead would jumbo visma like this to be um on the final climb of the day when things might start to get a little bit fruity shall we say up in front we might stay together i don't necessarily i don't necessarily think turner um or even donovan will attack the group here but they'll set a pace if people get dropped they get dropped i don't think they need to go on the offensive if they can all stay together as a collective or stay, get three together that's going to give them even more of a chance near the end but there's in the last once we get to that climb run there's going to be no waiting around um and right now it's very difficult to tell between them i think everybody's been riding really well um nobody it does seems depend to be missing on any terms yeah yeah exactly it does depend yeah. on the gap that they have if turner and donovan ride off into the sunset then fine but i'm not too sure that will happen purely because there's still a a lot of um i say fresh air legs in the uh jumbo visma team you know if need be walt van ark and do something he's on in the last kind of 20 kilometers um he'll be hoping that he doesn't um so it depends really on the gap that um this uh, group of five half was to come on to this kind of final climb um and let's see if they've got a decent enough gap then it could be a good day for q36.5 and um in his grenadiers because all they'll have to do is going to follow behind especially in his grenadiers but if the gap is brought right down then it's a good option for any Grenadiers to, to try and kind of spring, you know, another rider up the road to Sheffield or uh, Carlos Rodriguez. Yep. The old team with a lot of options, as uh, we've pointed out, for multiple reasons. Um, although Jumbo Visma won five stages, they've only got one rider in with a shout of general classification now, realistic shout, should I say. Nathan Van Hooydijk sits at 127, but uh, it is only well by art. Well, it's on his own time, of course, because he does lead, but it's nobody else. It's all about him for the general classification. And there are multiple riders still only three seconds behind our race leader as the gap drops ever so slightly now, two minutes and 40 seconds. So it's coming down now. I'm wondering if Jumbo Visma now have, have had the instruction or it's come from the team car. Look, guys, we need to start br trying to bring this gap down a little bit, even if it's just a minute and a half. Uh, but also at the same time, not using any other resource just trying to squeeze van emden and afin it said look we just if you can for the next 15k we need to lift this a little bit try and get it down once we get to 35 um 30k to go just before we hit the slopes of the climb and it could be that the natural momentum of any racing and any attacking immediately sh uh, shaves the best part of a minute and once we see attacking on climbs you've got a break regardless of how classy this break is that sharp attacking from behind that big increase in pace the momentum of racing will immediately see a big chunk of time lost on the group in front the motivation for you know finney and van emden is the fact that um, you know the day's done in the next 20 25 kilometers so that's what they have to 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 look at you know as soon as we had the bottom of the, the final climb that that their job will be done they have been using stephen croiswick pretty much all week and they're saving him back because he's probably a better climber than the other so horses for courses sort of thing but i still do think that they start they'll have to kind of use maybe all of coy as well um pretty soon and i think that's why he went back for bottles he came up and you might see the, the green jersey actually kind of help out as we get a little bit closer to the climb yeah although well, there's not much wind today um shortly we are going to be looping around you can see they've actually started to pick up the tailwind now it was a slight headwind um we had a tailwind start then they loop round to the east and then for the vast majority of the day we've been heading in a southerly direction we've now swung right again and we are approaching gloucester although it's still 46 k's to go uh, just over an hour of racing i reckon about an hour uh, between an hour and five and an hour and ten minutes of racing still to go and we're now heading in a northerly direction and the wind is coming from the south west so they've now picked up a slight tailwind and on these flatter sections here you get a real sense of how quick the peloton is moving now and that's going to favor the breakaway rather than the bunch as well so when you have a, uh, a group a breakaway riding into a headwind especially in the latter phases of a race 
it's a lot harder. But right now, the wind is helping them. Although uh, it's still relatively light, we could see it was enough to to lift that flag. I think uh, that's uh, somebody asking very politely if a Wout van Aert will give them a bead on. Yeah, hopefully the cameraman might hang around to see if that is the case. It's a big target to throw at, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, cameraman at the front um, of the peloton, that is, because obviously he can't just you know, set up at the, the front of the race and uh, watch that. But, yeah, look, this gap has to come down, and it has to come down in the next kind of 20 kilometres. So let's see how Jumbo Visma play this one uh, because they've got... Afini and Jos van Emden, the only two riding. Um, you can see Stephen Kreuzwick in third place, uh, Olive Coyne in fourth place. So for the moment, they're still kind of happy with the situation. But like we are saying, I, I wouldn't give these almost three minutes going on to this final climb. No. I was going to say, it might be, as they say, that the thing is there will be... There's two sides to this, and that's what makes it so interesting, isn't there? Is there that teams will want to make sure Jumbo Visma do as much as possible before other teams get involved. And when I say involved, not necessarily with the chase, uh, but with attacking. So they'll want to have made sure that you've used Jumbo Visma till the gap comes down enough so it's distinctly possible for a stage win or to try and get across the gap or at least to try and drop uh, drop Wout Van Aert. But that's the, that's the key thing. Regardless of what hap happens in front, well, no, not regardless, because the lead has gone up now. It's just under three minutes as they fan either side of that small traffic island. Um, riders need to drop Wout Van Aert, and we're just heading in. You can see just at the top of your picture there, that range of hills. Uh, that is where we start crisscrossing. So we've been on a slightly more gentler part of the course, this mid part of the course, although it wasn't without its difficulties. It's just gently undulating, but uh, from now on in, we do hit... Yes some slightly more severe climbs as uh, Stockman acts as a temporary teammate there for Alexander Richardson and gives his bottle back into the St. Perrin team car but yeah we're heading towards some close back up to three minutes now Brian 44 k's to go the average speed so far 44 k's an hour um, it might drop off slightly because of the amount of climbing we've got on the on the run into the line but we've got around about an hour of racing give or take the, the gap is now three minutes this is an interesting situation now. Certainly not desperate at all. I don't think there'll be panic stations. I think Jumbo Visma are pretty calm, but they do need to start bringing this time gap down now, don't they? I think so. I think they'll be, you know, a little bit more worried. Um, but like you were saying, they're only using two riders. Um, of course, they'll want to keep as many riders around about uh, Walt Van Aert as possible um, in the last uh, 20 kilometres. He might have to do a bit himself, but I really do think that they have to start kind of riding this gap down a little bit now um, because having three minutes coming into the last 25 kilometres is, is, is good for the breakaway. Yeah, it certainly is. Yeah, drop down 2.45. Still Jos van Emden on the front. Eduardo Affini on his wheel. Stephen Kreisweik there in third. But as Brian was just saying, Kreisweik today hasn't been used. But he's put in some enormous shifts over the last few days. And as we look at the man from Great Britain, Josh Giddings, just a... Uh, putting some bead-ons into his back pocket. Towering figure of the GB rider. Rides for the Lotto Sudal Quick Step. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, the Lotto <laughs> Destiny. <laughs> Lotto Destiny development team. Um, I'm still forgetting the names wrong. It's nearly the end of the season, Brian. Blimey. It's, it's been a long week, but it uh, rides for the Lotto Destiny development team. Very capable young rider. And they're making sure that uh, their team leader, uh, Ethan Byrne and Stephen Williams, are making sure that they're fed and watered. And I wonder how Ethan Vernon will perform on these climbs. He's not, he's, he is one of those, I wouldn't call him a pure, pure sprinter, but he, he sprints like a pure sprint. He can beat some of the best in the world. But what he can also do as well, Vernon, he can climb reasonably well, can't he? So don't rule out Ethan Vernon. I think he'll be gritting his teeth. I'd favour over him, Stephen Williams, in terms of making a front group. But don't rule out Ethan Vernon today either. But I would imagine that uh, Stevie Williams will be eyeing this race finale interestingly. And there's the climbs that we've got to go up in the coming miles this uh, little range of hills and this will really punctuate characterize the final running that took Gloucester today 42.2 k's to go and still the lead is at or around three minutes so solid riding by our five breakaway leaders here Brian it is good um, and I think the decision they made uh, right from the start um, and the way they kind of played this breakaway out and they came together 
is, is really going to help them um, because the Donovan and Turner, are, I think, would have had a, a harder job in their hands. But they've got the help of the other three, Johnston, Stockman and uh, Richardson. Um, but still, two riders for uh, Jumbo Visma. Uh, and I think they'll day will be done quite quickly as soon as we hit this um, this second category climb because the two riders that are riding on the front, uh, Afeni and Yus van Emden, I think they'll be gone. Um, I know that they can still, in the last 20 odd kilometres, they're still with Stephen Kreuzwick and riding on the front with uh, Nathan van Hoydong there, they they'll can bring back a good chunk of time, but I wouldn't want to give this breakaway a five, especially with Ben Turner and, uh, of course, Mark Donovan. I wouldn't give them three minutes hitting this final climb, Matt. Um, I think that would be kind of touch and go, but only they'll know they've got the resources, uh, whether they're going to start using them a little bit more. Olaf Coy is another one. He's sitting in the green jersey. It's, it's really how they're going to race this. Yep. Yeah, of course. Van Poppel and Vernon will be hoping that they can come back. If they do get gapped, they can come back before the finish. But I really do think that there's a few teams that have sat back. They haven't got involved with the racing uh, in the early parts. And they'll want to kind of race the final part of today's stage. I've mentioned Stephen Williams. There's a few others in here. Serrano as well, Melberger. I think they'll all um, start to get involved in, in the final 20 kilometres. Well, here we go, we're entering Wooten Under Edge, another famous market town, home to the famously haunted ancient Ram Inn pub, said to be the most haunted house in Europe. I don't know how you uh, sort of measure how haunted something is, perhaps the uh, sheer amount of paranormal activity, poltergeist activity potentially, uh, and many visitors feeling that they've been watched from the shadows. And the building dates back to 1145, not this morning, 1145 the year. So uh, there we go. But now, ah, well, okay, this is what I didn't quite expect. Mobistar getting involved now, Brian. We said, would they get involved? I didn't think it would be as early as this, but um, a welcome relief, I think, for Jumbo Visma here, because uh, the race wasn't getting away with them, away from them, but they've got a press, fresh pair of legs, and it looks like it's the figure of Carlos Verona that will eat this sort of terrain for breakfast. And I think with added fresh legs and the increase in pace, this lead should start to come now. Now, it's interesting that Movistar are getting involved. We're still an hour of racing still to go, just under an hour. I reckon just under an hour of racing. Well, it isn't for the first time. Um, you know, they sat back for many days and then put one rider up, Rodriguez, to, to help out the chase um, for their sprinter and the sprinter number one. Um, now I know they've got plenty of options. Never really seen them too much getting involved earlier on today, thinking about the final of this race, but I maybe would have waited a little bit until Jumbo Visma had started using one more rider. Uh, they're using two at the moment, um, and they weren't. They definitely weren't thinking about using anybody else, um, and it was a bit of a risk. Um, you know, they could have ridden it down in the last kind of 20 odd kilometres, but it would have been hard. So. For Movi start to come up, they're definitely up for the party at the end, but I'd have probably sat back and allowed uh, Jumbo Visma to, to ride a little bit more. Yeah. They're clearly hedging a little bit here, aren't they? Um, this is more, I mean, they're certainly not bringing it back for a bunch sprint, I wouldn't have thought. This is um, more to bring that gap down and put uh, Serrano into play, and maybe Gregor Mulberger as well. Both. Well, they've got four riders still very close on the general classification. Serrano. And Gaviria is out of the race, unfortunately. Verona's on the front, and then we've got Cantor, Mulberg, and Rodriguez. But it would be, imagine, Rodriguez has already done a lot of work, but I think uh, uh, Mulberg and Serrano will be there. Protected riders, and for obvious reasons, Gonzalo Serrano, the winner of the shortened edition of the Tour of Britain last year. And uh, 2.56. So that gap's right. It hasn't changed at all. But it, I think, as we were talking about before, they, 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 I think... Yeah, I think Van Emden might be at the end of his tether here. And he swung out of the line. It also looks as if Eduardo Affini is starting to struggle a little bit. Remember, this is a preliminary climb. This is just a little bit of a kicker. And there's a series of these before we head into the final categorised climb of the day. And then it isn't over yet. It's a very hard run into the line. Ben it. Yep. A few riders starting to hurt now. And this is what you, you kind of really want to do. You, you wanted to kind of force the hand of Jumbo Visma here, but 
It's uh, Movistar that have come up, and Verona's kind of lifted it. They, they, I think the tactic here for them is to make it a little bit hard and to just bring the gap down and, and make it a little bit hard. But look at Afini, Afini here in oh, second yeah. place. He's kind of hanging at the moment. He knows he's got a big job to do. Um, the last thing that uh, Jumbo Visma want to do is use any more personnel, but, yeah, this is hurting a few riders. Yeah, it's hurting the time gap as well, Brian. Um, that long drag, this man has made a lot of difference. The 30-year-old Spaniard, Carlos Verona, has shaved the best part of 20 seconds off the gap on one climb, and that's the difference fresh legs can make. The man who hasn't got fresh legs there, clearly labouring over the top of this climb. If he latches back on, he should be fine, is Sam Bennett, clearly suffering under the pace being set by Movistar at the moment. Another couple of riders also starting to suffer. That looks like that was Noah Hobbs just off the back. And straight out of the corner again, Movistar's Carlos Rona back on the power and the gap continues to come down. So real effective difference has been made here. And I do feel a bit sorry for the man just in the world. Eduardo Afini is going through all sorts of turmoil here, Brian. Yeah, yes, but he's got a job to do, and you know that job will be finished um, in a matter of maybe about kind of 15 kilometres. And with um, Yus van Ebden already gone, but um, it's a strong turn here by uh, Verona, um, and he still looks as if he's got plenty left. Like I said a moment ago, I'd probably have left it and put heap of pressure on Jumbo. But they have been so dominant, but then again. You know, they've won so many stages, they've got so much out of it, and you have to question, you know, what other teams want from this race, and it looks as if Movistar want something from it. They want potentially a stage win, they want that kind of leader's jersey, and, you know, they've been kind of lulled into it here. Uh, we did say, you know, right from the start that, you know, they've got the riders capable, they've got the defending champion, so let's see uh, what happens, but very quickly... You know, this gap has come down. It's hovering on about kind of three minutes and it's coming down very, very quickly now. You have to say that Yus van Emden, little crash earlier on today. He'll roll into the finish. He'll be used again tomorrow, but he's done tremendously well over the the last week and, um, you know, deserves everything for the for the amount of work that he's, he's already been able to give to the team. So we're coming down to a very difficult part of the, the race now. And uh, with uh, Verona now riding on the front, this will definitely kind of open things up with the gap coming down to 220. Yep, yeah, certainly will. Uh, the next location of any significance. Um, we've just gone past it, in fact. We've gone through the intermediate sprint. There we go. Van Emden's job is done, as you were just saying, Brian, as the, uh, the vehicle's passing by and Eduardo Affini trying to empty the tank here and make a little bit of a difference. There's been a noticeable increase in pace in part, of course, well, in, in enormous part due to that big turn on the front by Carlos Verona. And this feels like it's the final real last few efforts here from Eduardo Fini, who will literally just completely empty himself, almost swing off to the side of the road. There you go. I think he might be nearly done now. Uh, there he goes. Job is done. He looks across. Carlos Verona knew that the pace was just slowing slightly. So chapeau to the Umbo Visma rider. The Italian Eduardo Fini looks like he's even trying to get back into the line there. He hasn't swung off totally. And that's the thing about these riders. If there's any chance they can hang on and give something a little bit later, they'll do it again, won't they? But Verona here, stamping on the pedals. But uh, it's in a smooth way and chipping away rather quickly now at the lead of our five riders in front. 2.14. Uh, this isn't looking quite as good as it was before now, and it just shows the, the difference when you get a fresh pair of strong legs on the front. Yeah, it really is kind of hurting the, the two riders that have been riding so far, Afini and uh, Yus van Emden, so, you know, they've done their job. 36 kilometres ago, all um, Verona is trying to do is bring this gap down to, you know, under a, a minute before we hit this uh, climb. Even so, I said a perfect situ situation for Jumbo Visma and now Movistar, if they can bring it back, then, you know, they're, they're in the game because... I really do think Turner and uh, Donovan are, are looking strong today and I wouldn't want to give them three minutes. I wouldn't even want to give them two minutes going into the, the, the final climb. So this is why they're starting to ride. I still would have heaped a little bit more pressure on Jumbo Visma to use uh, more of their riders, but such as racing, other teams get involved. Yeah, other teams want to win and if they've uh, made a call, that the only... <laughs> I clearly think well, Max Giandri would have made that call from the team card here. Right, OK, we need to start to bring things back. And he'll know he's um, done multiple tours of Britain in the past. He's a previous winner of the Kellogg's Tour, back as a professional. Um, he'll know what it's like. 
um, and how hard it is to chase on these sorts of roads. So now we are seeing a, a new tandem on the front. Athene and Van Emden have dropped back and it's now uh, one of the finest climbers in the world on this day. Stephen Kreiswijk relaying with Carlos Verona. So a yellow and black and blue duo on the front now. Eating away at the lead of our five riders in front. And what a strong group of riders it is as well. We've got Ben Turner of the Ineos Grenadier sits at 18 seconds on the general classification. Alexander Richardson is there in the black of St. Pyrrhon. He sits at only three seconds, as does Mark Donovan in the silver kit of Q36.5. Abram Stockman is also there for the TDT Unibet cycling team. Most aggressive rider yesterday and a couple of stages before that. There he is just on the back and also there for the Trinity Racing team in the blue on the front with that green flash down the back. That is the young 21-year-old Australian, Liam Johnson. And we're now on to this uh, hillier phase now, constantly up and down. And in about 20, wait, uh, sorry, should I say, eight kilometers time, we will hit the foot of the final categorized climb of the day. So, uh, and there's a bit of a drag leading into that one as well. As we look at a bit of uh, early autumn, late summer cultivation going on. And the gap now, at a two minutes and 10 seconds. So an effective stint on the front, but what can the difference or the addition of Stephen Kreiswijk do as well? So, um, Brian, I think it's fair to say this isn't about a holding pattern now, is it? They don't want to hold them at two minutes. They're trying to bring this gap down. They need to ride a fair degree faster than the group out in front. Now, this isn't about holding. This is now a steady pursuit, isn't it? It is, and it's interesting that they're actually using Stephen Kreuzberg in, in saving all of Coy. Um, mm. Olaf Kai got dropped earlier on and just rode his own tempo thinking that he'll come back. Um, so they're using Kreuzberg instead of Kai. Um, and that would have been a, a call they've, they've made themselves. Um, which would leave, if Stephen Kreuzberg, um, if the attack starts, there's four of them left in the front, Kreuzberg already riding. Kai might struggle on this climb, which would leave, as we, we originally thought, Nathan Van Hoydonk and uh, Walt Van Aert pretty much on their own and if Movistar start to rip this up with Ineos Grenadiers we, we could have a, an interesting final the fact that Turner and Donovan are in front um, really interesting to see what plays out next Yeah, well as the bunch continue to climb and the breakaway just going over the top of this uncategorised drag before they continue to drop down Still got the uh, intermediate sprint to come. That's only in three k's time. That's in the town of or the village of Dursley. And Ten seven five three and one points on offer towards the, the uh, green jersey classification. And uh, Dursley itself, uh, very famous as many of you will know, um, for the uh, Danish bicycle designer Michael Pedersen built the unique Dursley Pedersen bike uh, there back in the late 19th century consisting of 21 triangles but uh, but the bike proved too expensive for most people nine times the average monthly wage and um, production seat in 1917 and he died was buried in a pauper's grave in Denmark so the residents of Dursley um, actually got his remains brought back to the town in 1995 and there he lies so 201 now Brian good job being done here but yeah, there is an interesting one. Coy's still there. The bunch still pretty much intact. One or two riders have been dropped. But they are moving at a pretty decent pace. And um, metre by metre now, uh, the lead is coming down. Under two minutes for the first time uh, since the breakaway began. I'd have loved to have seen what would have happened if uh, Verona hadn't have come to the front. I think there would have been a lot more pressure on. I think uh, they would have started using Olaf Coy, uh, Stephen Kreuzwick and... It just goes to show you that you know the power of this breakaway through the middle of the stage. They've, they've managed their efforts. They've they've recovered on the wheel. Um, they're doing a great job here, and you know they're going to be. It's going to be hard to bring them back before this climb. It's how much time they're going to have on the climb. How much has Ben Turner and Mark Donovan got, got left in the legs? I even think uh, you know they could possibly lose you know up to a minute on this climb if they start attacking from the bottom. Um, so. That seems to be the, the tactic of uh, Movistar, you know, bring it back, get it back down to possibly under a minute and 
let the race commence. But you have to think that uh, Walt Van Aert, he said you have to drop him. They're going to try and drop him, but can they? I think that's the thing. I think it's an interesting one. I can see why Movistar have decided to chase. But I agree with you. I personally would have left it a little bit later because that would have forced Jumbo Visman to commit riders earlier on and would have potentially given uh, Serrano or Mulberger an opportunity to 1-2 rather than carry Van Aert to the final stage with more troops around him. Um, it appears that uh, that tactic, although I completely understand it, it's slightly more on the risk-averse side. It's slightly the safer option. And sometimes to try and win a bike race, you've got to gamble. But again, uh, appetite for risk is different. But it's, uh, it's certainly not the wrong thing to do because they're doing a very effective job. They're bringing this break back. But uh, for me, it's, uh, it falls more in the favour of Wout van Aert than Movistar themselves. But we shall see. But Movistar do have more options in terms of the GC. If they were to 1-2 or to try attacks with a couple of riders, um, if Wout van Aert were to be slightly, uh, slightly isolated, uh, shall we say. But he has still got Van Hooyd up there. And he's got uh, Olaf Koistel there as well. So as they pass through the final, well, the only intermediate sprint of the day, um, completely unchallenged, of course, just happened to be that Mark Donovan was on the front. So uh, those points have gone to the mountain, Q36.5, but he's got his eyes firmly fixed on trying to keep this breakaway as long as possible so he can catapult himself towards a good stage placing and moving up the general classification as well. And, of course, for the riders that aren't far away on the GC here, Let's assume they get taken back. They'll also be at the sharp end of the race. Oof. They just missed out that roundabout there. I thought they were going to the right, Brian, but it just shows how wrong I was. They went to the left. <laughs> yeah, I had his guessing, but, um, you know, you can see that they're to totally focused now and they're not giving up. They're giving absolutely everything. Still Verona and Stephen Kreuzweg. So we had two Afini and Jus van Emden hold now. Verona's help with the Kreuzweg driving into this gap. Um, the top of the climb comes with the 24.9, so it's not going to be long until we get to, to this climb, and even if they've got this 150, that's still, that's still a good gap, you know what I mean? So I would um, I'd be a, bit, a little bit worried um, about what Turner and the Donovan have got left. Yeah. It's a big ask, I still think, but uh, Turner and Donovan are classy, classy bike riders. And um, you'd imagine they'll be thinking exactly what we're thinking, maybe try and go on the climb. But uh, they still pose too much of a threat to be allowed to hang out there. Then it becomes just a matter of strength. Or will the combined resources of Jumbo Visma and Movistar be able to bring them back? Uh, I would say right now we're still just under 30 k's to go. It's still in the favour of the peloton, but they've got a big job to do. And that's why this is now quite clearly an active pursuit. We're in the final phase of the race here. This, of course, is the penultimate stage of the 19th edition of the Tour of Britain. We started off in Tewkesbury on this glorious summer's day. Temperatures in excess of 30 degrees. We've been through some spectacularly beautiful and quaint British countryside. And we are heading ever nearer to Oxford. We've looped around. We've essentially done a clockwise tour of the Cotswolds. And now we are heading in a northerly direction and we've still got a couple of very difficult climbs to come. The next of which is on the menu very shortly as we see confirmation of the cottages.com sprint towards the green jersey classification. Donovan, Johnson, Stockman, Richardson and Turner. All five of our breakaway taking any points available. But uh, that was completely and utterly uncontested as we look at the range of hills that still face the riders here on stage seven of the T.O. Bree. This is uh, hotting up. This is... The pot's simmering away nicely on the stove here, Brian, isn't it? This is bubbling up. Um, I wonder if whatever's been cooking in the saucepan is going to end up ending up on the hob today. We shall see. It is a tall order to try and stay away from the breakaway uh, for Ben Turner and Donovan. Uh, you know, I'll add the others in there as well, Johnson, Stockman and, and, and Richardson. But, you know, we're swaying towards the, the stronger uh, riders in this breakaway. and But it means it has to be active behind Matt. If yeah. they hit, it, it can't be just kind of tempo. It has, they have to race up this climb behind, so it's not going to be easy. Um, and I'm sure that you know the riders know that. So I really do think that you know they've given themselves a chance, but um, behind they'll still have to race these final kind of 25 kilometres, and they'll have to race them hard. 
They certainly were. One minute and 44 seconds. Harry Tanfield has got a teammate in front. Abram Stockman has had a fantastic tour of Britain so far. Tanfield was a clearly dropped back there. And is uh, fighting to get back in contact here. Latching onto the back of the peloton as we head ever nearer the climb. 142. So uh, a few more riders now moving up on the right hand side. DSM also moving up. They've got a couple of riders within striking distance of our race leader. They've got Nicholas Markle at three seconds and also Casper van Uden who sits in eighth place on the general classification. A very good finisher as also now it is Bora Hansgrove. And they want to bring this back uh, gap back down again. Kreuzweik on the right hand side as we look at the screen and also moving up that uh, in the red there, the Uno X Pro Cycling Team. So this is mustering nicely now. And this is where this is where we talk about just the sheer momentum, this positional play. It's the final categorised climb of today. And the stats of Crawley Hill, which is approaching very shortly, 1.7 kilometres at 6.6%. But the opening couple of hundred metres or three or four hundred metres are relatively flat. So the average gradient on most of the climb, and there's a plateau about two thirds of the way up as well, uh, way in excess of seven to eight percent. So a tall, a tough, tough climb. But the gap continuing to plummet is dropping very quickly now. 135, Brian, and we're nearly on the climb. Yeah, as you say, the momentum of uh, all the other teams coming up, you want to have a, a good position. Uh, we see it in every race uh, that um, it's always about, you know, positioning your uh, key riders towards the front. And I think that's what they're trying to do. But it still looks as if they're going to have a minute and a half when we start this climb. Um, and I think for Ben Turner and Donovan at the back here, they just have to kind of keep on pushing on, keep the pressure on and, and just see what happens behind. So, you know, are we going to see attacks on the climb as, as, as uh, Jumbo Visma and, and uh, Movistar are going to ride a hard tempo? You know, what is going to happen? Yep. There we go. The start of this climb. Crawley Hill, 1,700 metres, 6.6. .6. There we go. Pinarello King of the Mountains. So it's still be on the shoulders of James Fouché. Went away early on. There's a conversation had being had here. Uh, Liam Johnson having a bit of a natter with Alexander Richardson. And one of Richardson saying to him, look, we ride the climb as a unit together. And what it just, okay, let's just maybe knock it off ever so slightly, get to the top, and then we just go full, full, uh, full gas over the top. Um, I still, I think with the lead at 1 minute 34, they can probably afford to ship uh, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, and then push over the top. I'm wondering if that was the conversation. And also Richardson being the older, more experienced rider, just having a word, encouraging him, saying, dig in. If we just, uh, we can push over the top of this climb, stay together for as long as possible. We're still in with a shout today. 26 k's to go on the lower slopes of this climb, but it does start to pitch up. We saw that warning sign of 12%, and the 12% slope's coming very shortly as the bunch hit the bottom of the climb. One minute and 23 seconds. And look at the pace at the bottom of the climb here. It is Uno X on the left-hand side, and that's the figure of Ryan Mullen powering into the foot of this climb. Yeah, if I was Alex Richardson, I would want to keep it steady and try and keep it together, but I don't think it's in the interest of Turner and Donovan. They've already shown earlier on today that they've got big power when it comes to the climb, so I really do think that they want to push and keep on pushing all the way to the top. They want to have as much time at the top of this climb as possible. We come down the other side, and then we go up another climb. Um, so I think that... They're wanting to keep as much time in their back pocket over the top, um, and that's why they have to push on in the climb. Yeah, definitely. Here they are, coming towards the top. They've still got 900 metres to the top of this climb, and it gets a little bit steeper towards the top. There's a brief plateau, and then it kicks again. There's the Irish flag on the right-hand side of the road. No doubt fans of uh, Ryan Mullen and a couple of others, Sam Bennett. And a couple of Irishmen that are in this race. I think they are the only Irishmen. If I'm just checking through my start sheet very quickly. Yes, indeed, they are. Thank goodness I got that one right. But 107. And the gap is starting to come down. Ben Turner drops to the back of this group. Looks across at the figure. Uh, the man that he went away with earlier on, Mark Donovan. Stockman, Johnson and Richardson joined them later. And the gap continuing to drop now. But of course, there are going to be riders from the behind. I think the bunch is going to thin out here. But impressive riding here from the young man from Trinity taking things up on the right-hand side and setting that smooth, even tempo. It looks to me, Brian, as if they are going to try and stick together over the top of this climb. Still 600 metres to the top. And Olaf Coy now picks things up for Jumbo Visma in the green jersey, uh, a little bit lower down the climb. This gap coming down very quickly. 
It is, and, and, and that's why I was thinking that um, you know they, they, they have to kind of push on from the front. They, they can't kind of wait. Um, you know, you can see that uh, Tobias Johannesson is up there, protected right of for uh, Uno X in the red, but they have to keep on pushing. But by the looks of things, even Nathan Van Hooydonk is uh, starting to struggle a little bit. So Walt Van Aert coming He's to attacking. the front on his own now. Yeah, there we go. The best form of defence is attack, and he's doing it on his own here. Yeah, he's just looking like he's going, look at that, breathing through his nose here. But there's Serrano, who just latched on towards Damien House, and also there. Well, I thought this had the potential of happening here. Taking things into his own hands, and on his wheel is Magnus Sheffield, also there as well. Uh, Carlos Rodriguez, Johannesson round there too, as uh, the break starts to crumble. We've still got 400 steep metres to the top of this climb. And Wout Van Aert continues to press on at the front of the bunch. Olaf Coy teed things up, opened up a small gap on the lower part of the climb. But now they've taken nearly a minute, Brian, 33 seconds. It looks like it's quite possible that Wout Van Aert might singularly close the gap over the top of this climb. Well, it, it looks as if he's closing it on the climb. But, um, you know, Donovan and Turner really have to keep the pressure on here because the good thing about... Uh, in his Grenadiers, they've got uh, Sheffield and um, Carlos Rodriguez on the wheel of um, Walt Van Aert. He's been forced into it. I was a little bit surprised there. I thought uh, nothing Van Hoydong, but it just goes to show you that without uh, Movistar's help, um, you have to think that, you know, Jumbo Visma weren't going to do it. Yep, look at this. Magnus Sheffield on the wheel of Wout Van Aert is continuing to not snap behind. You see Damien House and there is a little group now moving clear. Numerous riders unsurprisingly getting dropped, including the man wearing the white jersey, keeping that warm for Olaf Koy. And even, well, look at this. Magnus Sheffield cannot quite hold on to the wheel of an absolutely rampant Wout Van Aert as they crest the top of the climb. 30 seconds is the time gap. And there's Stevie Williams. Stevie Williams in the white jersey there. Just on the back wheel of Damien House and in turn has had a great season so far. The Aussie for Q36.5 cycling team. But what Wout Van Aert has done, apart from nearly put everybody on his wheel there to the sword, is uh, creating, well, he's, he's now isolated. He's got two Jumbo Visma riders there. We've got three riders from Ineos Grenadiers, um, if you count Ben Turner up the road. So an interesting situation here. One thing is for sure, Brian, Wout Van Aert is a confident man. And super strong man. Um, what happens now? Nobody's wanting to ride. 30 seconds in front, you know, looking a little bit better. Richardson uh, coming back now. So the five looking good here. And I have to say that, um, you know, we saw a little bit of weakness from Jumbo Visma yesterday uh, in, the, in the finish. And they, they, couldn't, they couldn't do it. They weren't closing that gap. And, you know, they were really kind of stretched. It's, it's whether any of these teammates can come back and help them. But for the moment... Uh, what Van Aert is asking, he couldn't close. I think he, what he was trying to do is close it all on that climb. Yeah. Now he can't close. So looking a little bit better for uh, uh, this uh, group of four in front. And I think Richardson wasn't that far behind. No, he wasn't. Well, he's asking for assistance. Well, the two riders aren't going to give it. Um, Stevie Williams clearly is not minded to ride. The man there at the back, that's Camille Bonnieu, the winner of a stage in the last year's Tour of Britain. So it is left up to Wout Van Aert. And so we've got some other riders trying to get a piece of the action here. Two teams that have missed out, but one team in particular that's missed out, Border Hansgrove. So they are chasing here, and they want to get the likes of uh, a Schelling, uh, even Danny Van Poppel, but more importantly, Nils Pollitt to the front. Nils Pollitt yeah, also sits is, at three seconds. This is what Wilms has to do, because yeah, he Housen does. and Sheffield are not going to do anything. I think Tobias Johannesson has to help out as well, because you've got yeah. to remember, they are trying to win the race as well. There's another climb still to come, so try and shut this gap down and maybe go on the, the attack on the next climb, but this is a hard pursuit now. Um, everybody's committed. This is a big GC battle. Movistar came to the front, and they're not even featured. Yep. No, they, yeah, they haven't. No, they've got Serrano there, haven't they? He's just at the back of that group. Or is he dropped? I, I think Serrano was maybe actually dropped. I did see him. He was, he was on the, the wheel over the top. I think that's where he might be just there. So uh, Serrano... Well, there is number five. That's Gregor Mulberger. The fact that he's not riding back up to the front of the race. Well, lots happening here. And one thing is for sure, the group containing our race leader is 29 seconds behind the chases that are now reduced to just four. Ben Turner is on the front for the Ineos Grenadiers. Just behind him for Q36.5 Racing is Mark Donovan on the radio. So two Brits on the front. Then we have an Australian from Trinity Racing. Uh, and also there as well, an exceptionally strong Abram Stockman of the Unibet cycling team. As uh, Wout Van Aert 
just sits towards the back of this group and it's Stevie Williams doing a big drive and also it looks like Camille Bonnier is going to do some riding here. This is a good group. They've got 30 seconds indeed. Serrano isn't here, Brian. You were correct. I thought he was, but he isn't. Well, that's where yeah. the chase is going to come from. Yeah, you got, you got to, to worry about this now going on to this yeah. uncategorised claim that uh, Walt Van Aert will go again. 100% yeah. he'll go again. He'll, so. he'll attack him. Yeah, so you have to, but it's, it's still 35 seconds. I'm still starting to believe. Uh, I had a bit of a belief it will really have, uh, depending on, you know, how much um, firepower that uh, Jumbo Visma had at the end, and Walt Van Aert decided he had to take it on on his own, and never closed that gap by about 20 odd seconds. So, still in the balance, but it's looking a little bit better for this breakaway that could come to the finish. It certainly is. Well, both Matt, well, Magnus Sheffield. Stevie Williams, Damien House and Camille Bonnier and Tobias uh, Halland, Johannesson are all only three seconds behind a Walt Van Aert on the general classification. So each one of these riders poses a threat. Uh, but now we're getting there. The three other riders that haven't got a teammate out in front are, uh, are now riding with a Walt Van Aert. It looked as if nobody's going to ride, but there is also a furious chase behind and they're actually closing. So DSM have missed things out. So after attacking earlier on, we've got Paddy Bevin on the front now, bringing back the remnants of the peloton. And just there is a... Yeah, it's where are Movistar and where... This is it, and where are Bora? Unless they're yep. in between. Well, I, 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 I wrote off on? Bora. I don't think Bora would be a feature anyway. Uh, Ken Farmer coming up as well. So they're still about, uh, you know, 20-odd 20 sec seconds back. The only thing is Ben Turner is... Uh, it's, it, 18. 20, yeah, 18 seconds. He's 15 yeah. seconds um, behind uh, Mark Donovan. Ah, here's this group in between. This is Rodriguez working with Serrano and another rider from the Belgian uh, team, uh, Flanders Balois. So it looks like they might... Yeah, they're about to get on here. Also there, that's Elias Maris of Team Flanders Balois. So that will give two riders from Team Flanders Balois in this little satellite group that's trying to get across the gap. But the peloton, Brian, aren't too far away but at all. They're only 11 seconds behind this group. And if this comes back together, unless Jumbo Visma get more reinforcements, the group in front containing our four leaders now are slowly moving away. I think that's Alexander Richardson, Richardson. who's about to be caught. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think they've only got Van Hoydonk in the, in the group behind um, with the DSM chasing. So Richardson, unfortunately, just couldn't hang on. Unfortunately, he's done a tremendous job today. Niels Pollard uh, trying to get a help out, but just trying to put out fires at the moment. Um, yeah. Van Hoydok on the, the left-hand side, you know, he'll be he'll come into to use if it, if it all regroups. But um, not looking good for I can say it for the first time. Not looking good for um, Jumbo Vesma at the moment. Yep, looks like there's only one teammate. Didn't see Kreisberg. Well, afini has gone. Van Emden's gone. Uh, Coy has gone as well after putting in that turn right at the foot of the climb to ultimately tee up Wout van Aert um, before he piled pressure on, ripped this group to pieces. But now it is Team DSM and they're riding with Equipo Kern Farmer, the Spanish team who are reeling in front. They've got a very talented rider amongst their number. They'll be looking after Roger Adria. And meanwhile, our four riders in front have got a lead of 33 seconds. It's a fast section here. It's almost like a false flat. They then drop off this, so we're not quite over the top of this climb. So it's a fast, ever so slightly downhill section, but not a full-on descent. The descent comes shortly. They'll drop off this ridge, down into the valley, over a small climb, flat for a little bit, and then they'll hit the final climb of the day. It's uh, uncategorised, but it is a hard one. Not quite as difficult as the climb they've just gone up, but a tough one nonetheless. They then drop off the other side of that climb, and there's a small little kicker just before the finish. And that is the situation on the road. Just under 19 k's to go. This is really hotting up. This is an interesting situation. And importantly, Brian here, Walt Bernard has been forced to ride himself now. Which, although we know how strong he is, um, he's having to burn a few matches here. But it does look as if this is going to come back together. Especially when you've got someone like uh, Nils Pollitt on the front. Yeah, they are riding. Um, you know, he's got a bit of help from a couple of others. Bonnie and uh, Stephen Williams. But... He just kind of came back, lost the wheel, and having to make a, another effort up because there's a couple of Ineos riders not. It'll be, be interesting to see what the Ineos riders do now in this second group, whether Rodriguez, especially Sheffield, with um, Turner being at 15 seconds behind Donovan. Potentially, Sheffield, if he can, he can get away and get across, it means going into tomorrow, they've got two options instead of just one option. Exactly. 
And they've also got Rodriguez there, remember, as well. So Rodriguez sits only three seconds. He managed to get across that group with Serrano uh, and also Elias Maris. But it does look as if all the groups are going to come back together and we're going to have a compact, well, a smaller peloton, but still a big one. It looks as if once that group uh, gets onto the back of the group containing um, our breaker, well, our counter-attack with Wout Van Aert, we're going to have a peloton. Still about 60-so riders, Brian. So it's still a big group coming into the finish here. And when you've got 60 riders, that means there's a lots of teams that aren't represented in the front. And over the top of this next climb, and they could all combine, we could end up, unless this group can do something pretty special now, we could end up with a sizable group coming into the finish. There's still a lot to be decided and still some tough terrain to go over. So a fascinating and finely balanced situation here with just under 17 k's to go. I think this next un uncategorised climb uh, will make the difference in today's stage. Um, it does look as if it's coming back together behind. Uh, whether they can get organised, they won't be able to do this on this descent, but 33 seconds, it's, it's, I think it's a, a little bit nip and tuck. Uh, it's what all Van Aert's got left in the legs. If he's, got, if he's got plenty of punch left in his legs, he's going to go again on this next climb. Yep, I think he will. Yeah, he won't want to be carrying so many riders clear again. Uh, from what we saw before, um, he'll do exactly the same again. And the thing is, over the top of this next climb, it's, um, it's mostly descending and then one more short climb to the finish. Not a lot of terrain, Brian, to actually get a chase organised. That's the thing. If he does rip it up, we haven't got these big long flat sections like we're seeing here. That plateau where you can start to roll through and chase. And there'll be a lot of tired legs depending on the speed they hit this final climb at. So, um, but the gap's going out ever so slightly. Um, things have gone up. Well, because they're all going to gonna look... They're gonna, yeah, they're going to look now. The other teams now, Stevie Williams isn't going to suddenly start riding now. So this is all about Van Hooydonk. They've only got one rider. So Van Hooydonk is going to have to ride in a sacrificial manner here. It's a slightly, well, smaller group than I thought, actually. Um, yeah, there's another group just off the back of it, Matt. It's going yeah. kind to of split in that descent. But Van Hooydonk straight to the front now. And, you know, I think... Um, you know, the queuing up behind the Ennis Grenadiers because uh, Walt Van Aert, Van Hooydonk won't, won't be able to close this gap, but what he can do is bring it back a little bit and then on this uh, uncategorised climb, that's when we see Walt Van Aert go again. Yep. 15 kilometres to go now for our leading four riders. Ben Turner is there for the Ineos Grenadiers. Mark Donovan also there for Q36.5, riding in second position. What a ride by young Liam Johnson. Sat in third position, the Australian riding for Trinity Racing and latching on the back. Well, tell you what, what a week he has had. This lad is strong. Abram Stockman of Belgium riding for the TDT Unibet cycling team. Most aggressive rider yesterday. And still in this front group, we've lost Alexander Richardson. He is now back in the clutches of this enormously reduced peloton. And the only man that's a teammate of our race leader, Wout Van Aert, is now chasing on the front and he's going to get no assistance at all. So uh, the pressure really on now. So Van Aert, not isolated, but he's only got one teammate now, 35 seconds. So there's only so much that this man is going to do. Uh, once Nathan Van Hooydonk has emptied himself on this climb, um, Wout Van Aert is going uh, to be isolated. He's dropping back a little bit, isn't he? Keeping, keeping a watchful eye. But that just does suggest to me it's going to have to be all or nothing. He's going to have to attack. What he can't afford is for this group, Brian, over the top of this last climb, to still have 30 seconds because it's essentially no. a descent, then a little kicker to the line. No, he, he has to join them. If they go over the top of this climb uh, with any sort of advantage, it's, it's looking good for them. For Ben Turner, this man behind him is 15 seconds in front of him. So, so what does Ben do? He might have to yeah. try and connect distance Donovan himself. So he might want to go. Depends what you've got left, but... This gap is coming down. Um, look at this is going. This is already an exciting final. Um, I really thought that you know Jumbo Visma were really tested, really in the back foot now, and you know just couldn't bring that gap down. Movistar came up with Verona, and you know they were the big help, but Verona actually hurt a lot of the the, the riders from uh, Jumbo Visma because when it came to it, they didn't have it, and that's why Walt Van Aert had to go on his own. Yeah, I actually don't think Jumbo Visma have done anything wrong today. I think they've done what they could. They've been put under pressure, eyes on them. Remember, they've got five stage winners They're still in the lead of this race, but the lead is only a slender one. And uh, the rider in the virtual lead of this race at the moment is sat on the front of this group, and that is why he's willing to pull him along. Mark Donovan, three seconds, started the day, three seconds behind Wout Van Aert. 
And despite the best efforts of Nathan van Hooydonk at the moment, the lead has only come down by a couple of seconds in two or three Ks. Um, but the thing is, uh, this man on the front, Nathan van Hooydonk, needs to try and stay here for as long as he can. So he's got to slight, it's a full on effort, but he needs to sustain it, doesn't he? And he knows full well um, he can't afford to leave Wout van Aert isolated for too long either. So he's going to need to take this onto this climb and into it as deep as he can, completely empty himself for Wout van Aert to go over the top. But there's some classy riders just behind as well that followed Wout van Aert over the last climb. Carlos Rodriguez and Magnus Sheffield in particular from the Ineos Grenadiers. And this next climb, not quite as severe as the climb we saw before of Crawley Hill. But still, 32 seconds, 13 k's to go, Brian. This is turning into a bit of a nail-biter now. It is, just coming out of Stroud now. And um, when we look back in the stage, that decision by Donovan and Turner to, to wait for the other three was the perfect thing to do. They yeah. kind of really kind of helped and um, you know gave them hope of kind of staying away. But yeah, this is going to be a bit of a nail-biter because all Nathan Van Hooydonk is doing is, is holding them at uh, just about 30 seconds. Yeah, and there's no assistance now from Mobistar, is there? That's an interesting one. Um, I think they're not going to give it because I think everybody know it. I think they're waiting because in a couple of k's time we'll know what's going to happen because um, if this gap doesn't come back too much, well I think well when I, even if it comes back I think well when it's going to attack because on that run into the line okay we go over the top of the climb with about nine k's to go and uh, just around eight or nine k's to go the top of that final climb then there's ascent and there's that run into the line so that is where you could argue um, even more so on the climb Van Aert could be isolated on, on the flattest run into the line with no teammates to shut things down all and they're going to throw the kitchen sink at him yeah well hopefully they will uh, hopefully in this going to so with the team uh, be able to do that because um, i think they've got the, the strength and numbers but you know i think as we we turn left here and it starts to kind of kick up a little bit 26 seconds um how long can uh, van hoogert don't go and what van art will just look all what van art has to do is get to the front get to the front four that's all he has to do and then go over the top with them whoever is with them but I think uh, Ennis Grenadiers definitely have the numbers but Nathan Van Hooydonk slowly but surely bringing it back and I think this is bridgeable now yep and it's a big acceleration on the front here as well it looks like Stockman's just stole well, he is starting to lose the wheels moves over to the left hand side of the road just finds a little bit more power out of the saddle to try and get onto the wheel of the man just in front of him Mark Donovan, Turner swings over. I'm increasingly impressed by Liam Johnson, a man who's finished twice inside the top 10 of the stage races he's done. And this is, well, this is sacrificial riding. Nathan Van Hooydonk is going as deep as he can. He's got Connor Swift on his wheel, then Carlos Rodriguez Serrano, last year's winner, is there as well. And even this last roll, it's not even a roll of the dice, this is sacrificial riding here. Where is Wout van Aert? Looks like he's keeping a watchful eye on everybody around him, but it's a good job here by the Belgian. It is. You know, he's, he's really kind of... Oh! Uh, was that, is that uh, Rodriguez? It's Rodriguez. Uh, one of the Ennis guys uh, crashed there. Um, Sheffield is there. I think it was Rodriguez. He doesn't have yeah, any... Else. There he goes. Out the there picture. Go. There he goes. Yep, yeah, out and he's out. Nobody can match this. There's such raw power here. They can't, they can't match him. He's unmatchable. Now, this is where we could see this man... Right, He goes straight past Stockman like he stood still. This is a this is absolutely amazing rider. We know how capable this man is, but he's absolutely rampaging over this climb. 11.5 k's to go. He goes straight past the breakaway, like they are stood still. What a performance here by Wout van Aert. There's a, a reaction from Turner behind to try and get onto the wheel, but this is absolutely fantastic. Wout van Aert on the back foot, now on the front foot, Brian. Yep amazing to see you know just that stage he won the other day you know he's absolutely in his hands and knees here but he had to do that Nathan Van Hooydonk doing a great job Turner still got enough to go with him Donovan here as well but going over the top of this climb he might get a little bit of help from these two but what a terrific job they've done still behind you can see Sheffield it is it's dragging the bunch I don't know why he's dragging the bunch but then again you know you've got to remember that Turner is at um, 15 seconds behind um, Donovan and uh, 18 seconds behind um, the, the man at the front here in the leader's jersey. I think that this got, potentially think... is, is one, two, three. If so, I don't understand why Sheffield is riding behind. Nor it's another I... day tomorrow. Yeah, I don't think, especially the fact they've just lost Carlos Rodriguez in a crash. There's yeah. no way he's going to get on anytime soon. That is for sure. Uh, what is Turner going to do now? If Turner actually gives Wout van Aert a turn, which he isn't. 
um, then it would really question why they're riding behind. Here's so Williams they go. Coming. Yep, Stevie Williams is trying to get across the gap himself. Good move there by Stevie Williams of the Great Britain team. There's a flick of the elbow there. I don't think any time soon they're going to get... Well, there we go. Williams straight. Oh, I thought Williams was going to go straight over the top here. Williams looks across. They've neutralised this one. Now, what does Williams do here? Does he ride with the race leader? Because it's Uno X. There's a real selection that has formed behind here. Ben's gone. Yep, Ben. It looks like Ben has gone. So Stevie Williams is now pressing on on the front. So Stevie Williams, Ben Turner, Wout van Aert. Wout van Aert as well. He's only human, starting to suffer a little bit. That's a ridiculously high leg speed. So much power that he managed to transmit through the bike. 10 Ks to go. What a final part of this stage we're having here on the route to Gloucester, Brian. Yeah, it's great. As you said, he is human. He's, he's grimacing. He is hurting. He's pulled it out the bag. We knew he was going to attack in this uncategorised un climb all. Van Hooydonk had to do is just close it down to, to make it bridgeable. It was more than bridgeable uh, because the way he flew across this gap, I think it's in the best interest of all these riders to ride now um, because they've distanced so many riders behind. Just look as if uh, Van Poppel's there as well in this yeah, uh, he's second that group, yeah. group. So, look, take it into tomorrow. I know you're taking Walt Van Aert to, to the finish, but at the end of the day, you have to think of the big picture now if you want to try and win the Tour of Britain. Unfortunately, you're not strong enough to beat Walt Van Aert today, but there's always tomorrow. Yep, well, it looks like Ben Turner's latched onto the back of this group. It is the squad of Uno X Pro Cycling that are riding behind. I think they'll get some assistance from anybody from Bora that's there as well. Um, this is the group behind. Uh, Mulberger is, is there. Also in the mix as well, that's Zeb Kiffin. Good ride by the man from St. Pyrrhon to be in that group. But Stevie Williams here. Nine seconds is the gap, so it's only a tenuous one. And there are, well, the group behind is uh, constantly swelling as well. So this is going to be very delicately poised here. There's no, well, no certainty at all, Brian, that this group is going to go to the finish just yet. They need to keep on riding. But Williams is happy. Van Aert sits on his wheel at the moment. What does Van Aert do now? He's probably better riding with this group than risking it all coming back together and then coming under attack again. So I think Van Aert needs to keep riding here. Just keep rolling through. Um, but as you say, if it does come back together, all he has to do is stay in the front group. You know, the others have to drop him and they're not, they're not being able to do that. For Stephen Williams, this is a great opportunity of moving up in the general classification. It's the same for the others. But, you know, for, for Turner... I think of Walt Van Aert's riding at the moment. Turner's got a decent turn of speed at the end. You know, this definite stage went up for the grabs and he's got a better chance of winning the stage from this group than he, than he has been caught. Um, that's why I don't understand why Sheffield was doing a little bit of riding over there because I would have given um, Turner the, the benefit of the doubt. When you come into a, a small group like this, and it's not for the first time that Walt Van Aert has been, been beaten in a sprint from a small group, he's the man who has to do most of the riding um, the others can save a little bit. I know that Turner and Donovan have been in the, in, the, in the front group, but this is a good opportunity for Ben Turner to to come into the finish and, and try and win the sprints. Whether he goes for a, for a flyer, let's wait and see, because he needs to find 18 seconds. But you know, if he wants to win this race, all four of these riders are in with a, a good chance. You've got to consider tomorrow as well. But they don't want anybody else coming into the mix because there's a lot of riders in the same time. Yep. Oh, the riders in this group, it's uh, Johansson, Rasmus Tiller, uh, also Nils Pollitt starting to ride through as well. We've got Gregor Mulberger in this group as well, the Austrian from Movistar. And uh, that rider there from Bora, from Uno X, just drifted off the front there. It was only Uno X that were actually riding. Uh, no, it isn't. Well, he's gone clear now with the rider from Bora. That is Nils Pollitt. So uh, two riders now trying to get across the gap. And we'll get Pollitt with a grip between his teeth a bit between his teeth and uh, they may actually get across still seven kilometers to go as you can see the road flattening ever so slightly turner unsure exactly here forcing wout van Aert to go back and the lead is certainly under 11 seconds by the looks of things now it looks like it's just more around five or six seconds and that little group of riders that just went off the front there uh, is come back together uh, damien hausen is also in this group as well we've also got uh camille bonnier in this group too Pollitt is burying himself because Danny Van yeah. Poppel's here and Danny yeah. Van Poppel's trying to attack and go across himself and he has to do it quickly uh, Serrano's on his case as well Kiffin as well so you know Niels Pollock wasn't able to do it but it looks as like if Danny Van Poppel's going to cross this gap 
Well, brilliant ride by Danny Van Pop. Remember, he's uh, also just at three seconds. What a ride by the man that won the stage yesterday. And he's using that lead-out speed that he's got to bridge across to the front group. What a manoeuvre there. Sorano, last year's winner, wearing number one, just behind him in the blue there. And what a ride as well by Zeb Kiffin. Also sits at just three seconds as well. So this has changed the situation now. Uh, the Enos Grenadiers in the group behind should probably now think about joining forces with, uh, with uh, Uno X because Ben Turner now is at a distinct disadvantage on the general classification. They're five kilometres to go. Uh, well, six, what, six kilometres to go, should I say. And uh, what does Wout Van Aert do? Back on the front there, just behind him, Mark Donovan, one of the big instigators of the group. A fascinating situation. Still really delicately poised and still no real conclusions can be drawn just yet Brian anything can still happen in this closing dying uh, kilometers of this race yeah I think they're starting to look at each other now um, I, I do think that the, the second group may come back together now um, it's not Niels Paul well, in, he's in the second group but it definitely Danny sorry. Van Poppel so it does look as if it's, it's got all going to come back together now um, Uno X are, are dragging it all back so there's more riders involved with the GC now. That's why I thought it was a little bit more important for the four riders to, to help each other. I'm not too sure Ben done the right thing there. Uh, I would have rather have ridden and then taken into the day. With four riders, you've all got a chance of winning, uh, a better chance of winning, rather than being up against a lot more riders. So, But it's their choice, and you know they've still got an option with uh, with Sheffield here. Well, there's a big attack on the left-hand side. Uh, it's wow, up, but uh, look at this. And, uh, and Nils, it, uh, well, he, he couldn't, he, he could drop. not respond. He just could not go to the sheer might of Wout Van Aert, who goes again. Again, he is tearing this race apart at the moment. They cannot hold him. And look at the gap he's managed to open up. Three and a half kilometres to go. Wout Van Aert again, Brian, has daylight. This man is irrepressible. Killer instinct just goes again. Just when you think that, oh... That was difficult. This is what I was saying before a little bit. Better to ride with Walt Van Aert than be attacked by Walt Van Aert. Just roll through. And I, I do think now that uh, Ben Turner doing the wrong thing because I think that Walt Van Aert at that stage, if everybody had con contributed in that group of four, then they would they would have still been a group of four at the front. You had a chance of winning the, the general classification and a chance of winning the stage. But that chance, I think, is gone now because I don't think anybody's got the legs to close this gap. Look at Sheffield. He came to the front in a turn. He doesn't have the legs. Everybody's in their hands and knees. This man keeps on pulling it out the bag. Well, it's still not over just yet. Still three and a half k's to go. The road just eases ever so slightly. He still needs to keep pressing on. Still needs to make sure the chain is tight. Now, what can Uno X do? They're the team with the most riders in this group. They've got Johannesson, Tiller and Urienstad. They have to commit if they want to bring back Wout van Aert, who just enjoys a little bit of freewheeling. Three k's to go, but this last, well, between kilometres three and two, it's ever so slightly downhill. They're going to be carrying a lot of pace here. He's back on the power again. What an amazing ride this is. He's taking it to everybody else. He's completely and utterly isolated. Five seconds is the lead now, Brian, for Wat Van Aert, our race leader. Yep, can't see him being brought back now. I think everybody's on their hands and knees. They don't have anything left. You know, just when you think that you've got um, Wat Van Aert, the team will not have a clue. The, the riders in the race behind will not have a clue what's happening. We have been treated to another display of just power. You know, we saw him the other day when he uh, he averaged 800 over 800 watts over the last um, few you know 100 kilo, 100 meters of of the stage that he won two kilometers ago. He's not been brought back. This is his second stage when the way he's done it has been absolutely amazing. We speculated about whether he would do do something on his own. I think it was I was thinking it was going to be in the second climb rather than the first climb, but he was forced into it. His team weren't up for the task. Verona help for Movistar. Everybody's just been blown away. There's one winner today, and that's Walt Van Aert. Well, seven seconds is the lead. There are the two chases, the duo from the Uno X Pro cycling team. We're heading in to the centre of Gloucester here still. 1,800 metres to go. Exceptionally high speeds here. Five seconds, it's saying. So it looks like they might be bringing him back. It's difficult to say. Uh, the gap is definitely... Well, there he is. He's only just there. Well, they are starting to close now. Walt Van Aert appears to be tiring now. Uh, Uno X Pro Cycling are slowly but surely bringing him back with 1,500 metres to go. Danny Van Poppel now on the wheel here, Brian. This is starting to close up as Van Poppel goes long. 
Yeah, he's just going straight over the top now. I still think that um, you know he's got enough left, but he's going to bury himself. Is it in fact uh, Van Pop or Niels Pollard that's at the front there Pollard. for uh, Bora? Um, and he'll bury himself because he's got absolutely nothing to lose. He's not saving anything. He's trying to win another stage for Danny Van Poppel. It's going to be a nail biter coming into one kilometre to go, but you have to say what an effort from uh, Walt Van Aert. Whether he wins or not, it's been an incredible effort. He's starting. To, he's just easing off into this roundabout here. It looks like he is going to be caught. It's only three seconds now. You've got one man sacrificing himself for another, but looks to think, I think it is indeed Nils Pollitt. It is the figure of Nils Pollitt dragging it back together. Van Poppel zipping up his jersey. Stevie Williams is there as well. Mulberger too. We've got Jan Hannesson, Tiller and Urienstad, three exceptionally fast riders from the UNO X Pro cycling team. So it looked as if victory was his. It's certainly not at the moment. He's isolated. He's just about to be caught. Nils Pollitt continues to wind things up here in Gloucester. What a race we've been treated to. It's important now that Van Aert makes sure that he stays within this group as they start to wind it up. You've got Magnus Sheffield in the mix as well. Uh, two riders there, of course, from Q36.5, Mark Donovan and Damien House. And as they wind it up on the left hand side, it's got to be Van Popper now on the left hand side. Tiller is there as well. As they go, it's like it's going to be Tiller in the centre. Van Poppel can't do it. Oh, Tiller takes it for Uno X. What a ride by Rasmus Tiller. Takes the win there for Uno X. They had strength in number, and they delivered in the end, outsmarting and outspeeding a fast-finishing Danny Van Poppel. But Rasmus Tiller gives Uno X their win. Sensational stuff here on the streets of Gloucester Bryan as the bunch come in. This uh, decimated bunch today is brutally difficult finale. Uh, a led home there by Ethan Vernon on the right-hand side. Looks like he's going to be just taken on the line. I think he takes that sprint just in front of Simon Sanyok of Q36.5. But a win for Uno X. Well, wow. what, what, what a final half hour. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And, you know, if it wasn't for Niels Pollitt, these guys weren't bringing back um, Walt Van Aert there. I thought he had it, but Niels Pollitt had another idea and just empty himself for it. But it just goes to show you that, you know, out in the road there, we see it here again. That was a strong, we know Tiller is strong. Yeah. Exceptional. They had numbers, as you say, but can you imagine if Movistar hadn't a put Verona towards the front? You know, how this race would have, would have opened up even more, put heap more pressure on Jumbo Visma. And, you know, I think maybe a couple of them will regret not riding with Wolf Van Aert towards the end there, because I think the four riders could have come. Um, to, to, to the finish but no they decided not to ride but so all the ifs, ifs and buts and hindsights we were we were treated to a, a great display of power there by Walt Van Aert wasn't enough in the end he just came in at the he's, back of that group yeah he was tailed off Brian he was actually off the back of the yeah. group he might three it, seconds <laughs> yeah three we'll seconds. see I think the gap might have come down by one or two seconds uh, he might still be in the lead We'll soon find no, 100%, out. 100% right. in the lead. It's three seconds in a sprint stage, so there was not a three-second gap. Are they calling this a sprint stage? Yeah. <laughs> yeah this we'll is see. A, this is a sprint. It's not an uphill finish. So he finishes at the, the back. That's how much he was he was gone. Absolutely gone. But yeah. Danny Van Poppy was in the right, right uh, wheel there, but he opens up first, then Tiller opens up. But at, at this stage, you know that effort going across to the, the four riders in front? That was the effort that paid the price for Danny Van Poppel. Quite easily in the end. Uh, looked like Serrano going up there in third place, Williams in fourth. But, yeah, we were treated to a, a really nice race today. Yeah, that was um, that was brilliant. I don't think you can fault Jumbo Bismar at all. There was no Pollitt. He was the man Alton that dragged everybody back into contention. Uh, with Johannesson as well. We have to take your hat off to Tobias Johannesson and Rasmus Tiller, who were relaying... Um, there we go. Uh, Steve Williams. What's Mulberg in the group there? But Rasmus Tiller takes the win for Uno X. Danny Van Poppel in second down winner yesterday. Stevie Williams in third there for the Great Britain cycling team or the squad. Gregor Mulberger there for Movistar in fourth. Damien Housen a solid fifth by the man from Q36.5. Tobias Halland Johansson in sixth. Great ride by Zeb Kiffin uh, there in at seventh place for St Piran. And then at eighth Magnus Sheffield, ninth Liam Johnson. And then Mark Donner. So they're still it's still the same as you've pointed out, Brian. Wout Van Aert is still a race leader heading into the final stage of this race. But uh, I tell you what, um, on the roads 
of the Cotswolds today, this race really came alive. From start to finish, we had that holding pattern midway through, but it was the that breakaway, and there were a few so, uh, brave survivors that were in that front group at the end, shaped the race, forced Jumbo Visma to chase, and ultimately uh, it made... Um, Ultimately, it, made, it saw that Wout Van Aert was isolated. As you said, I thought this was him at the back there, but he's just latched onto the back of that group, so safely home uh, just outside the top ten there, Wout Van Aert. But uh, a bold move by him, but still in the lead this race, and that's the most important thing. Still got four, five stage wins, still in the lead. Um, but looking at what we've seen today, Brian, um, I think a lot of teams are going to think, OK, we need to be, all we need to be is aggressive, get riders up the road, and force a tiring Jumbo Visma to chase again because the climbs tomorrow are pretty difficult. I mean, there's some proper... I mean, as, as far as mountains go in this country, we've got some tomorrow. Yeah, we have. Uh, we go to South Wales, but most people might think, Wolf Van Aert didn't have to do that in the running. All we had to do was follow the Wales, but that would have been a different scenario. If he'd have, if he'd have stayed in the group, in his mind, there was teams with multiples and they would have just attacked, so he would have to accelerate, close down, close down, close down. So that's the reason why he went on the attack. He didn't want to be attacked. The best form of defence is attack, and that's what he did. I really did think he was going to pull that off, but Niels Pollock was the, the difference in that. He just sacrificed his, his, his chances. You know, he, he wasn't the first time he wasn't able to bring back um, the group of four, and that's why Danny Van Poppel jumped over the, 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 the gap. But that jump, that effort, he paid for it and finished there, Matt. So yeah. there was a lot of, when you, you pick the bones out of this, making this effort here, shouldn't have done that. Maybe saved this. It did all come back together. If Danny Van Poppel hadn't went across there, it would have come back together and, you know, he'd have probably won that sprint against, against Teller. So it's all ifs, buts and what you should have done. I really do think that Turner should have ridden. Um, but then again, you look at, you know, did he have the legs in the end? He looked rather tired. It was a fascinating run in, and it was all instigated by the man in the leader's jersey, Walt Van Aert. Well, I think he knew, being being a relatively isolated, and knowing that uh, Van Hooydonk wasn't going to be there at the end, the only way to, to mitigate and to avoid being attacked is to attack Brian. Um, and I think that, that was, uh, and just about had enough strength to stay into the front group at the end. But that was... Uh, uh, just brave. And also, I think what it shows is the fact that Wout Van Aert, you know, is a true, true champion. He's also wishing to gamble. Uh, and OK, you could really, if you looked at it super forensically, like you've just done and said, look, you know, maybe that wasn't, well, it wasn't the right thing to do because he didn't win the bike race. Uh, any move that you do that ultimately doesn't bring you the, winning the bike race is the wrong move. It's just, that's in its purest form. But... Um, Ultimately, being in front gives that little bit of safety, doesn't it? So uh, rather be in front and lose and finish with everybody else, I guess, than stay in the group and risk being attacked and, and everybody looking at you to chase things down. And I think had he not attacked when he did, other riders would have tried to have gone and yeah. everybody would look to Wout van Aert. And there's, there's seven, six, most of the riders in that front group, bar one or two, were only three seconds. So I think the best thing to do even if it risked him not winning the stage, was to go off the front and force them to chase. So that's that's my view on it, Brian. But there's, there's so many different takeaways from it, isn't there? That's what's so beautiful about bike racing. Ultimately, he's still in the lead of this bike race. I feel a bit sorry for Donovan and Turner there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Put so much effort in it. I, I really do think that if they rolled a little bit more with um, Hope Van Aert, the, the four of them would have stayed away. Again, it's difficult to say because when you get tired legs, Matt, you just want to save any excuse to miss a few turns and not ride when you're up against this man. But I think he would have ridden all the way in to, to the finish yeah. with the other three. Um, but they decided not to contribute. And, um, yeah, we had a, a really entertaining final. That was fantastic. Really enjoyable stage, that was. Um, um, we were hoping things to explode into life on the closing weekend of the Tour of Britain and it really did and it was good to see other teams really take it to Jumbo Visma um, and they made them work hard and that was uh, as you say great to watch and it does set things up nicely we've got more of a general classification forming with that little elite group that went clear at the end um, more this only Fewer riders now in the mix of, uh, of taking this ultimate crown. 
Uh, but we move tomorrow, as you say, into South Wales. Um, another stage and some uh, brilliant terrain as we look at Walt Bernard. Um, doesn't look, I wouldn't say he's unhappy, um, no, but he had to work so that, that the team is just focused. I mean, he's, he's still in the lead of this race, um, but he's had to work really hard for that. And um, there we go. That's bike racing, isn't it? But um, they knew that they'd have a stern test, and I think we have to congratulate the, the, the other teams in, in the race for really uh, thinking a bit differently and, and, and trying to put Jumbo Visma on the back foot a little bit. And for the first time, we saw them ever to start on the back foot today, Brian. They had them. Um, you know, they had that show of strength with the, the riders on the front, but when they hit that climb, they just completely capitulated. Only Van Hoydog was there, and he was in the second group and was brought back. So Uno X win and plenty of happy Norwegians. Indeed, or Rasmus Tillet. That's his fifth um, career win. I think it's uh, his one. I think it's three races this year. Let's just fire him up. So, yeah, took this stage. A one earlier in the year as well. Took the Duracell Dwarf Doors at Hagland, which is a semi classic over in Belgium. So, two wins for the Norwegian this year. A former national champion. And here's that one again. Super, super strong. And again, uh, out rolled Danny Van Poppel, but uh, Brian, this sort of sprint, we talked about how strong Van Poppel was over the tops of the climbs, but ordinarily speaking, Van Poppel would not hit the front until the last K of a race anyway, so it's, but actually using your sprint um, in a situation like that, I mean there's, it is going to deplete uh, your ability or, or basically just take a few edges off your ability to execute a perfect sprint at the end of a race, so a sprint over this sort of terrain, Brian, from a group where you've had multiple climbs, you've been in, your, in the wind yourself. Very different than a traditional bunt sprint where you looked after when you've got that rested explosivity that we normally see. So completely different. It's a, again, arguably suited Tiller a lot more because he is not a pure sprinter, but a runner that can, that can sprint after multiple efforts. Oh, there's that crash. It's just this Walt Van Aert, the constant cameraman concentrated on the crash rather than Walt Van Aert. Just watch him here. He's already gone. He's in the left of the picture. Boom. There he is. <laughs> just appears out of here. This hope Carlos Rodriguez is okay. Just looked like he overlapped the will of his teammate. And this is where he went again over the top. That's clearly caught the breakaway by surprise. The reaction there from Mark Donovan and from Ben Turner. Uh, well, that was just clear surprise in their face. And this was the moment that Wout Van Aert was actually caught about about four or five, well, no, five, six hundred metres to go by Nils Pollock. Did a great job in trying to set up Danny Van Poppel as we get Rasmus Tillett probably having a look for the very first time at the, uh, the closing metres of the stage into Gloucester that saw him take win number five of his professional career. I and think as, uh, a, a as a sprinter, you're always hoping that you'll come back and that's what Van Poppel and Tiller did. Like you say, Tiller is more, he's used to making these kind of hard efforts. That effort in the running for Van Poppel, I think that really hurt his legs here because he, he when he moved out, he wasn't coming anywhere near uh, Tiller in the end. A big roar there as he crossed on. Let's hear from our winner. Rasmus, your first and Uno X's first win at the Tour of Britain. How are you feeling? I'm feeling really good. Uh, yeah, the first six stages was all about uh, yeah, um, what do you call the bunch sprints. And uh, yeah, today we knew the parkour uh, uh, suit as well. So uh, yeah, really happy to to get the win. Uh, just talk us through that sprint because you had some big names to beat in there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Tobias and uh, Wout uh, uh, went away in the steep climb and. Uh, I had the, didn't have the power to follow and need to, to pace a little bit and then uh, yeah we managed to come back and then in the sprint uh, yeah it was a lot of tactics uh, the last 10k uh, Wout was alone in front and uh, yeah we knew he was re he is really strong so it's we knew that we had to uh, uh, yeah pull to, to get him in and uh, and Tobias did a really good lead out so uh, yeah I'm uh, happy I managed to to win. Now, everybody expected the race to blow up today. Did it actually go as you thought it would do? Yeah, the last two climbs was uh, really hard and uh, also the breakaway had uh, um, quite a lot of time uh, into the second last climb and 
I think Jumbo needed to, to do something because uh, no, no uh, other teams wanted to help them. So, uh, yeah, Walt needed to attack himself. And then it was all about to try to follow. And, uh, yeah, uh, in the end, it was more, uh, more racing than the other days. Uh, you're three seconds behind in the GC. How will you go into tomorrow's stage? Yeah, tomorrow is uh, even harder. So, uh, yeah, we have a really good um, uh, rider in Tobias. He, he can follow the best in the, in the steep climb. And then I need to, uh, you know, pace myself uh, or pace in the, in the climbs and see if, uh, yeah, if I have the, have the legs to follow. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Cheers. you. <laughs> so win number two this year for Rasmus Tiller former Norwegian champion as we look down at uh, Gloucester Cathedral. Yeah, that was a cracking stage, Brian. And looking ahead to tomorrow and what we've got in store. It's a hilly day, as we know. Um, there are four categorised climbs, all of them first category. But again, looking at the profile, there's another two very big climbs, or three very big climbs that aren't even categorised. And significantly, they all come in the final part of the race as well. So the first... 75 k's uh, gently undulating to flat and then all the climbs come at the back end so the shape of the race will be completely different brian won't it um and with those densely packed climbs not much recovery in between it's going to be a real test of how long jumbo Visma can stay around wout van Aar. and it's not quite as simple as going on the offensive early is it they're going to be, need to be really careful because as rasmus tiller was saying there are a lot of riders very close to wout van Aar, and um and the teams are happy to sit back and let Yum Yumbo Bisma understandably do most of the chasing. So they're going to Yumbo Bisma in particular are really going to have to think about again, as they have done already, about how many riders they can keep for as long as long a period of time around um, their their leader. Yeah, I think you know I agree with that, and I think one of the things I'm looking forward to tomorrow, probably the most, is um, your pronunciation of the uh, the Welsh towns. I'm not going to. I'm not. Uh, I'm going to practice tonight, Brian. So I'm not going to say anything now. Uh, I'm not going to commit just yet. I'm going to spend a little bit of time this evening going through those. Um, so I'm not going to commit and say anything yet. I, I, but I will say Rigos because I know I've got that one right. Rigos Mountain. So I've ridden that a few times. And Kafili. And I've got Kafili right. But let's just let's just take it easy. I'm not going to commit to yet. I'm going to uh, bide my time, pace myself, <laughs> pace myself for the name pronunciation tomorrow. Have some Welsh cakes in the morning. Yeah, definitely have some worth cakes in the morning, Brian. But uh, no, a really entertaining race. And it's set things up very well. And I think one thing you can say about the absence of time bonuses is that riders aren't relying on it. And rather than sprinting for the time bonuses, what I think really do have their place in cycling. Um, and this, by its very nature, being the first time this has ever happened, makes this quite experimental. It'll only be after tomorrow that we can look back and, uh, and say whether it, whether it was a success or not. I 100%... Tobias Johansson was not bringing Walt Van Aert back, wasn't mm. it? was the turn of uh, Niels Pollock, but it then was. Danny Van Poppel never won. And that's what bike racing is about. You, you, yeah. have to, you have to make efforts and do things. Movistar, Movistar came up and helped because they realised that they weren't brought back. But what did Movistar get out today's race? It was Melberg that was there. Serrano was caught out a little bit. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's all, you know opportunities trying to win the bike race and I know Niels Pollock by doing this put Danny Van Poppel in with a chance but also helped Tiller win his win his stage. Yep. The final few meters there Pollock just staying on the front. At this point it was uh, we thought that Van Poppel would be in a shoe and we knew Rasmus Tiller was fast and it was ever such a slight pick up to Lauren as well wasn't it? Slightly uphill only a little bit you can just see the slight elevation there. But in the end, he had it by a bike length in the end, Brian. So it was a relative, I wouldn't say easy, but a convincing win, I think, is a better way to put it. But a magnificent crowd here, too, as well, at the finish in Gloucester. Hopefully, in a few moments' time, we'll have some uh, action from the podium. Another visit by Welt Van Aert and Rasmus Tiller as we look down on the cathedral here. And there's our podium. This is Jody, he drives this big truck and he sleeps in this overnight as well. Right, so let's have a big cheer for Jody for his video. Now, Gloucester itself, Gloucester uh, Cathedral, dates back as far as 681, Brian. It's one of the oldest cathedrals in the land. <laughs> uh, 
Also has one of the biggest stained glass windows in the UK. It's the biggest. There we go, I didn't know that. 22 metres high. So a nice bit of weekend action. We'll continue into tomorrow. Expect another warm day before the weather breaks next week when the race is over. So this hot weather set to continue, Brian. Which will make it even harder. So tomorrow we are at Magram Park uh, for the start at Port Tobin at 11.15 in the morning. And then at around about 3 o'clock in the afternoon we will be finishing in Caffilly Mountain. We're expecting yeah, a slightly shorter stage tomorrow, not by much. But we go through the finish Four Ks in it, 166.8 Ks tomorrow. Two ascents of Caffilly Mountain. Tour of Britain has been there in the past. Down the motorway to Carfilly. So come and join us in South Wales tomorrow. Last time we were there, we had. I just hear the announcer. So it's uh, yeah, good idea. Not too far away at all. A little bit down the M4. And there's the man that will be first up on the podium today. Stage win for Uno X. Really versatile team. Primarily with a, uh, a Norwegian heart, but there's uh, quite a few Danes on the team as well. And uh, had an interview with the team's owner, or oh, the team sort of the team sponsor, saying they're looking to internationalise slowly the team over the next few years as well. But to start it off exclusively Norwegian, one or two Danes in there too. Uh, but now they are looking to open the doors a little bit more, uh, whilst at the same time retaining uh, the beating heart of a Norwegian squad. They're always an entertaining team, aren't they, Brian? And they c they consistently win. Um, they're not a team that's full packed with superstars, but what they have is, is, is just real depth across the board and also a really ag aggressive mentality and spirit. Yep, definitely. And a little bit like Alpecin um, mm. over the last few years, just entertaining and just kind of free to, to ride, you know, the way that they want to ride, always kind of stepping up, all to, all, just acting as a world tour team, not afraid to take it on from the front so yeah they deserve a lot I think they're you know this year they've they've gone into kind of world tour they're maybe not like they were over the last kind of couple of years they've kind of settled down into you know what they need to do and the, the job that they need to do um, so yeah but they, they're always been highly entertaining and even that running you know they they were willing to chase they had the numbers and they do well to try and, and win the stage instead of we're not going to catch them you know and, and kind of give up so it's interesting that you know tiller there he knows that he can't go with the best climbers and he has to pace himself that's something in itself to be able to do it was always as a sprinter you're always hoping that you can come back and for danny van poppel and tiller they were able to come back they certainly were Danny Van Poppel frustrated there with second place. But he was roundly beaten, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, he's still going to be annoyed, but it wasn't as if that was a close one and he got it wrong. He was just beaten fair and square. Well, that's the situation heading in to the final stage tomorrow. Why would not leave Danny Van Poppel, Rasmus Tiller and Tobias Hallen Johansson. Damon Housen in fifth, Magnus Sheffield in sixth. Then we have Mark Donovan, Stevie Williams, Zeb Kiffin and Gregor Mulberger rounding out your top ten. Oh, there, there are at least 20, I think about 15 riders, 20 riders now Thank on the same you, time. Actually, no, it'll be less than that, it'll be about 15 riders story. on exactly the same time as well by now. But uh, the race has thinned down a little bit in terms of riders that could possibly win overall. And tomorrow, certainly a fitting closing stage to what has been an intriguing race. I think it's fair to say a slow burn in terms of the general classification, some spectacular sprints, but things now hotting up considerably on the final weekend, we now have one day to go. Oh, any Harry Potter fans amongst you? I'm not a Harry Potter fan, but I thought I'd mention it because it's quite interesting. Gloucester Cathedral, or the cloisters, were transformed into the hallowed corridors of Hogwarts for three of the Harry Potter films. The Philosopher's Stone, Chamber of Secrets, and The Half-Blood Prince. Never seen any of them. Have you seen the Harry Potter films, Brian? Yes, I have. Um, I've You're a fan? Quite a few of them. I wouldn't say I'm a fan, but I don't mind watching the movies. My boys are not interested. Sometimes I wish they were, because I'd like to settle down some Sunday afternoons in the sofa <laughs> and just watch them. <laughs> 
Daddy's tired today. Come on, we'll just <laughs> sit on the sofa and watch a movie. That's it. A long two and a half hour movie. I generally falling asleep halfway through is the order of the day though, isn't it? Anyway, no falling asleep for these riders today. Rasmus Tillett opens the account for Uno X in the Tour of Britain this year. Earlier on this year, they rode their first ever Tour de France. Always aggressive. Always getting stuck in. And today, played it perfectly. They were strong. They had strength in numbers, but also they were smart as well. Never did too much. So as well as being aggressive, they also measure their effort and uh, perfectly timed sprint, a powerful sprint by this man, netted a victory. And it certainly wasn't an easy one either. Had to get around Danny Van Poppel who won yesterday, but uh, Danny Van Poppel, uh, being that front group, clearly in the form of his life, as Van Poppel said, yes, he's going better than ever. And that certainly proved to be the case today, but couldn't quite pull off the win. So Van Poppel's still in the fray, but I think tomorrow's stage, Brian, is quite clearly all the climbs near the back end. First category. Oh, and, and in looking at the stage we've had before in Kefili Mountain, they've not been as hard as, as what we've got tomorrow beforehand. This is far harder beforehand, isn't it? They've got more climbing just before, a flat opener and a really densely packed finale. So I think it might be a little bit more selective than we, that we originally considered. We'll find out tomorrow. White Van Aert came under pressure today. We thought he was going to take the win. It wasn't to be, but it was another super strong performance. Attack is the best form of defence. It is often said, and today he's defended that lead. Would have loved that win, but there were too many teams against him. The lead wasn't quite up.